Morning, everybody. Welcome to the July meeting. Welcome, members. In for a marathon. Welcome, officers. Welcome, members of the public and those virtual officers and members and those watching us. Uh, also, a big warm welcome to our new councillor, um, Councillor Gordon. New councillor for Breed. Isn't he lucky? This. <laughs> Uh, you're warm, warmly welcome. Just to remind members that they have, um, that, uh, that um, Councillor Gordon has done training and satisfied um, with the training that he's had done already. So thank you for that. So just housekeeping first. Um, just reminding you to um, put your mobile phones or electronic devices on silent, please. Um, also, don't put them between you and the microphone. Um, or, or even papers between you and the microphone. Um, remote participants, please uh, mute microphones when not speaking. Um, that will save bandwidth and also interference. Um, members of the council, councillors, you should have your cameras on. Um, but officers, you can have your cameras off unless speaking. Uh, members of the public, Register to speak for or against any application and the parish and town council representatives. Um, you'll be called to speak after the officers have presented the application. So we have a presentation from each of the officers delegated to do that. And, <clears throat> and then you will be asked to leave the meeting once your item has been completed. Um, after each item has been presented, I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak and they should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise hand facility. Uh, only those members on the planning committee present in the room will be making the decisions. In other words, they, those virtual can't vote. Um, and I'll confirm the votes um, verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Um, please be aware that we have a time delay of about five seconds. Uh, whilst a remote participant appears on screen. Long agenda, so the plan is that we ought to stop for two breaks. We'll keep an eye on the time and try one at about 11 and then a lunch break as well of about 40 minutes, if, that, if that's okay with you. Um, obviously, if anybody's feeling too uncomfortable, you have to let us know, okay? Um, right, agenda item one, uh, the minutes of the last meeting. Can I have someone to authorise the minutes of the last meeting as a correct record? Thank you. Thank you. Um, apologies for absence and substitutes. So we have apologies from Councillor Weinhall and Councillor Burney substituting for him today. Perhaps I should have explained why Councillor Vinehall is not here and I'm here. Um, we, you were sent a message around, but Councillor Vinehall has decided that he shouldn't, because he's got his own application, he shouldn't chair the whole of the meeting. And so um, I've won that prize. <laughs> Additional agenda items? None. Uh, withdrawn agenda items? None. Uh, disclosures of interest, members. I'll disclose mine first, which was that I know somebody who lives in Sheep Street Lane who was a Liberal Democrat uh, parliamentary candidate some time ago, but that doesn't preclude me from voting. Any others? Councillor Barnes. Uh, the item on Newhouse Farm, uh, a personal interest. Um, I do have a point, a point of order to raise. When, when would you like me to do that? On which application? It's on a Bill of Flair, which is 2804, number 12. It depends what it is. Do we need to take officer advice on your point of order? Uh, quite possibly. Can I, can I introduce it now, or should I wait until after this, um, uh, you finish with disclosure of interest? Well, I would rather you know now. Right, okay. Um, when I called this particular application in, it was on the condition that there would be a site visit. As you remember, Tuesday's uh, weather was appalling, so 
uh, many of the site visits were cancelled. And I don't believe that this item will receive a proper hearing unless members have actually attended that site visit. Um, and I would like to, therefore, ask for a deferment. But I'm, I, I'm quite happy to do that again at the beginning of that item. Well, what's your declaration? It's, it's not a declaration of interest, as I explained. It is just something that I was covering under that section of declaration of interest. Thank you, Councillor Barnes. Could I just check with officers and... Um, because I know that obviously we had to contact agents because we only had uh, the three site visits rather than nine um, on Tuesday, the hottest day ever here. Um, so can I just take advice on that one? Miles, you've got advice. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think my advice would be that just because a site visit hasn't been undertaken doesn't mean we cannot proceed, given the exceptional events, the exceptional weather of Tuesday. That was a reason for delayed cancellation. And I think, I suppose we go back to Curlew Cottage. Unfortunately, I don't want to bring it up again, but uh, that was um, where we had that issue of site visits being undertaken, being able to visit site and voting. So um, my advice would be it can proceed to a vote and be discussed here. Um, if members are more comfortable with deferment, then I don't see an objection to that either. Thank, Thank you. you, Miles. That's useful. So we'll wait until it comes up. And I do understand Councillor Curtis has got the same issue with one of them. Thank you, Chair. Um, just on uh, 2022219P, I'm a member of the Parish Council. Thank you. Sorry, I've been reminded that you have to declare why your, in, your interest, what, what your interest is, the reason. Chair, it's just so unusual that I just don't know which, which category it comes under. Uh, it is really a huge disappointment that we can't actually have a site visit. But... Oh, the Sheep Street Lane. Oh, sorry, the Sheep Street Lane. Um, okay. Um, the Sheep Street Lane one, I, personal, I, I'm, I'm only personal in that, obviously, when I was the district councillor for Etchingham, um, I obviously spoke to Mr Carter on several occasions, um, always in a very friendly sort of way. I don't think it colours any of my judgment on how that item will proceed, but I just want to have it flagged up. So it's a personal interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, sorry. Quite acceptable, Chair. Uh, I would like to declare a personal interest on item eight as a member of the Board of League of Friends of Bexhill Hospital. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Chair, um, I'm, not, I'm not declaring, but just by a statement, I, I have to leave the chamber just before 11 o'clock, and I don't want to appear rude to councillors or to members of the public. Thank you for that. Any other declarations of interest? No? Good. We'll move on. Right, let's start with the planning applications, which is, the first one is uh, Newhouse Farm, Sheet Street Lane, RR 2021-1574-L. Stroke This is the listed building application. If you remember, members, we were going to discuss it at the last meeting, uh, but the applicant wasn't able to stay, so we had deferred it to this meeting. So I, I pass, it, pass it over to um, Sarah Shepherd, who is going to introduce the report. Yeah. This is a listed building application seeking consent for works to the farmhouse and Kirkley to listed barn. Members have previously visited the site for the June committee when they determined the associated planning application which related to the change of use. So the listed building application is only in respect of works to the listed building that require listed building consent. The works comprise minor alterations in respect to the house. Could you go scroll down to the Oh, is there no plans on there? 
Can I try? Still trying. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it's coming up a bit slowly. Um, you see in front of you the house, uh, the ground floor area. If you could scroll down to the next one. Right, the ground floor area, you can see there is the area shaded orange. That is a 1990s extension. And that has been um, converted to form a manager's flat for the site when it's in use as holiday lets. In respect of the first floor, you will see that there are two areas marked in green. These were former cupboards and they have been, well, large walk-in wardrobe type cupboards. And they have been converted to provide en suites to the bedrooms either side there. And then on the upper floor, in the um, to the right of, uh, to the left of that picture, you will see the attic bedroom, and there's a partition that's been inserted adjacent the stairs there to create an ensuite for that room as well. The works in respect of the barn, they comprise. Previously, it proposed a, an, afford, an affordable, sorry, previously proposed a holiday let at the western end of the barn, as you can see in that pitch in the plan there. That has not been implemented. Instead, the barn has been left as a communal area. Can we go to the next one, please? And a spiral staircase has been inserted in place of a normal straight staircase. Um, a kitchen has still been inserted and a WC shower room has still been inserted, but overall the works are far less than previously approved for the holiday let. Moving to the eastern end of the barn, you will see that a petition has been inserted to create a little storeroom that's accessed externally and a small WC, which the members will have seen behind the fireplace, which was an original feature. The works are for the most part internal. They do not result in any harm to the importance of the buildings as listed buildings, and the recommendation is for approval with conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Shepherd. Uh, we have two speakers um, against the application. Uh, I understand the first speaker is uh, Barry Niven. Barry, would you like to come and sit in the hot seat? I think you know how to do it. Press, this, press the um, microphone, a red button should come on to tell you it's working. And then you have five minutes, and we're very strict on the five minutes. Good morning, Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. As already said, this application was originally scheduled to be heard on the 23rd of June, together with application RR211573 P. The rationale for this application is undoubtedly the same, which is to support the intention to hold events at the site, events now not permitted following the decision of the Planning Committee on the 23rd of June. The application requires the approval of three extra bathrooms for an additional four bedrooms, almost doubling the number of bedrooms in the main house, which is a listed timber-framed 18th-century farmhouse. The rationale for the Planning Committee refusing to allow events is clearly set out in the minutes and decision on RR 2021-1573P. The application was rejected as, and I quote, potentially detrimental to the amenities of the adjacent and nearby properties and the surrounding tranquil rural area within the countryside of the High Weald AONB. I will address the issue of the main house first, and my colleague Sue will cover the Curtilage Barn proposals. The farmhouse was a residential dwelling until 2019, when it was then promoted as available for commercial use. The family moved out. Since then, it has been used as short-term holiday accommodation and to provide accommodation for events at Newhouse Farm. The number of bedrooms has been increased from five to nine. It would appear to be a change of use from dwelling house to guest house or de facto hotel. The planning committee had the benefit of visiting the house, I understand, 
perhaps they saw the proposed extra bedrooms, including the principal reception rooms being converted into bedrooms. The house is promoted as having nine bedrooms accommodating at least 18 people plus a dining facility for 25 people. In addition, there is the manager's flat. Surely that is incompatible with what would be expected and reasonable if the house had remained as a residential dwelling and once again is incompatible with the location. The additional traffic and parking will also have an unfavourable impact on residents and dog walkers and disrupt the setting of a heritage asset. This was well discussed at the, at the planning committee on the 23rd of June. <clears throat> More specifically, there is also an issue of what harm may be done to the fabric of the listed building with the increased footfall and the proposed extra bedroom, bathrooms, beg your pardon, giving a total of eight bathrooms. We have no information about any necessary ventilation measures taken to protect the timber-framed building. There is no mention of ventilation in the new old suite on the second floor, i.e. the attic, at all. This en suite, which did not appear in any paperwork until relatively recently, in the past week or two in fact, amounts to a loft conversion, providing bedroom and bathroom, and should be subject to building control approval to cover issues such as fire escapes. Has building control approval been applied for or granted? Clearly, the planning committee would not want to approve this if it was not legally compliant. We should also have some technical information on supply and wastewater management in relation to the proposed three bathrooms, given that Newhouse Farm is not on mains drainage. In conclusion, we ask the committee to consider holding the applicant to the plans as submitted and to direct that only five bedrooms are reasonable based on the original layout of the residential house and layout plans accompanying the application. The listed building should be protected from misuse by being converted into a de facto hotel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Wonderfully within your time, Mary. Uh, any questions now for, for, for Mary Niven? Councillor Barnes, Mary Barnes. Thank you, Mary. Um, your concern about the use of the barn, can, can you just sort of say what difference, you know, I mean, if they're not allowed to use the barn for events, where, what will happen to, um, how, will, how, how will the site operate given that number of, of bedrooms? Can you just sort of give us a bit more detail? Councillor Barnes, that's probably a question for the applicant, isn't it? Um, well, I, 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 are you happy to answer that? You're asking about the relationship with the Curtilage Barn. Given that that's your sphere, I just wonder what you're, what you're worried about. Our concern is that instead of a, a, a dwelling, which may have some bedrooms used either for bed and breakfast or holiday accommodation, whatever it's called these days. This house, every, every inch of space is being converted to bedrooms. And the number of people in the house, it, possibly 18 people, plus perhaps more since it's advertised as having a facility for more in the dining room area, does everything that we were concerned about at the meeting on the 23rd of June in terms of disrupting the area. Thank so you. it's the actual numbers. In relation to the use of the barn with the house, um, uh, my colleague Sue will address that. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions? So thank you very much, and I'll ask uh, Sue Deacon to come and take your seat. Thank you. Welcome. You, as you know, you have five minutes and make sure the microphone is on. Good morning, everyone. Glasses on. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief outline about the lane. 
um, and just say that the lane has a number of people working from home already, uh, and we have trading businesses there providing business or products and services. Never had an issue with any traders running businesses quietly and respectfully amongst the neighbours. Quiet business, including quiet tourism, can be embraced here. Indeed, it is welcome. I'm here really to talk about the listed barn um, and the uh, fact that um, certain things have been shoehorned into the barn from the uh, previous uh, planning, which was a communal area with a uh, holiday let at one end. Uh, and yes, it's quite rightly said already by Mrs. Shepherd, the uh, holiday let has never actually happened. Um, and instead, a commercial kitchen has been put in there in addition to um, extra toilets, uh, spiral staircase, things like that. All, all things really that are, are there to incorporate uh, events and really fail to be needed for a listed barn for communal use for the resident guests or, or, of the holiday lets. It's noted that the approved works to create a holiday let at the West End has not actually undertaken, and I assume it's now lapsed, but obviously it would be favourable rather than the commercial kitchen. There are kitchens in all the holiday lets, plus a kitchen in the farmhouse. Why is a commercial kitchen needed in the listed barn? Surely this is not in uh, keeping with the listed building uh, and is purely supporting John's intention to continue his events-based activities. Therefore, I ask the, uh, the commercial kitchen, new doorway, spiral staircase, first floor, mezzanine, blah, blah, blah. It should not be approved. Now I've lost my way. Sorry. Um, I'd also add that since the meeting last month, uh, Mr. Cotter has continued to hold events, uh, even past uh, you know, three weeks past the, the last meeting, uh, and he's currently uh, been promoting a uh, world championship champagne and um, sparkling wine championship uh, at the, uh, the bar. Uh, so it's still continuing. Um, also, I would like to add, I, sorry, I have details. It has now also been reported through the portal, uh, which is great to have. Um, I would also ask uh, the officer uh, about uh, some detail in the recommendation. In the public document pack, um, on page five, the illustration um, on the map um, here, it's very small, sorry, but the, this is the, the uh, illustration. Um, it has no uh, supporting reference number. However, the conditions on page 10 refer specifically to um, a map which is DGC 22062 CU 100 Revision A, which was dated the 21st of the 12th, um, 2021. I have copies if anyone needs to see it, but I think you've got, you should have that anyway. Uh, I'm very concerned. There is a red entry here, which, as I say, it isn't on your, your main document there, um, about this building down here, which is, is not mentioned anywhere as, as text. But um, the officer appears to be recommending uh, granting the addition of this construction. Um, it, it is uh, at the southern end of the sand arena in the field, uh, between two uh, public footpaths which are in frequent use and in full view of the surrounding countryside. Um, it, I don't know if it's a stage, I don't know if it's a building, but obviously it's quite a significant size. Uh, could someone shed some light on this? Surely a uh, building in a field is not meant to be granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Ganley. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. Um, th this is an application um, for listed building consent. The, the activities that go on, which is mostly the why people are objecting to it, I understand, uh, are quite irrelevant to 
actual listed building application. The bit about the, the, the building in the field, um, well, I read here the proposal is the creation of three ensuite bathrooms in Newhouse Farmhouse and alterations to permitted stairs and internal layout within the long barns. There's no mention of approving the building in the field, so I, I don't know. I, I, it, we're not, if we approve this application, we're not approving a building in a field, in my opinion. I thought that might be helpful. I'm sorry, it should have been a question, not a lecture. I, I apologize. <laughs> I don't have a question. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Gunley. Any other questions? Or rather, is there, are there any questions? Right, thank you very much indeed. Um, before I move on to the ward member, I'd like to ask the officer just to pick up a few of those points. One about the last one you mentioned about access, but also about the ventilation and the building control issues. If you could take over from there. Certainly, Councillor. Um, if I run through the points as they've been presented, obviously the, the First Lady dealt with the alterations to the farmhouse. I would like to clarify that you do not need permission to use your living room or lounge as a bedroom. That is not something that needs permission. That is outside our remit. Um, yes, we did look around the building. You did see, particularly in the ground floor area that we were looking in, that there were some additional bedrooms, there was a living room retained, um, the kitchen area with the dining area and things in there. But as I say, you do not need permission to use a room in your house as a bedroom, so we can't control that. I'd also like to remind people as well that you do not need permission to let your house as a holiday let. Um, again, that's outside our control. If you go away somewhere, whether it be for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you don't need permission to let your house as a holiday let, and that applies to anybody. So again, we can't control that. Um, in terms of the en suite, yes, there are some little vents, and the one in the attic does have a vent through a tile vent, which I've spent some considerable time looking at the roof to try and find it, and I did eventually spot it, and it was confirmed to me afterwards that, yes, that's where it was. Um, it is very well concealed. Um, the tile vents nowadays are very like the ordinary tiles on a roof. In terms of the building regulations, as you know, that is not a planning matter. That's a separate issue, and we don't have any control over that. Um, and also, I'd advise that while the bathrooms need listed building consent to ensure that the works aren't harming the fabric and structure of the listed building, they do not need planning permission. So you don't need permission to stick a bathroom in your house either. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that element. Um, and as Councillor Ganley was just saying, you are looking at works to the building, not the use of the building. The use of a building does not need listed building consent. It's only works to the building that need listed building consent. Um, in terms of the barn, um, I do understand what our second speaker was saying. You know, if we're not letting them have any events, then why should they need to put a kitchen facility and things in? Um, whether you regard it as a commercial kitchen or not is another matter. Um, it's not that different from most people's kitchens facilities that are in there. The other thing I would remind members is that you only granted a temporary planning permission at the last committee. Um, and so at some point that is likely to be revisited um, if the applicant wishes to seek a renewal or change what they want to do at the site, then obviously at the end of next year you will have another application to consider again. Um, the event that was raised, we are aware that there was a, a tasting session. Um, that was pre the issue of the decision with the restricting conditions. So that decision has now been issued. As you're aware, we had to agree the details and check with legal for the wording of those conditions before we were able to issue the decision notice. In terms of the committee plan, the plan, the first plan that was highlighted is obviously the plan at the front of your committee report, and that is to, um, for site information purposes only, so that you know which site we're considering. 
The other plan that was referenced was a block plan that was used for this and the planning application, and that highlights the proposed decking area down at the bottom of the menage where they were hoping to do the yoga activities. And obviously at the moment that has not been permitted, so that shouldn't be there, but it's not part of the listed building application. Okay. Thank you very much. That's yeah. really helpful. Um, is John Carter here? John Carter is the applicant. I can't see him. So, okay. Okay. Um, so I'll call on Councillor Barnes. Do you wish to speak? Yes, Chairman. I think this is... Uh, uh, it, it's unfortunate in a way that we didn't take these two at the last meeting although I'm very sympathetic to the reasons why we didn't, because it's a bit like a Venn diagram. There is considerable overlap. But what is really concerning the parish council is effectively, and I'm aware this is a listed building application, but there is a question in the minds of the parish council uh, whether you can change really effectively from a residence to a business use uh, without planning permission. Now, some of those issues uh, in part came up last time, but in effect, and I, I look at policy N2, um, you're, you're looking at, about preserving the listed building, but you're also saying clear legibility of a building. Now, this is a farmhouse, uh, but it's no longer being treated as a farmhouse. Effectively, a manager's flat is going on. Every room in the house virtually, with a couple of exceptions, is now a bedroom. This isn't a house being let as a holiday let. It's being let as probably something like eight or nine or ten, very difficult to work out which, um, separate rooms. Crucially, um, what has been slightly smuggled through between the two applications is the deletion of a condition that we put in um, on the original holiday lets that the house should not have access uh, to the barn. This was to be a quiet communal area. Uh, the barn is now being used as a dining area um, and this is why uh, the staircase has been altered, the kitchen has been inserted. The barn, incidentally, although it's listed only as a curtilage building, is actually of some interest uh, because it is actually probably more ancient than the farmhouse itself. It, it is a very, uh, I think, a relatively early uh, farm building and probably should have been studied in its own right at the time of the listed process. I'm more concerned, I think, about the alterations of the mum, but I am concerned that somehow uh, you can shift the whole purpose of a house. And uh, what is registered on the historic register as a historic farmhouse is no longer that effectively it's turned into some kind of hotel uh, using uh, the barn opposite. I'm well aware of the difficulties of the planning committee in considering what is in front of them, but to some extent I think they have to have cognizance of what is not in front of them and which possibly also needs um, some consideration, which is effectively a change from residential uh, to business use. I'm not uh, too concerned about damage to the external area, uh, but I have to say uh, the changes to the barn I think are pretty unacceptable to me. I don't think they actually enhance its uh, historic presentation, um, but that's for the committee to decide. Thank you, Councillor, for those views. Right, members, over to you.
Thank you. Is there a noise problem uh, that there are other buildings nearby that possibly could be affected by the use of the building as a you know, hotel bracket? Sorry, can I just say the use is not part of the listed building application? So, sorry, I know you're new, Councillor Gordon, so that's what I was trying to say before. The use does not require listed building consent. The only thing that requires listed building consent are the works to the buildings. Um, the house, as, as you saw, is very minor alterations. The manager's flat, um, the restriction on that is that it only be used for manager's flat or as an annex. Um, many of you will be aware about annexes attached to properties, um, and that is within the 1990 extension, so it's not part of the original listed building. Um, the works to the barn are actually fewer than were allowed for the holiday let, so there's actually more open, more legibility of the barn now than was approved under the permission to include the holiday let there. Thank you. Did... Sorry, you need to put your microphone on. Thank you. Um, I do understand that, and, but I do also understand what Councillor Barnes was trying to raise as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other? Councillor Norton. Yes, just a very small point. Um, Sarah, you said the alterations of the house are minor. I don't think I could go along with that. I think they're fairly major. <laughs> well, as, as, as um, John Barnes has said, you're converting, you're converting a interesting old farmhouse, a couple of, hundred, a couple of hundred years old, into you're changing the use of most of the rooms um, into a very congested boarding house. In, in fact, in effect, um, seems to me that's that's quite a major alteration. Councillor Mary Barnes, it's just a thought, and that is. What difference is this going to make if we refuse it? What difference to the original application or to what happened last time? Where would we be if we refused it? Uh, in terms of the... I mean, you're, you keep referring to the use of the listed building, but as I said, we cannot control the use of rooms for bedrooms. Um, the alter, it's the alterations to the listed building that's being considered, i.e. the insertion of the en-suites within the walk-in wardrobes, the adaptation of that 1990s extension to the manager's flat. That's the works that you're considering. You're not looking at... We can't stop them from using rooms as bedrooms. So if you did decide to refuse this then potentially we'd be looking at enforcement action to ask them to remove the bits that they've put in to revert to the wardrobes and things. Councillor Mrs Barnes, you want to come back? It's just that that's a very interesting point, isn't it? Um, so I would like to move refusal. Do you have a seconder for that? Before you, we take any vote on that, I'd like to in, ask... I can't read the yes, name. Jaspreet. Jaspreet, is it? Jaspreet. Yeah. Oh, Good I'm morning. advisor. Sorry, morning. I didn't know your name. I beg your pardon. No, it's fine, thank you. Good morning. I'm Jaspreet Lyon. I'm um, appearing on behalf of the legal team today in order to provide advice to the committee. Now, I'd just like to reiterate a couple of points that have been made by um, the planning officer. So it might be helpful, and I know if I'm saying things you already know, but I'm just saying it for clarity's sake. When a building is listed, it's listed because of its architectural merits. So the use of that building at the time it's listed is not some... At the, this use at the time it's listed is not something that's relevant to that listing. It's listed because of its architectural merits. Um, and any works that are proposed to that building must take into account whether they alter the fabric of that building as it relates to its architectural merits. So today, um, as you've had explained to you and as, as you've all discussed, the application is for um, some alterations to that building. So the fundamental question that you're obliged to consider is, are those works such that they alter the architectural merits in a negative way, having special regard to its listing status. So 
in terms of consideration of use, these aren't elements that you can take into account, um, and they're not elements that would be looked on sympathetically by a planning inspector at any subsequent appeal. Um, so if, in terms of a question that was asked by one of the councillors, what would happen if you refuse? Well, as uh, your planning, uh, planning officer has explained, um, if there is a change of use, well, that's a separate question altogether, and there may need to be enforcement action in relation to that. If the works have been undertaken and are not approved via um, the listed building approvals process, where well, there may need to be enforcement action. But the uh, opportunity would exist for the applicant to appeal that refusal um, to the planning inspector, at which point the decision will be made by a planning inspector, having regard to the architectural merits of what's being proposed. So if you're looking at what you're considering, so you just have to limit yourself to looking at Oh, do these works have a negative effect on the special architectural aspects of this building that meant it would be listed? And the use questions, unfortunately, are not something to consider. Um, so, sorry, I just felt uh, I needed to just explain that. Um, I, I can answer questions if our councillors wish to ask me any. Thank you, Judge Street. That's really helpful. And um, just, sorry, yes, Councillor Langley, you want to ask a question of Judge Street? Yes, can I please? Please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, can I please ask the question then? So when we come to the barn, can we discuss use or are we still in a position where we need to discuss the works, the actual change to what's just, been constructed? At, at this moment, just the works, the works alone, because the uh, application that's in front of you only deals with works. Thank you very much. Councillor. Thank you. It, it's not a question for the legal. I, it's just, uh, to me, it's quite clear that this committee made its feelings known about the use last time around with the uh, conditions it put on that. And we seem to be just the building. And I would suggest the internal doesn't change the external. But my question is to you, that if Councillor Barnes has already put forward a refusal, do we have to deal with that first? Otherwise, I'd be putting forward that we grant it. I did note that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Barnes, I'm very tempted now just to retract it so that, it so that we can actually then continue the discussion. But I think that we're stuck between a rock and a hard place on this, aren't we? So I think it would be sensible to retract, and that is if that has the permission of my seconder. My, um, my own view is that we should rely on our previous permission, exactly. which gave commission, uh, conditions. And I'm going to take the vote on because you've moved it. It's been seconded by so Councillor Norton. No. I was advised that you should say something at the end of the discussion as well as the beginning. You can't take part in the discussion. Are you? Is, well, I'm concluding the discussion then to take the vote. If you would like to speak. That, that's useful. I just want to draw a distinction, it seems to me, between the alterations to the house, which are minimal, and the alterations to the barn, uh, which actually include a spiral staircase and a kitchen, which do not seem to me terribly compatible uh, with the historic appearance of the barn. And I think there is a distinction to be drawn between the two buildings. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for refusal. Those in favour? Put your hands down. I've been muttering reasons for refusal. That's the um, historic nature of the farmhouse and the barn are completely altered if we allow this proposal. Thank you. Right. Sorry, vote again. Those in favour of refusal. Sorry, those against refusal. That motion is not carried. Could I have another motion, please? Is that seconded? Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Mayor. Those in favour?
That is carried. Sorry? Okay. I'll get there. Those against. One, two, three, four, five. Five against. So that is carried. I can say that now. Um, and just be reassured that we have got it on a temporary basis. Um, so we can come back to this one. Uh, thank you very much to, to our speakers as well. Moving on to agenda item 8, which is on page 13. RR 2022 1246P Mount View Street, Bexhill. And we are joined today, welcome, by, um, by Peter, and get it right, Dacos. Yeah, ten points. Councillor Mrs Barnes wants to speak. Only just to say that as the rather Hosk representative um, on uh, East Sussex Health Authority, uh, I was on the working party that looked at the application only from the point of view of looking at sites. I don't think I have a personal interest, but I think I need to make you aware of that situation. Thank you. That's noted. Thank you. Sorry. Can Sorry, Chair, you? can I redeclare my interest, please? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, councillors and, and chair. Um, I'm used to presenting from the other side, so um, I'm a newbie, a bit like Councillor Gordon, so um, we share an alliance. Um, good morning. This is an application for a hybrid planning application um, for the construction of an inpatient mental health facility, landscape, car parking and associated works as phase one and an outline planning application for additional inpatient mental health facilities, supporting facilities, with all matters reserved as phase two. Uh, the site, uh, I do believe you had a site visit yesterday, and you met my colleague Claire, who has assisted me in putting this report together, for which I'm thankful. Um, the site, uh, uh, looking with the map north, to the east, uh, you have the Northeast Bexhill Master Plan and residential development being built out, um, which will go further northwards from the existing scheme. Um, to the north of the scheme, you have the forest, uh, the Mount Forest, and then to the south and west, you have the existing residential scheme. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, aerial photograph um, to just show you that the scheme, which is the agricultural field shown in the photograph, both at um, central site and the smaller square site, which we will refer to as phase three, um, all take access off Mount View Road where it says A2691. That is the only point of access for both phase one, two and three. Um, there are landscape works surrounding the site, and the site dips to the middle and will drain eastwards under Mount View Street along a valley towards um, the area of outstanding natural beauty. Thank you. Um, this is a scheme that was we refer to in the report as the extant scheme. It was approved in 2016, so this scheme is part of those issues that were addressed. Uh, I will go into some of the particular because there are changes to the extent scheme that is coming forward because of that. But if you have a look in the extreme left-hand corner of the site, you'll recognize the more or less the, the shape of the site we're talking about. And you can see the overall extent of the further master plan that to a large extent will urbanize and create a residential community around this area. And the site, which we refer to as Phase 3, is designated as commercial and retail um, uses in the future. So I think your site visits showed a very open site, a very, 
a landscape site, but that will change over time, and I think we need to recognize that. Thank you. Um, the application is in two stages. The site referred to as phase one, which is for a full planning application, and then the site referred to as phase two, which is an outline, but the two in terms of when we get to the landscape approach and the architectural approach, you'll see that the applicant has given us a good indication of how these two sites link together. And more importantly, they have also addressed the issue of landscape and servicing and access relationships between phase one, two, and three, which is not part of this application. Thank you. If we have a look um, at phase one, um, it's located within the center of the site. Um, the applicant has pulled back the buildings from the boundary to create sufficient screening, um, committing themselves to, in some extent, 15 meters of hedgerows, tree planting, and landscaping to address some of the concerns of the neighbors about this building that sits there. Um, it's a very specific uh, brief that was given to the client in terms of the architecture of the building. You'll discern that there are three large X's in terms of the building, and then the building that is a, a, more or less an arrow pointed towards the car park is the only part of the site that will have a two-story building approximately 10 meters in height, which will house the reception area and the administrative part on the first floor. Um, it caters for its own parking for staff and visitors. Visitors' parking will be arranged on a person-by-person -person basis. You'll see in the bottom corner is a service yard that addresses both phase one and in future phase two. And in the middle of the site between phase one and phase two, you will see all the requirements for M&E equipment that serves both phases. Um, the site uh, has got landscaping around it, and you'll see as we go forward how they address some of the stormwater and the suds to access the site. Thank you. Uh, that is then the proposed, which you can see then phase two, which is in the outline, uh, proposing the connection of the two buildings with a bridge. Each phase will have its own parking requirement. Um, phase two is cut into the hillside, so from the rear it will appear as a one-story building, from the front it will appear as a two-story building. The architecture is suggested very much similar to what is proposed in phase one. And then a very strong commitment to a travel plan, uh, making the access to the site for pedestrians and cycling very clear. Uh, you will see that just at the bottom end of that little toe on Mount View Street are proposed a bus stop, a northbound bus stop, and on the other side of the road, a southbound bus stop, so that people can effectively decant and get to the site on foot using public transport. I think that's a very important commitment. Thank you. Um, in terms of a colour plan and just the landscaping, uh, I think this is a very good illustration in terms of that boundary landscaping that they are proposing uh, to create the screening, but also to give a sense of peace and well-being to the residents in this community. Um, there is, as you will see, a fire track that runs around the outside of the site. That is for emergency purposes only. It is not for service vehicles and day-to-day -day use. And then the building has got a series of secure courtyards for the inpatients for monitoring and to provide them for outdoor space. Um, the parking area is required in terms of the numbers they've allocated and addressed parking requirements, but also to the front of the building they are putting in cycling parking and cycling storage so that you have direct access from the site bicycle into the main entrance of the building. And then to the east of the site, you see a series of blue lakes. That is how they intend to address through pervious paving, uh, managing their storm water before they discharge it into the culvert and out to the east. Thank you. Um, as you can see, the building is comprises of three large X's. In the middle of the X is a viewing station. Uh, I'm sure the applicant will probably want to talk more about the architecture, so I will leave that just to show you in terms of the sheer complexity of this building. Thank you, Matthew. Um, the building is uh, very much uh, a one- and a two-story building. It is dropped in the landscape to have respect to the surrounding residential neighborhood. Uh, the architecture is of very much of a residential fabric. 
uh, dealing with brickwork, render, and glass, uh, a low-pitched roof, and in some cases using the flat roofs for solar panels to generate electricity. Thank you. Um, some, three, uh, some CGI images uh, that they have prepared, which begins to show how this building sits within its own site, but more importantly, how it has respect to the residential neighborhood that surrounds it. Um, the color picture there is effectively the phase one, which is the full planning application. And then the white block you see in the background is the phase two, which is outlined, uh, which is from this elevation, a two-story building. From the other side, it would be a one-story building. Thank you. And then, importantly, just an address of that first, that third phase, which you called phase three, which is not part of this planning application that will come forward under its own, which is that retail and commercial site, just showing that this site does address access. This plan is slightly incorrect in that that road that goes uh, in the middle of the site is not the access point. Plot three or phase three will only take access of the existing route. And just an indication of the nature of the building. Uh, it's a very respectful building. There's a fair amount of detailing uh, in terms of stonework, brickwork, and render to the buildings, and bringing in some color. Uh, importantly, quite a strong commitment to landscaping of the building, that it really nestles within its environment. Thank you. Uh, if we go back to one. Um, our one more. Our recommendation is a resolution to grant both phase one and phase two um, with subject to delegated uh, authority for the section 106, the section uh, 278 and other uh, conditions that we have attached to this planning application. Thank you, Chair. We have had extra material. You're right. Um, we have, uh, I apologize, I, I, I'm getting the process. Uh, we have had some amendments to our conditions and our text in light of ongoing and now resolved discussions with highways in terms of some of their issues about travel planning and a commitment to those bus stations that we have. Um, and there are, we are, uh, I think we've got a, a, an email now on record from highways that they are happy to accept documentation that was submitted by the applicant. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very clear uh, exposition. Uh, we have speakers for the application. Um, I think I've got Paula Kirkland from the NHS first. Welcome, Paula. I hope you know the ropes, that you have to press the button and you have five minutes. Good. So, um, yes, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity to talk to you all about this very, very important project for us. Um, I'm Paula Kirkland. I'm running the, um, the scheme that's looking at phase one and phase two um, of this, this project. I have with me today um, Aaron Peets, who's our planning consultant, and um, Robin um, Graham from our architects, who will be able to field any questions you have on this. So at the top end, I'd like to say thank you very much to the council and the officers for um, working so, so well with us and under, under such good, <laughs> such strong time pressures, because there is time pressure with this, with this scheme as well. So I'm representing um, Sussex Partnership Foundation Trust. We are the NHS um, provider of the full spectrum, spectrum of mental health services from East Sussex, West Sussex and Brighton and Hove. My sole focus is East Sussex and looking at the quality of the inpatient services that we have across the county. Um, as Peter has set out, we have a phase one and a phase two with this. So our long-term vision for mental health services in East Sussex is to co-locate all of our services on a single campus to provide the very best quality of inpatient therapeutic environment for the people of East Sussex. It will also have the opportunity to um, enhance our medical education facilities. Um, we are part of the teaching hospital and the, and the, and the universities trust. So we, we educate um, medical professionals within our trust and um, there are significant medical education facilities built into this which will attract and you know, hopefully we will retain the best staff that we can get. We, can, we compete with London, so the better we can do with that, um, there'll be massive advantages coming through with that. So you'll see that this, the application is in two halves. Um, so our main focus um, is on, currently is on phase one. Um, we have um, an opportunity afforded by us 
through um, the Eradicating Dormitories um, for Mental Health Facilities National Programme, which was announced by Rishi Sunak last October, um, was it last, or maybe actually 2020 it was announced, that they were making a commitment nationally to remove dormitory accommodation from mental health facilities. Um, I think you could all quite quickly understand that, you know, if you have a mental health crisis, that to be in a dormitory um, situation would not be beneficial to your quick recovery. So this main focus of phase one is to replace um, facilities that we currently have at the Department of, Edu Department of Psychology um, in, uh, on the site of the um, Eastbourne District General Hospital site. Um, there are 54 beds there. Um, the majority of them are in dormitory accommodation with no one suites. There's poor lighting, um, poor acoustics, um, limited to no therapeutic space or gardens. Um, and these are all outdated facilities and the way we should be treating our vulnerable people. So um, the, the first move is to move that service wholesale into the new site at Bexhill. Um, as Mary Barnes has um, uh, alluded to, we did a significant piece of work to identify Bexhill as the, as the preferred location for these, these services. We looked at internally about, about 19 sites, including all of our own sites, um, and we did a significant public consultation, um, which was um, you know, significantly supported by everyone who took part in it, and um, has been. So the whole reconfiguration and move of services has been supported by um, our NHS colleagues and um, the Health and Overview Scrutiny Committee in East Sussex. So Bexhill is our, you know, the is our, it has been landed on for, for a lot of very good reasons. You'll see that the site is, is open. Um, it, it allows us to have you know, the, the best we can in terms of garden space and recuperation. So this is, this is really a once-in-a-generation opportunity to get it right and to corner, you know, ground this opportunity with the best that we can do and we, with the hope that we can. We will, we will build it out and it will improve everything for, um, for, a gener for generations to come. So this, getting it right and getting those landscapes and the buildings and the layouts right. We've had clinical input into these layouts. Robin will talk a little bit more about it in terms of you know, lines of sight, um, supporting people to be um, you know, the least restrictive practice is, is a term that we use so that people can, can, can maintain their independence while being looked after so they can walk in and out of the gardens uh, and be safely supervised. There are internal therapy gardens as well. Um, so we, we are expecting the best outcomes from this. Um, so we've had patients, we've had patients involved and um, clinicians. So that, that's, I think I've run out of time. So just, no, just about, just sorry. if you've finished, that's good. Yeah, so just say thank you very much. You know, hopefully we can have some more questions and just to note that this is it's, it's a great opportunity for us and very strategically important for thank you very the much. residents. Thank um, you. Um, sorry. Has anybody got questions for Paula? Councillor Ellington. Hi, thank you, Paula. Um, regards to the number of staff, well, in, in the summary, we're saying that we're going, there's going to be loss of employment floor space, but actually, how many staff do you envisage having at phase one and phase two? And I've also got a question about shift patterns, which might be something that Aaron can explain in relation to the travel plan. So if we could perhaps, sorry, go back to my first question. How many staff do you envisage being at phase one and phase two? I don't actually have the numbers on the top of my head, but I think it's about 550 overall in phase one and phase two together. And about, Just say that again, please. Sorry, about 550. 550 staff. Yes. Thank you. And um, I think it's just slightly more than half is in phase one. Uh, this is reflective of a 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 facility. So it, there, are, there are shift patterns. So... It's, there is there's more than you would probably naturally assume. So it does sound like a lot. Um, yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Mary Barnes. I just wanted to ask about the travel plan, but I, is that your colleague or is that you? If you could spare that to Aaron, that would be great. All right. So thank you very much. I think we can move on to, to Robin, who's from the Architects. Thank you, Paula. Thank 
Good morning. Good morning, morning. Chair. Good morning, councillors. Thank you for uh, your time this morning. So I'm Robin Graham uh, of Gillingdale Architects, and we've been leading on the design of this proposed hospital development. I've got five key points just to highlight before I take questions. Yes, of course. The first is obviously the background to the design. Um, the design of this building has been very much a co-production involving experts by experience um, who are former patients of the Trust and other stakeholders, and involving clinicians, which has resulted in the kind of unusual X shape of each ward. And that has been created to provide safe and therapeutic uh, garden spaces for all patients within the building. And also it provides a environment that is welcoming and non-institutional as well, while also providing the aims of ensuite accommodation for every single inpatient within the building. The safe and welcoming environment is also quite important in terms of how the landscaping is involved. And you heard, heard Paula mention a moment ago that in the current facility, they don't really have much access to any garden space. And we all know from COVID, and lockdowns, how important access to nature has been to all of our well-being. The building is proposed to be part single storey, a um, small area of two storey towards the front of the building, and the massing is generally kept at quite a domestic scale to um, be a good neighbour to the residential properties nearby. And to, to achieve that, we've kind of nestled it into the hillside uh, so that it is, the ground floor level is lower than that of the neighbouring houses. Each patient and service user will have direct level access into garden spaces, whether, so that will also help people who maybe have mobility issues, um, as well as the rest of the patient cohort who can have level access to garden spaces. It's also going to be a very sustainable building. It will be one of the first of a new generation of hospitals which will be able to operate to net zero carbon um, due to the use of electric only. Um, air source heat pumps and photovoltaic panels. In addition, it will be a, a rated as excellent under the environmental standard known as BRIAM. Also, in terms of the neighbourhood, neighbourhood context, it is a got sleeping accommodation um, nearest to the houses, so its, res, its use is very much um, complementary to the neighbouring residences, having sleeping accommodation as part of the building use nearest to the neighbouring houses. And also, it complements the 2016 master plan, which was referred to earlier, um, by providing a buffer to the surrounding areas, providing extensive landscaping, and also providing significant employment opportunities for the local area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Questions? Yes, Councillor. Thank you. I wasn't sure if this was going to be for Aaron, but as you mentioned, landscaping. Uh, a very small point, that's all. On the plans, um, they're shown a potential emergency entrance off Bodium Avenue. And in your landscape and design thing, there's a, a, a picture taken up Bodium to show the likely effect. And unfortunately, you can clearly see the roofs, and I know there's going to be planting, but when will the people in Bodium know if there's going to be an emergency exit entrance there for the fire track or not? And then could it be better screened from then? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. So during the public consultation, that very issue was discussed with neighbouring residents from Bodium Avenue. And at this time, that element was removed from this application. So there is no secondary emergency access proposed. I'll say better than that. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Mary Barnes, you had your hand up. And then Councillor Langley. Thank, thank you very much. Just two questions, if I may. Um, the first one is... How visible, and where will it be visible, the security fence for those who live nearby? Um, and the second question is, we talked about a travel plan. Um, and obviously, there's going to have to be a revision in bus timetabling, and in fact, in, even in bus routes, uh, to enable staff and visitors uh, to get there. Could you just sort of tell me a little bit about, um, particularly the latter, but really on the basis of... I don't want the local community to feel that they're looking up at prison, at a, you know, at, a, at a fence, which is obviously in itself restrictive to anyone getting in and out. Thank you. Yes. Um, with regards to the fencing first, um, it, part of it will be um, visible initially, um, but we have minimised its impact by 
lowering the building compared to neighbouring houses so that the base of the ground is lower uh, compared to neighbouring houses. But also there are a number of existing trees um, between the site and the neighbouring houses which we will be complementing with new tree planting. So over time the impact of that fence will be gradually reduced. I'm just taking your second point about the um, travel plan which I know my colleague Aaron will uh, probably talk more on but just to add that there is an existing bus route which goes down Mount View Street currently, but there is no bus stop provided outside the site currently, so that's what will be added as part of this application. Councillor Langley. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Um, I'm going back to Bodium Avenue again, um, not so much to the emergency entrance, but I see behind there, if I'm right, that there's a service yard, and... In my understanding from Paula, does that serve both sites eventually? Uh, currently, it just serves phase one. Um, it, for part of phase two, there will be further detail under phase two for how um, deliveries and refuse collections are, will be taking place in phase two under a detailed application. Right. My concern there is that I think, you know, uh, the experience that I do have is when the secondary school was built, the service yard for that was put behind properties and it has become a very busy noisy area for bins and uh, deliveries for food and so on and so forth and I'm just wondering it seems a bit unfortunate that the design was such that that actually backs onto the properties and doesn't sit in the middle somewhere if it's going to serve the two phases so are we going to be absolutely sure those, those residents in Bodium Avenue and around the corner there will not be bothered by the noise? and Because I assume bins will be collected every day. I'm just, just trying to get a picture of what's going to be going on there. Yes, of course. Uh, so with regards to the positioning first of the service yard, um, as you'll be aware from your site visit, there is quite an um, interesting topography change across the site, um, which... It makes a challenge for positioning uh, areas such as service yards and to locate it to the north of phase one is particularly challenging because that's where the hill is at its steepest so we need to kind of avoid that area and to have it towards we couldn't put it in the center of the site either because that's be around the main entrance and it's not really conducive to a welcoming environment um, so the the only space left was unfortunately um, towards the southeast of the site but we've tried to screen it as much as possible using trees and other landscaping um, to protect um, it from, um, or the neighbouring residents um, from any potential noise. But I understand that uh, refuse collections would take place not every day, but slightly less frequently than that. Um, but it would be no similar to how refuse collections would be taking place on their own street anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions? So, oh yes, Councillor Arrington. Just to say, I don't know whether con ongoing condition 41 on page 45 answers Councillor Langland's question, because it says no deliveries, loading, unloading or other servicing activities shall take place at the site other than, that mean, to me that means they can't put the bins out on a Sunday, they can't do anything on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon. I'll just pass over to Peter. Uh, uh, Councillor, thank you. Good observation. Uh, we were concerned about the service yard and we put in conditions that deal both with when they can access and use them. But we've also put in a condition in terms of noise monitoring. Um, and further, we are ensuring that there is a screen planting along the service yard. So, um, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you for that reassurance. Any other questions? So now, thank you very much and move on to Aaron. Not quite. Is it Aaron yet? No. WSP, Aaron. You'll have to tell us what that is. Right. I'm very conscious you've heard from two of us already, so I'll, I'll try and be quick. I'll also try and pick up some of the questions that I know uh, have been asked to others. But um, good morning. And I uh, thank, want to f thank Peter for his thorough um, report on on the planning matters, so I'll just try and pick up some of, some of the others and, and just emphasise a few that I think are important for this committee to hear. So um, hopefully uh, many of you will remember the, the committee briefing we gave on the 20th of, of June, and I know a number of points were raised then, so I'd like to address 
some of them again to, to re-emphasize uh, some of the key points for us. Um, I mean, firstly, you know, I, I genuinely believe this scheme is a chance to make a real difference to mental health treatment in East Sussex, providing a significant social benefit. Yeah, we were really pleased through the, um, through the public consultation that we undertook that that was also a really uh, key issue for people. The overriding message was, was the benefit, the social benefit this scheme could bring. Yes, you know, residents were curious about the use the, and the layout and, and how it would impact upon their homes, but I think once explained... Um, we explained the proposals in detail and the, propose, the approach that we took. You know, almost everyone went away happier, and, that, and that's you know, testament, I think, to the process we've, been on, we've undertaken, that the trust has undertaken from a consultation point of view, but I think also the, the quality of the scheme that's, that's before you. Um, sort of to address the point that Councillor Eddington raised, there will be a significant uh, number of permanent and construction jobs created by this hospital. Um, that's across both phases. You know, I believe there will be over 550 workers uh, employed at the hospital across a range of different types. So I think the loss of employment point was more around um, the previous extant use on the site. Uh, obviously, the, the site already has planning consent for a number of residential properties, commercial retail, as well as um, an element of employment land, which is located on our site at the moment. So that was the issue that the planners had to, to balance, was our proposal and its benefits going to outweigh what might have come if it was an industrial estate on, on part of our site. Um, I think hopefully that goes to explain a little bit about you know, the employment benefits, but they will be significant. Yes, many of those uh, employees will come from the existing facility in Eastbourne to start with, but I think over time um, that will change and will only increase the draw of people from the local area. We hope, and this is one of the reasons why the Trust chose this site, that many of those um, employees will live in the local area, live opposite, live in the new housing development. That's certainly one of the attractions of, of this site to the Trust. Um, I think another important point to, 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 uh, to mention is about the reduced highways impact and less traffic on the road than the extant planning permission. You know, this isn't a blue light hospital. You know, this is more of a residential type hospital. So I think actually the movements and traffic associated with the site will be less than the current planning permission on the site, which I think is important. And I think local residents um, supported that as, as an alternative use for the site. Um, we've also importantly agreed a, a balanced parking level with the county highways um, to avoid any on-street parking. I recall Councillor Harmer and Councillor Gray talking about the relative sustainability of the, the, the location previously and, and how we can improve public transport. Peter's mentioned that we've worked hard with the county council to um, agree two bus stops serving north and south services and footpaths which will be delivered prior to occupation. A provisional travel plan has been agreed, and happy to answer any more detailed questions if I can, but within that travel plan, um, of which we've had several iterations already go through the County Council, because it's an important point for us, it's an important point for Peter and, and his team, and also for the County Council. But within that, we'll be looking at car sharing measures, we'll be looking at potentially shuttle buses to link up with the station, and we'll be doing what we can, um, because the shift patterns associated with the site are such that people will be turning up a little earlier and leaving a little later than normal. So we need to provide the requisite number of car parking spaces, but absolutely, we will do what we can from a travel plan point of view. It's really important to the trust. And I think finally, just on the, the point of landscape, and again, I think that was mentioned by Councillor Gray when we met before, you know, it's been central to, to our approach to the site. Um, I certainly think the proposed use is more neighbourly than the extant use, which would have been an industrial estate uh, sitting at the back of the uh, neighbouring properties, which is an important point to, to remember. Um, but I think the parkland setting, I think the sensitive design that Robin's talked about, utilising the contours of the site will be a considerable benefit to residents. Um, but not only residents, as Paul has explained, you know, this is very much about the treatment of the patients in the facility. You know, they, they need this landscape setting. This is how people start to get better. So hopefully that's of benefit to residents having that type of use and layout, but I think it's central fundamentally to the treatment of the patients on Sorry, site. can you wind up now? I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Any, any further questions? Councillor Byrne. Not, not a question, but a, a comment. Have we finished with questions? No, we want questions. Okay. You've done such a good job, you've got no questions. Oh, yes, no, Councillor Ington. It is um, 
is just a reassurance about the travel plan because you say shift workers and the fight if there is significant amount of staff there then obviously there's a, a you can justify a bus service but if you've only got a handful of staff there at whatever time then you're not going to get the bus service we've seen that but if we can get the bus service I think that'll be great for the residents that live on that estate and actually want to perhaps socialize or work in the town um, so can I just get back to the 550 is that it? I don't want to talk about constructions workers because they're only temporary but the number of actual staff that will be there because I think that's a real positive to promote any additional bus service so how many staff yeah. I know I can't no it, it no it is that, that 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 is exactly what we predict across the two phases I, I, the, 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 the slight quack is, it, is the shift pattern. So you've obviously got a 24-hour facility with people that need to be looked after. And I, so it's a, it's a fairly intensive hospital in terms of management, in terms of all of those things that go with yeah, looking after the people individually on an individual basis and, and generally. So it's 550 across two shifts. So you'll obviously you won't have 550 there all the time. Uh, we don't need that. Um, but you will because of the, the, the crossover. And the 24-hour operation, there will be 550 jobs, we predict. Councillor Gamley. Uh, did you say um, 550 across two shifts? That's 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Sorry, total 550. Right. So half during the day, half overnight. Yeah, that's a 12-hour shift. That's a long time. Oh, right, OK. You're, you're, you meant the, the, sh the shift uh, length. Yes. I, I mean, Paula might be best to answer, to answer the shift oh, length. My point is the total number of people employed on the site will be 550, yes. and it will be across two Sorry. shifts. Two yeah. shifts. Oh. I mean, if you, if you want a bit more detail on that, Paula might be able to... May I, Joe? May I ask Paula? If, if that's what you need to know... Oh, I definitely need that. It's imperative that I know. <laughs> Paula. No, it's purely there, are, there are basically two clinical shifts, yeah. but there are also some people who work nine to five as well. So we have pharmacy and oh, um, medical yeah. education. We have other, um, you know, workers in the neuromodulation suite. We have the fresh cook kitchen that's coming, and the staff and the cleaning staff. So it is there are two clinical shifts, but other shifts for a lot of other different things. What we did with the um, to calculate the parking was we worked out half hour by half hour pattern of who was going to be in the building there's peaks at crossover where, where clinical staff have to hand over so yeah we have we have done all that and that profiling around there Bravo. So there's quite a lot of different types of roles and jobs and shifts thank you very much thank you paula uh, any more questions before i go i can uh, i ask councillor councillor gray i see you're ready to as a local member and then perhaps councillor madeley afterwards Oh, thank you, Chair. I don't think Councillor Lindsay wants to speak, am I right? No. So. Oh, sorry. Is this a question, sorry, or shall I? <laughs> thank you very much. If you okay, switch, thank you. No just, problem. And thank, thank you very much for um, all that information. It was very useful. No, Councillor Gray. Um, I fully support this application. Normally, I would not be quite so keen on a development of countryside, especially so close to the Coombe Haven Countryside Park, but the site was already allocated for housing, and I can't think of a better development for this land. I hope the residents of Bojim Avenue and St James's Avenue are reassured that the only access will be from Mount View Street and that the conditions allow for restricted working hours to reduce noise. In addition to high-quality care for people who need to be admitted to hospital care, it will provide significant employment opportunities, both in the construction and within the hospital, as we've just heard, with the added bonus of better public transport, with a new bus stop and footpath and cycle path, which will also benefit residents of the new Bovis development on the other side of Mount View Street. Best of all, it provides a first-class provision for mental health patients, very much needed and often overlooked. On a brief personal note, many years ago, in the early 1980s, as a social work student, I spent a year on a psychiatric placement at Hellingly Hospital. I don't know if anyone remembers Hellingly Hospital. It uh, fulfills the um, stereotype of a Victorian, Victorian institution, a massive mansion set out in the wilds of the country, well, Hellingly, 
and in very large grounds, isolated, with huge dormitory wards and long corridors. So I'm absolutely delighted to see such a change within my lifetime, a state-of-the-art facility for inpatient mental health patients, and I wholeheartedly propose approval. Thank you for that. Councillor Maidley, would you like to speak? No, nothing further to add. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Byrne now. I know you've been waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, essentially, um, echoing what Polly said, we've been looking at how far this may or may not conform to an ideal. And I think almost all the questions and almost all the, the uh, almost all the representations have shown that they've addressed the holism of how you put a, a psychiatric unit like this in, in a, into the countryside. But taking Polly's point, let's look back. How much better is this than just about every other NHS building we can look at, certainly in East Sussex? This is a massive leap forward. So looking at the aesthetics, going back to the planning considerations, the fact that they've looked at the levels of the buildings, the fact they're looking at screening, the security, the necessary security fence, the, the materials of the building, the aesthetic look of the building, it may not actually be to everyone's taste, but I don't think anyone would say that it isn't 90% of what they want compared to ordinary NHS hospitals. So I, I, I just think this is a really good application that has looked at just about every angle that we could hope for and has answered almost all our questions. Thank yes, you. Mohammed. Thank you. Um, it's a fantastic application. I happen to know that the facility in Eastbourne certainly isn't fit for purpose anymore. Um, all the comms have been fantastic. I'm so proud to be sitting here and hearing this. I echo everything Polly said, and I think we should be blessed to see this facility. So thank you for bringing it to Bexhill. Jason. I haven't missed anyone moving to grant it, in which case I will. I think it's been moved and seconded. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't that clear, but I wasn't sure somebody had seconded. It has okay, been moved you. and seconded. Okay, Julie. Yeah. Councillor Gamley seconded, I think. Yes. Um, so I, I feel as though we're ready to vote. Uh, the recommendation on page 14 um, and... I think it's extraordinary that we have this amazing facility and I'm glad to hear there's some kind of time frame to it so it'll be happening soon and I think the social benefit just so outweighs anything that we have. And congratulations to our own officers and to the team uh, for getting it to this stage. Well done. I think we're ready to vote. Those in favour? That is carried unanimously. Thank you, members. Take advice from my members. Do you want to take a break now? Or after the next application? Now is the general consensus, I think. All right. So back in ten past, is that all right? Right, we're on air again, members. Right, the next agenda item, agenda item nine, it's on page 49, and it's RR 2022-840P, land at Beach Farm, Hawkehurst Road. And I think we have Matt going to introduce us. Uh, declaration of interest. Yes, if I could declare a pecuniary interest in this application, as is my obligation. Noted. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, councillors and members of the public. Um, this, this application um, relates to a site to around one and a half kilometres north of the village of Seddlescombe. It's within the countryside and high wheeled AOMB. Um, as, as members will have, well, those who did visit it on site, the field 
currently has um, a small outbuilding with access track, um, which links with a shared access to the north. Um, and is just south of an historic farmstead, which contains a grade two listed building and other converted former farm buildings. The proposal is for a new detached live-work unit, um, and it's been promoted as being carbon negative. There will be landscaping work, so non-native trees on the boundary all the, all the way along the road will be removed. Um, there's also an area of Norway spruce where the proposed dwelling is going to be sited. They would be removed um, and native hedgerows and oak trees would be allowed to regenerate. There would also be planting. Um, the new live work unit would be served by a new vehicle access from Hawkehurst Road. Um, there would be some earthworks required to build up the land for the access um, and also to create a flat surface for the live work unit and parking area. Um, so there'd be a, some excavation works in the north part of the field, some fill uh, to the south of the live work unit. Um, towards the south of the site, a new attenuation pond, or southwest corner of the site, a new attenuation pond would be provided, again with some cut and fill. Um, this would take surface water from the proposed development and also is part of the um, proposal to improve biodiversity across the site. This plan shows the, again, the sighting of where the dwelling would be, but also gives you some levels, um, just showing how much um, the land levels would change. So um, you've, got, you've got one across AA at the top. Um, you can see towards the left-hand side there's um, some building up, um, and then to the right-hand side, that's where the excavation would be. Um, I think sections B and C, um, yeah, B is towards the south of the site. You can just see the increase in levels there. Um, and C is across the access, again, showing the build-up of the driveway. This is the layout of the proposed live-work unit. Um, you've got yeah, two floors. So the ground floor, you would have the, the, the workspace, which is a, a studio area. Um, the bathroom and uh, utility area in the centre. Um, and then there's kitchen, living space um, to the right-hand side. On the north side is the entrance area. That part of the building is single storey only. At first floor level, there are two bedrooms proposed, each with an ensuite, um, and then a living area um, to, to the right hand side of that. These are the elevations of the property. Um, so it's been explained to be in the style of um, a, an agricultural barn, um, typical of the AOMB. Um, the side elevations wouldn't have any openings in them. Um, the windows would be at each, each end of the building. The, um, the yeah, applicant will probably go into more details on this, but the roof is um, a, a photovoltaic film um, that's um, well integrated with the roof. It's going to produce um, energy 
Um, and yeah, one of the key things about this proposal is that it's a carbon negative dwelling, so it's going to produce more, more energy than it uses um, and will feed that back into the grid. These images show you what the building would look like. Um, the elevations are architectural grade recycled materials. Um, and as just explained, the roof is photovoltaic um, sheets to produce the electricity. Um, you can see the full height glazing um, on, on the end elevation. Um, so those, those are the, the um, slides showing, showing the elevations and um, images of the proposal. Um, you will have all read the officer's report. Um, we do have concerns that, um, actually going back a stage, sorry. In terms, terms of policy, um, the proposal is in the countryside where our core strategy policies don't support the creation of new dwellings. However, the applicant has promoted this as an exceptional design to meet paragraph 80E of the NPPF. That, that is a material consideration. So if the view is taken by officers that this high bar of paragraph 80E has not been met, so we don't feel that it is of exceptional design. Um, the applicant thinks otherwise, and as decision makers, it is um, up to you to decide whether that high bar of paragraph 80E has been met. Um, it, may, it may be worth just reading out paragraph 80E. Um, it is contained, well, yeah, also, look on page 57 of the committee report. It's um, there for you to look at in full. Paragraph 8.2.5. Um, so, it says, isolated homes in the countryside should be avoided um, unless certain circumstances apply. So, um, A to D aren't relevant in this case, but E is, and that says the design is of exceptional quality in that it is truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards of architecture and would help, and would help to raise standards of design more generally in rural areas and would significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining char characteristics of the local area. We as officers don't believe it meets that high bar test, hence the recommended reasons for refusal um, in that it doesn't meet our spatial strategy for the location of new dwellings in the countryside, unsustainable location. Um, we make reference to why the design doesn't meet the um, high, high bar test. Um, and there's also an issue of, because the site's over 0.2 hectares in area, um, no affordable housing contribution has been made. Um, and that's why that, that fifth reason for refusal is on there. Um, if, if it were approved, that could potentially be secured by legal agreement, um, which is noted in the report. Um, yeah, I mean, it's discussed in more detail in the report, which hopefully you've read. Um, the rec recommendation is to refuse. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Matt. Just to mention as well, we've had some further information uh, from the agent commenting on the report. I think we've all got that circulated. Yeah. Right, we have five speakers this morning. Um, the first one is, is Jackie, Jackie Scar from Settlescombe. Jackie, would you like to... Come up. I'm sure you know the ropes. <clears throat> Press the button. 
five minutes exactly. We'll tell you when your five minutes is over and then um, switch off. And then there are questions from members. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sedescan Parish Council made two comments on this application. Uh, firstly, in support of carbon negative housing, um, which we have done consistently when those have been presented to the Council. Um, we note that this proposal is significantly carbon negative, achieving um, three tonnes per annum in saving. That's six times higher than the only other carbon negative dwelling in 2021 in Rother, according to the government statistics. The Parish Council would ask members of the committee to give this great weight in their decision-making process, as it's clear from government statistics provided in the application that Rother does need to deliver carbon negative houses if they're going to meet their carbon zero target. Um, this need is more emphasised and brought into sharp focus with the current energy crisis. Delivering this type of dwelling, particularly in rural Rother, eliminates energy costs and does help um, with greater social good in offsetting those that emit um, are positive carbon emitters um, and may not be able to reduce their carbon output themselves. At the time, um, at the same time, the proposal shows using its re revolutionary solar film how you can have solar arrays on a rural building which are close to invisible and therefore don't detract from the AOMB. And this dwelling could set the standard for Rother, which is desperately needed. Um, secondly, we commented that we support housing which follows the high wheel design guide. And again, this is consistent feedback from the Parish Council on applications. Um, we were impressed that the high wheel AOMB unit was supporting this application. I don't think that's mentioned in the, office, in the officer's report. Um, is that, um, but quoting Claire Tester, she said, I was very impressed with the sustainability credentials of the building which is a net exporter of energy to the grid and uses low carbon and recycled materials in its construction. This includes the cladding material, which was the main purpose of my visit due to my initial concerns about the use of this imported mixture of recycled plastic and wood rather than locally sourced timber cladding. Having seen the material in situ, I'm happy that the appearance is appropriate for the AONB and its sustainability credentials outweigh the normal presumption in, in favour of natural timber cladding. Um, they also added, the proposed location of the dwelling on the site is adjacent to the historic farmstead of Beach Farm. And I agree that this is the best location for a new dwelling on this site so it can add to this existing cluster of buildings. This location has the advantage of replacing an unattractive and non-native group, group of con conifers. The Parish Council agrees with the high wheeled unit's comments and asks the committee to place great weight to, to both the design of this house, which will deliver the significant, significant carbon saving, and the fact that the high wheeled unit have given it their blessing. The unit rarely is so positive about applications, indicating a proposal is one of significant merit, we think. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Plenty of time left. <laughs> Could I just check before I ask members if they've got questions? You're speaking on your own behalf or on behalf of the Parish Council? No, on behalf of the Parish Council. Thank you. Questions, members? Councillor Errington. <laughs> Councillor Errington, I've got you first. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. You said there was, did you say that there's one other house like this in Rother? Yes, it's, um, it's in Battle on Powder Mill Lane. Um, it's, it's built and you can, you can see it, which is in one. the AONB as well, yeah. Thank you very much. Councillor Gordon. Hello, uh, Jackie. Um, I noticed that um, is Councillor Vine Hall on your uh, parish yes. chair? Yeah. Yes. He's chairman of the parish council. Yes. Um, have you any interest with that at all? Or, uh, Sorry? Have you had any sort of point of interest with that? Do you know him personally or very I'm, well? I'm the clerk for the parish council. Okay. Yes. Understood. Thanks. So. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, Jackie, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Um, <coughs> you claim that the dwelling would save three tonnes of CO2 each year. As compared to what? 
that's um, that's well, it's in the it's in the uh, planning application. It shows the statistics show that the dwelling will be carbon negative um, and therefore save three tons. Which is um, there's only other one there's only the one other carbon negative building in in Rother, yeah. um, and it's six times higher. So that's compared to um, new built houses. So in any new built house that would save three tons. Yes, as far as I'm aware. But, but like, I mean, it's, yeah. I'm not an expert, but it is in the um, application details. Thank you. Councillor Gamley, we probably could explore that when we get to, when we get to the discussion, Officer. perhaps. Yep. Shall I go? Councillor Mary Barnes. <coughs> Hello. Um, we, obviously, this is a, a house which would be incredibly you know, um, uh, easy to run um, and, and a, a huge saving on carbon. What does the parish council actually think about the design? Because that is the most important part of the, of the application. Um, when the parish council um, considered the application, they noted at the time that it was in line with the High World Design Guide which is something that they always look at when considering applications. And they had one um, only the previous meeting where um, they had carbon savings attached to it, but it was completely outside of the design guide. So um, that, that was the difference for them in terms of this application. Thank you. Any Councillor Mia. Thank you. Um, yes, the, the advice from the AONB planning unit, um, was that the pre-application advice? Advice given preliminary to the application? Yes, that was. Uh, and was it specific to this particular location? Yes, it was. It was, um, it was after a site visit. After a site visit. Thank yeah. you very much. That answers our question. Councillor Gunley? You say that pre-application advice was sought. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> Jackie, that's good. Thank you very much for coming along and speaking. If you switch off, then I can invite... Um, I've got two against the application. Uh, Thomas Scholar and Reza Khaleesi. Are they here? <laughs> I think you know the ropes now. No, I don't. No, not at all. Well, well I, I've watched. You've switched it on and you have five minutes. We'll tell you when your five minutes is up and then members can ask you questions. Thank you. Good morning. I live at the old barn, Settlescombe, which is part of Beach Farm, the original development. As you go north from Settlescombe on the B2244, you first meet open country on the right-hand side where Hurst Lane meets the 2244. Here the road bears to the left and you see a long straight road ahead of you with the speed D restriction sign in the distance. A couple of hundred yards further on, you pass the last house on the left, which is called Dell View. This now feels like open country, as the buildings around Beach Farm are all set well back from and hard to see from the road, even in winter. As you will have seen during your visit on Tuesday, there are in fact no buildings on either east or west of the site. Now, the footprint of this building is about 60% larger than the original old barn where we live. So it would be a pretty big building and pretty visible from the road. And there would at least be one car parked outside most of the time, as there's no garage and it's a live-work unit. In contrast to Delview and its neighbours, the buildings are now predominantly brick with red clay tiled roofs. After the brow of the hill and the bend, the vineyard comes up on the left, and although there are a few more buildings set back on the left, up to Crick's Corner, it does feel as if you were really in open countryside from Delview onwards. In other words, the building just before this site. Surely, gentlemen and ladies, Delview must be the place where the ribbon development stops, if it is ever to stop. If this development proceeds, it could open the door to applications on the west of the 2244 up to Crick's Corner, and even applications on the east side of the 2244 from Hurst Lane onwards, and in anywhere else in the AONB. In the past, 
rather have repeatedly rejected applications to build on this site. And Mr Morgan, who owned the field, applied to build three houses, then two houses, and he finally withdrew an application to build one house. Subsequently, when Rother gave permission to build the existing wooden shed and access road, they imposed a covenant which requires that the land remain as pasture. As far as I'm aware, this covenant is still in force, as it was included in the land registry records when I last checked. At the old barn, Rother rejected proposals for a granny annex and later the conversion of the garage into holiday lets. At the Oasts, a proposal to build a new dining room was rejected. I commend Rother's consistent approach in trying to preserve the character of the AONB and the local area. I'd like to turn to the ATE considerations because I have worked on some exceptional buildings before I retired. I led the structural design teams on Sir Terence Conran's redevelopment of the Michelin Building in London and the original design museum at Butler's Wharf, also for Sir Terence. From about 1993 until I retired four years ago, the firm I owned was responsible for all the structural design work at the Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill. This included all the lottery bids, all the subsequent projects, and to the enormous statues, the bus, and so on. I was deeply involved in all of that. I've been involved in architecture of all sorts, some exceptional, some mundane. mundane. A number of German firms produce factory-made kits to passive house or similar standards. They're usually very well engineered and well thought out. The architectural options for these houses are considerable. They can be glamorous buildings that look like something Mies van der Rohe might design today, or they can be a much simpler building, like a Wunderhaus WA2. As you may have seen from the website, they come in a series of standard designs, of which WA2 is one. Does a standard WA2 really relate to a Sussex barn? The old barn where I live has barn doors in the middle of each edge, blank edges and a hip roof. It's a mystery to me that a standard design can be considered to meet the requirements of paragraph 80E. I'm sure the speakers in favour of the project will correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I can see, the only novel feature of this project is the photovoltaic film. I have met all of the other energy saving features on this project in other projects that I've worked on over the years in the past. I don't know in what way this project would raise design standards locally. Is it a suggestion that a series of Wunderhouses in the AONB will follow? The DAS makes much of the economy of the Wunderhaus compared with the more usual paragraph 80E house. So this might be an attractive option to developers. A terrifying thought, in my opinion. But it is a contradiction. How could that happen as the concept would no longer be special and that would fail the paragraph 80E requirements? It's obvious to me, as an engineer, that the landscaping proposal has not been fully thought through and I have no time to talk about that. You must ask me afterwards if you need to. What constitutes outstanding design is a matter of opinion. But does the use of a new photovoltaic film so justify you, all the negatives? Running out of time. You've run out of time. Thank you. That's the last word I need. Thank, Thank you. you. No, do stay there in case there are questions. Questions? Councillor Byrne. Thank you. Um, from your experience, do you think it's inevitable that, that buildings like this or new buildings will gradually move away from traditional brick uh, construction and we will be seeing in the countryside houses that are more um, system built though not necessarily identical to each other. Do, well, you, do you feel that's an inevitable or desirable move? I, I would suggest that this sort of building is a, is a very good product and it is very good at reducing carbon emissions. The question I think before all of you is is that appropriate for the AONB? I would say no. I would say that your duty, so I apologise if I'm lecturing you, I don't mean to sound like that, but it seems to me it's about protecting the AONB. We can build lots of carbon neutral buildings in other places. We could even build them, for example, at the, um, the, the site identified by the parish council in their development plan up at the sawmills. That's allocated to work lives units. It hasn't got to be here. It could be on a truly brownfield site. Thank you. Councillor Mary Barnes. Thank you. Hello. Um, this were a design which was um, in keeping. I mean, I mean, I've got to be very careful how I use my words because obviously it is all a matter of personal taste. 
But are you against the building in that field under any circumstances, given your, um, your, your, your comments about the ribbon development? Yes. Um, Sorry. Or is it particularly that one? It's, it's the principle. Principle. Yes. I think if you don't stop development here, where do you stop it? Right. Okay. Councillor Norton. Um, so you said that the um, new dwelling would be visible from the, the main road. At the moment, the site is shielded by a, a very closely planted row of, of cupressus trees, rather scruffy cupressus. I think that the plan is that these will be, these will be cut down and replaced by native trees um, so that there will be a very solid green barrier between the new dwelling and the road. It won't be visible, will it? For half the year, it will be visible. It depends on the, what is planted, but they can be a mixture well, of evergreens and deciduous trees. That's possible. But, I mean, I, is that the point? Is it overwhelming whether it can be seen or not? You, you could plant a little row of trees all around the building, and it couldn't be seen, but it's still developed. And there will be a big drive with big splays because of the accessibility problems from the road. It's a very, very fast road. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. And have we got Reza Khaleesi here? Thank you. Do I need to explain? <laughs> Press the button when you're ready. And don't forget to press the button. I'm Reza Khaleesi. We live in Beach Farm Bungalow, which is an adjoining property to this piece of land. Um, as uh, Sadlescombe residents, uh, we voted on the Sadlescombe Neighbourhood Plan, SMP for short. This clearly sets out areas designated for development. This site isn't a designated area. The SMP represents the democratic process in action, and Rother District Council have to date protected land from development with the SMP in mind. Rother have also protected this uh, specific site before, this is evidenced by the refusal of repeated planning applications as listed in the planning officer's report. The covenants protecting this site are also in place. This application is in direct conflict with the SMP and Rother's own planning policy. So I ask what's different now and what's changed? This piece of land is listed as agricultural. It is not, definitely not brownfield and it is within the high wield AOMB. This is freestanding reason why it should be protected from development. If the proposal is approved, it will set a precedent for future developments. We live here because of its beauty and due to the protection that AOMB status gives. We have every right to expect that it will continue to stay protected. Why there are objections raised against this application, such as Westfield Parish Councils, indicate that the protection of the AOMB is paramount to our local neighbourhoods and not just my concern. Referring to the promotion of biodiversity, mine and neighbours' gardens contain various protected species. This piece of land is sandwiched between the two adjoining properties. As such, I don't understand why it hasn't been possible to locate these species as part of the biodiversity report. Our lived experience of nearly 20 years suggests otherwise. At dusk, I see bats flying across our gardens from this land. This land also hosts deer, dormice, grass snakes, and owls. This is a historic farmstead neighborhood. This land is already a meadow if managed suitably. In adjoining gardens, we have native narcissi, orchids, and other native wildflowers. It shows that if the land is not sprayed and managed with careful maintenance regime, it can rewild itself. It doesn't require unnecessary development to increase biodiversity and a meadow. If increasing biodiversity was the applicant's intention, why hasn't it been done already? <clears throat> the application promotes a carbon negative development. The house in isolation might be. However, I contest the overall concept. Firstly, this site is outside of the village development boundary. Hence, it's contrary to rather local plan core strategy, the SNP, and the national planning policy framework. There is no infrastructure to support it, i.e. pavements, lighting or public transport links, meaning that it's only accessible by a car. This location cannot, therefore, be deemed as sustainable. Again, having lived adjacent to this property, 
We've seen unprecedented increase in traffic along the B2244, as evidenced by Sadascom Traffic Advisory Group. It's already a dangerous road, and other property means needing access for transport deliveries, and especially it will be used as a business as well as a home. This will increase traffic risk, noise, and disturbance. Therefore, unsustainable development has a weak and questionable case to be carbon negative in the long run. The properties as Beach Farm date for you know, back 150 years. They are traditional Sussex buildings. One is great to list it. This proposal is not in keeping with these properties. It's an urban-style standard modular development which is unsympathetic to the AONB. The proposal requires extensive tree felling and soil excavation affecting the very rural character of this site. This historic farmstead within the AONB deserves to be safeguarded. In summary, rules and regulations exist to protect land such as this. We have these laws, guidelines, and, farm, and frameworks to enable best practice, to inform consistent decisions, support democracy, promote true sustainability, protect the environment and historic lands and buildings. This application you know, openly violates and flies in the face of all of the above. Thank you. Well timed, Mr. Kelly, is he? <laughs> um, Questions? Councillor Byrne. Thank you. Um, you say you're worried about the uh, increase in traffic. Are you worried about the increase in traffic while, during construction? Because, as you said, there is, there is parking space for one, there will be one car parked outside. So is it just the construction phase, or do you feel this building would somehow generate more traffic of, of, of other sorts? I think incrementally it will add to the overall traffic on that road. It, it, it will do, especially if it's going to be used as a, as a, as a work environment as well as a live environment. That, that road, you know, we, we, we live there, is very dangerous. It's, it's fast, especially in that stretch of the road. And another, you know, property needing access without, you know, all the infrastructure around it, it, it will make it more dangerous. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, thank you. you. You were saying about the uh, traffic. Um, there is an existing use for the field, isn't there? Was it, um, I can't remember, stables or something of that sort? So uh, we've been replacing one use with another. Uh, do you have a comment on that? I think the current use is that, you know, it's, it, it, it's just a pasture and, you know, they, they come and maintain it every now and then. So it's the very different set. It's going to be a very different setting to what it is today. Thank you. No more? So thank you, Mr. Kalesi, for coming along. Thank you very much. And now we move on to Dr. Feltwell. Just to say, Dr. Feltwell is, is renowned for his work, particularly nationally, on biodiversity, and he's certainly helped Crowhurst and Catsfield do their biodiversity audits, and he's also helped at our parish conference, just to mention that, that, that we already know his work. Dr. Feltwell, ready to go? When, you, when your light goes on, we'll time you. Chairman, uh, good morning everybody. Um, I am uh, Dr. John Felwell, a scientist. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to brief you about the ecological enhancement of this site. This is a win-win scenario for you, the environment, the AOMB, and a feather in your cap. This Monday, Prince Charles admonished everyone for not dealing with net zero quickly enough. If I may say so, these commitments around net zero have never been more vitally important. My own experience is understanding how developments can be seamlessly integrated into the environment whilst delivering net gain. 
I, have, I also have experience in the energy sector, having been the lead ecologist for 60 of the 1,000 large solar farms in England and Wales. The site itself is a small, unassuming field set off from a very busy main road and assessed, assessed, uh, assessed as being of low nature conservation importance. It is not along a quiet lane with 60,000 vehicles a day. It is a sensitive expansion of a farmstead. No protected habitats and no protected species are on site. The lack of protected species was recognised by the county ecologist and she found no grounds for refusal. All ex extra precautionary measures are in place and approved by the county ecologist waiting for you to condition RAMS and LEMP. The site is in the AOMB but it will not cause any adverse impact. In fact, it will enhance this particular part of the AOMB. To repeat, it will have a positive environmental impact. This type of neat, well-designed dwelling is perfectly, fits perfectly into the AOMB and what they ex expect for any new building. It ticks all the AOMB criteria. The AOMB unit has endorsed the siting, the building form and the cladding. There is an immediate net gain for the site. The existing barn and hard driveway will be removed and returned to the open soil. It is a replacement building. The new Wonder House has a smaller footprint than the existing road and barn, providing a net gain saving of an extra 110 square metres. Every little helps in the obligatory net gain algorithm. Then we add the enhancements. The site will integrate appropriate native plantings of trees and shrubs to make the site more biodiverse. That is why the AOMB and the county ecologists are fully behind this proposal and have not submitted any objection. The officer's report failed to reference the AOMB's positive comments. Masses of conifers line the frontage. These detract from the biodiversity and will be removed. Biodiversity is measured in a number of insects associated with tree species, such as English oaks have 423 species associated with it, and conifers only 70, and spruce, for instance. So replacing conifers with oaks is a six-fold increase in biodiversity. That's more mass for the algorithm. But there are more enhancements. Mixed native hedging has been proposed on the submitted, the, the submitted plan as well as the new wildlife pond and extensive wildflower meadows, which the applicant has demonstrated his expertise elsewhere locally. The replanting will be much more than like for like with hazel, spindle, holly, rowan, all from a local provenance. The cumulative net gain equation is thus elementary and compelling. I'm here to tell you that the exceptional building has integral environmental benefits, meaning that it does not take much from the environment, only air and a little water. What is exceptional in a design is that it never has an energy cost once built. It produces more energy than it uses. There will be no air pollution, no ground pollution. In terms of carbon saved, Rother is running a little behind the national average of 1.4. You have 1.5. Wonder House is minus 3. The project ticks so many green policies, MPPF, core strategy, green structure, green infrastructure, climate emergency, carbon neutral policy, environment strategy. The whole operation is exemplary. It's a comprehensive plan, significant enhancements for the AOMB. Prince Charles, remember his cautionary words. I commend this unique, unique environmental well. project to you. Thank you. You've just timed it beautifully. Yeah, thanks. Just in time. Uh, questions, members? Oh, Councillor Mary Barnes, I'll put, go take you first. <coughs> Morning, Dr. Caldwell. <coughs> um, so, you reckon it's going to enhance the AOMB? Yes. Um, the knock-on effect of building this particular design, which I think we've already heard has been replicated elsewhere, could possibly be, could it not, um, the, the reason for many more applications of that particular design to happen elsewhere. 
you're telling us that it's absolutely, and I totally agree with you, it is absolutely 100% carbon friendly. But it flies in the face of every policy that we have in Robber regarding the AONB, our local plan. And why do you think that we should allow this when in other, any other circumstances we would not be allowing? I, I would go by the judgment of the AOMB, who've looked at it acutely and found that it ticks all the boxes and is totally approved and, and approved in, within the AOMB. It is a replacement of a building. There's a barn and a, a roadway that's all going to be taken out. It's, so it's not a new building as, as such. It's a replacement of an existing building. And it's, it's barn-like. Uh, I don't want you to argue at this point. You can argue in the debate. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Feldwell, um, I'm going back to my previous point uh, on the last application of uh, construction, the construction phase. Do you think the construction of a house from traditional materials would have a higher, that the construction phase of a house would have more of an environmental impact than the, the, the construction using this new form of, of uh, semi-prefabricated, sort of um, custom-tailored to site yes. approach. Yes, because constructing an 18th, 19th century building would give huge demands on the environment. And, and so, yes, a lot of extra work there, whereas this one is made of recycled materials. Virtually all recycled materials uh, mashed up into into this uh, uh, material that goes in the walls. And they use old bottle tops. You wouldn't, can't see it there, but it's all mashed together. It's all, all recycled materials goes into the insulation. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, yes. Councillor Gordon. Thank you, Doctor, how do you do? Um, just your argument. Uh, states that uh, carbon, it does to me anyhow, that if you get a carbon neutral house, you can basically build it any way you like an AOMB. Would you agree with that or not agree? No, it's a sense of place, isn't it? Every, every, item, every proposal has to be looked in its, uh, where it's cited, so not everywhere would be, be suitable. So going back to the comment here about whether um, it's enhancing the, the site, the site is poor, its species poor, it has, uh, has no great environmental quality to it, so it, w it stands to benefit from all the enhancements. The, the frozen plan that you are discussing with an extra pond, it has no pond there at all, it increases the biodiversity and also the, the um, native species that are put in there enhances the site. So, it can't just go anywhere. This is a very species poor site that would benefit from enhancement. And the A O and B areas, um, the the it's not a high quality A O and B area. It's on the margins. It's on that busy road. So thank you. It, thank you. it couldn't be anywhere. Thank you, uh, Councillor Ganley. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, you you leave great weight on the ecological improvements and biodiversity improvements. Can such improvements be achieved without building a new dwelling in the countryside? The, the, uh, I think they can because what we have is a net gain here. Because getting rid of the, the long tarmac driveway and getting rid of the barn frees up 110 square meters of extra soil that once was soil and countryside. And the Wonder House has a smaller footprint. So creating that, if you had a similar scenario anywhere else in the AOMB, that would give you a net gain. Because the, the net gain that is calculated from the, the, environment, the environment Act 2021 that came out in December provides formulae for proving you get a net gain. So if it, produ if it produces a net gain, it answers your question, that it will benefit. 
disagree that it won't improve the environment. What I'm asking Councillor is... Councillor Gemley, we don't want the... Let's have the debate in the debating time. Well, I'm asking a question. Oh, go on, then. Uh, the, the removal of the two constructions that you refer to could be done and the environment improved without building a dwelling, surely. Am I right? I think it, that's disagree? already been answered. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. Yes, you could. You could take the take the driveway away and the and the barn, um, and let wildflowers grow again. Yeah, thank you. So it could be done without building a new dwelling. Yes. Any other further questions, Councillor Langman? Hello, Dr. Uh, Can I ask then, um, if this property is putting energy back into the grid, then it is supporting other properties in the AOMB, one has to assume. And can I also assume, being that we are in this very, very serious situation with climate change, can I also assume that the properties that currently exist in the AOMB are probably not very carbon friendly due to their age and, and condition and things, and therefore probably do have an impact in their own right on biodiversity and the area that they're yeah, situated your in. Two assumptions are correct, yes. But I would also add that um, this building provides energy to the grid, otherwise to everybody, and this technology means that if you have 10 of these buildings, you have created a little power station for yourself and Rolla hasn't paid for it, but the people who have built it have. So you get free energy there for everybody. Social gain. Much. Further questions? Seems like there aren't further questions, Dr. Feltwell, so thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. And we now have the applicant, um, Councillor Vinehall. <clears throat> little unusual experience, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and more nerve-wracking than you might imagine. <laughs> but thank you. Being last is always a little tricky. Thank you very much, Chair. So the High Wheel AONB unit are the defining experts on what is acceptable in the AONB, and they advise rather on all AONB matters. They have reviewed and supported the whole plan, including the siting of the dwelling, its relationship to the existing farmstead, the building, its cladding, and its sustainability credentials, the removal and replacement of the non-native Lelandi and non-native spruce with mixed native plants, and the reduction of the area of the built form by 42%, all these things rectifying previous damage done to the AONB. The creation of the wildlife pond, not an attenuation pond, and the wildflower meadow and verges, and the comprehensive biodiversity plan will enhance the AONB. The AONB units are not concerned about the minimal groundworks involved. All those things taken together will enhance, not damage the AONB, in line with paragraph 82 and 85 of the Crow Act. The application meets and indeed exceeds the social, economic and environment sustainability test set out in paragraph 8 of the NPPF. This brings us to the question of whether the proposal meets the test of paragraph 80E. Modern architecture is based on form following function. It is the architecture of the building that delivers the functional performance. Unlike many other paragraph 80 grand design type houses, this is, not intended, this is not intended to be one person's fantasy, which is unachievable by others, but a simple yet architecturally superior modern representation of a traditional barn where the function and greater social benefit is delivered by building the building and the comprehensive proposal being king. To help you decide if the design is architecturally exceptional and outstanding, it has already been peer-reviewed by and judged by experts. 
50 world-leading designers and architects have given this building the internationally recognised Red Dot Award. This is the highest international accolade in design. Wonder House is named because it delivers a never-achieved in rather 117A SAP rating, saving a massive three tonnes of carbon. Not carbon neutral, three tonnes negative. The performance is factually evidenced, not claimed as in the officer's report. It is simply an exemplar, and if approved, will set a new standard in Rother for all housing, not just rural housing. The dwelling has a wide range of exceptional design features, and I can go into them at a, at a, if you like later. So to put this in context, of the 326 new, new dwellings tested last year, the average carbon usage is one and a half tonnes per annum. That's just over 500 extra tonnes of carbon per year just delivered from those houses last year. Only one rated 100A with a minor carbon saving, and that was the prototype of this house. The only one that exists in battle is a prototype. At this rate, by 2030, Rother will be delivering an extra 8,500 tonnes of carbon per year. Wonder House's exemplar design shows that it's possible and affordable to turn that 8,500 tonnes into zero or better still negative. Because the building is made of normal building materials available to anyone, not just the wealthy, by using the highest standards of architectural design, it can deliver this exemplar performance and be easily transferred to any new dwelling, thereby raising the standards of all new dwellings, both in rural Rother and Rother. The officer's report is incorrect in many areas, the most significant error referring to the design as a kit of parts. This dwelling is built just like any other custom design, custom built property, and is not some form of kit form. It simply uses modern manufacturing methods to cut the frame off-site and, like every house, brings together a wide range of components into a dwelling of exceptional functional performance. A prototype has been built to prove the concept. However, the pro prototype has got many functional differences, and, and the, the, up, the, the one you're looking at today has got a six-fold improvement in carbon saving. I repeat, it is not in any way a kit of parts like a, some self-assembly unit you might buy from IKEA. The proposal of the dwelling, the significant enhancement of the field by rectifying the long-term damage to the OMB and the biodiversity enhancements and the way the building itself sits within the broader context of the original farmstead evolves the setting whilst being sensitive to it. At a distance, it's a barn in a field which you might expect to see. Paragraph 80 is a high bar, but it's not a bar with a barbed wire top. It's there to allow dwellings like this one that can set new paragraph 80 exemplar standards for the others to follow and not to be the exclusive area of the wealthy. In conclusion, because deciding on paragraph 80 is a subjective judgment and there are no statutory objectors, including highways, the committee are the unfettered decision makers in this application. I'm sorry. Can I just, one last sentence to finish off, if I might. May I? No. Okay. No, you can. Go on. Thank you very much, Chairman. It is one last sentence. Simply, this will be the first fully comprehensive, fully evidenced, fully supported in by the AOMB unit, significant carbon-saving new dwelling in Rother, which both dramatically improves the biodiversity and enhances the AOMB. This is architecture delivering sustainability and social responsibility at the highest level. I think that's Thank two you. sentences. <laughs> I'd write it as one sentence. <laughs> Questions, members? Councillor Stevens. Um, right, thank you. <clears throat> you being a great advocate for building outside the boundary, neighbourhood plan, and the parish council did turn a lot of buildings down on there. I'd like to know, I know it's an exceptional building, but it's still building in the countryside, outside the boundary, and not in your neighbourhood plan. Okay, very good question, and thank you for asking thank that, uh, Councillor Stevens. Um, firstly, the Settlescombe neighbourhood plan, the role of the core strategy are all out of date, as we know, because we only have a 2.9 year supply. So all the boundaries are out of date. In fact, all the policies are out of date, and that's a very sad thing for Settlescombe as well. However, paragraph 80 is an exception paragraph, and it is specifically for uh, properties or proposals which are in isolated locations. This is defined as an isolated uh, location based on the two, uh, Matt can brief you on it, two legal cases. So this is a very specific um, clause, very specific exception, which, if you like, and I don't like to use, to use the word, but overrides those policies. Because 
it is demonstrating something exceptional. That is the because. Councillor Gamley. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Councillor Vidal. <laughs> Uh, am I right in thinking this is the site that you and I visited many moons ago together? You remember, we went to... You are absolutely correct, and I was commenting on it just last night. There you go. Um, fine. Now, coming to the carbon saving, there is no carbon being produced currently on the site. So, in fact, there is no saving. There is a carbon avoidance, but there's no saving. No, that's incorrect. That's incorrect. The, 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 the property itself, the, the build, uses a, an absolute state-of-the-art technology, which is, a, which is solar film. Well, you saw the pictures on the screen. You didn't see a photovoltaic cell in sight. It's invisible. And the building creates more energy than it uses, and therefore you, you, you export the, the energy, and that is a carbon saving. In fact, the gentleman who did the analysis, and you asked about compared to what? It is a, an absolute analysis. It delivers minus three tonnes, and he described it as a carbon halo. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. The answer to that, and when we visited the site, and you're absolutely right, we did, uh, it, was a it was when you were looking for exception sites for, um, for affordable housing, and, uh, and we looked at that, but it would not be suitable for an affordable housing exception site, and I would agree with that. Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Just a couple of questions. Um, apart from the prototype window house, are there any other window houses in this country? There are none in any country, and it's not been built in Germany, as suggested. Uh, the architect who designed it lives in battle and has built the prototype. It's his sort of uh, swan song as he's sort of retired but he is an internationally renowned architect. He built it as a prototype uh, to see, see if he could do it. So this would be a first, not just for Rother, but for the world? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Thank you. Um, my other question is regarding um, running expenses. Are there any heating costs? There are absolutely no heating costs whatsoever. Um, the building produces the energy, stores it in the battery. Um, when, the, when, the, when it gets dark, it uses that. There are no radiators. No pipes, no underfloor heating, uh, or all the things that are connected to that, uh, yet it maintains a perfect temperature, hot and cold, all year round. Uh, Councillor, Mrs Barnes, did you have a question? Hello, Councillor Vanhoek. When you are back and sitting in the other end of the chamber, and uh, we've given this one permission, how are you going to feel about the replicatable nature of the design appearing in very many places around Rother? Which, of course, as we know, um, we have, and has has been illustrated, I think, um, been, um, we are aware that this is a site which would not normally be given permission. And, and, and I, I, I'm happy to debate that one with you. But the question is, this is something that's going to create a precedent. And whether it's got the permission of goodness knows who else. I can see that this is the beginning of a rather worrying trend in Rother for houses which may not be as expensively produced as this. But, for example, Etchingham Village Hall is the same shape. Councillor Mrs Barnes, what, I, I think we understand can I just, your can question. Can wind this one up? What, what will you do when you're over in this end of the chamber and you suddenly get a rash of similar applications throughout Rother? Okay, a uh, very good question and, uh, and one that I would hope that you would have asked uh, and expected from you. Uh, firstly, uh, if sitting in, if reversing my position that I will be uh, again next month, uh, every application has to be dealt with on its own merits, as we all know. And it would not be, it, there is no assumption that you could just plonk this anywhere. That is the point. Uh, and Dr. Feltwell explained about the, the whole, it's not just the house, and a paragraph 80 application is not just about the building, it's about the whole proposal. And that's the important thing. I don't think people should get stuck on that singular thing. It's about the whole proposal because it's about the biodiversity improvements, the improvements to the A and B. That is not necessarily you can, you, something you can apply 
just anywhere and everywhere. Uh, in the wrong place, it would be wrong. It's as simple as that. You know, we have had other proposals come to us uh, in Marley Lane, and they've made claims about being carbon neutral, but with no evidence. This is not carbon neutral. It is carbon severely, severely significantly carbon negative, and it, had, and it is proven. And that's the difference. Thank you. Okay. Does that answer your question? Extent, but it's hardly Lutyens, is it? It's hardly, sorry? It's hardly Lutyens. <laughs> I, I, you'd have to explain that, sorry. It's an architect. An architect. Famous. Well, I think uh, it's, it's a good point. Architecture is about form following function, which I said. Architecture starts off as what is right. It, it's, a, it's a societal thing. What brings us, what is right at the time for society? It's not about the necessarily, well, it, it ends up as the, what's on the physical exterior, but actually it's the function which you start with. And if you read definitions of architecture, they rarely mention the final visible look. And, and that's the point. It would be wrong to say, oh, well, this doesn't compare to the Delaware Pavilion. But I wonder when the Delaware Pavilion was, was built, if, if there weren't a lot of people that said, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> but, and, and within the high wheel, the important thing is you, there is a restriction to the design. So the, the, it is far more complex to produce a simple building in, in design and look than a building with lots of sort of fanciful things on it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Maidley, you had your hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, much more of a domestic question. Um, traffic. How many clients at any one time is uh, Mr Hodges likely to have on site? That was a question raised. Zero. Uh, his design business is entirely done via the internet. And uh, whilst it is an entirely separate project I started two years ago uh, for our whole area, uh, in, in August this year we will have fibre at home, which will have one gigabyte download speeds, and it will be available to this property as it will be to the neighbours and everyone right through to Eastview Terrace and Downbreed Lane. So, uh, one, the... The only person there will be one person and there will be no visitors in relation to the work. Having said that, the current field is an agricultural field, which we use, you know, for, we don't use it every day, but we are perfectly entitled to take a very large tractor and trailer out as many times a day as we like, using the existing access, which is not a good access, and the new access, which has been agreed with highways, there's been a lot of pre advice on that, uh, will actually improve the visibility for the old barn owned by Mr. Shollop. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Councillor Harrington. Thank you. I, I see that you're going to remove the non native trees and replace them with things which are more suitable. How established are they going to be, the trees that you're going to plant there? Yeah. So, you know, the best way to plant any, any native tree or plant, uh, you know, um, it, it, the smaller you can, you can um, plant it, the better, because it establishes better. But I look at one that's been planted in Hurst Lane, where I live, and it was planted a couple of years ago, and it's already eight feet high and very thick. So... The planting would take place immediately so that by the time the building was built, that would be established or reasonably well established. Yeah. Uh, another thing, looking at the um, high national world colour palette, does the house come in any different colour? <laughs> so, well, it's the, 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 uh, the colour that's shown there is, is in the high world colour palette. Uh, in fact, all the colours that... that that material is a, is a recycled architectural grade material and it comes in a variety of colours, all of which actually happen to be in the palette. Okay. Councillor Langland. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I, I've got a few questions, but I will make them really short and sweet. Um, I'm interested in the construction. I want to know how long the construction takes and what size machinery do you anticipate coming onto the land to build the house? Uh, so once the, the frame is timber, the internal frame is timber, and all of that is cut off site. So if I sort of exclude that, because that can be done in a warehouse somewhere, 
Once it's on site, it takes four men ten days because everything is ready to go and, and all the things like insulation panels slot in. So uh, the only piece of machinery that's needed is a what's called a loader, which is one of these sort of extending arms, and that's it. And that's only actually to reach the high points. There's, there's actually no piece of material that we'll be using that will be too awkward for more than two men to carry. Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, another one? I will try and get through. I, I understand it's got raft foundations. Can you explain more detail for me how it does use... Does it use significantly less concrete uh, than traditional foundation? Okay, so um, once again, a really good question because people always have questions about embodied carbon and it's one of the great struggles that anyone producing sustainable houses m might confront. The objective will be to use a more sustainable uh, concrete which might, in, might be uh, slag-based. That's, you know, the, the, the slag from... which is... Uh, um, refuse from another production uh, process, if you like. So um, we, you know, we have to wait till we do the full test, but the, the, the base is probably just going to be 8 inches or something like that, 8 to 10 inches, so really minimal concrete use. One more. Uh, why do you think this house fits with paragraph 80E as an outstanding design? Why do you think that? Well... Uh, very simply, I think it's been simplistically reflected in the report as, oh, this is a carbon-saving house. That, 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 that is a very, and I, no, I'm not trying to be derogatory in terms of the report, but it is a very simplistic uh, analysis of it, and I can understand why officers would, would go down that track if you like. It's actually about the benefit to society. You know, this is something which is, every year it is offsetting carbon produced that we can't stop being produced in existing houses. And the question about repeating the design, the point is not about repeating this design. The point of the paragraph 80 house is that you should be able to diffuse the ideas and the technology down to any other house. So the technology that's been uh, created here can really quite easily be applied to any house. Now, why hasn't it? The simple fact is that if builders could do it today, and uh, builders and architects, they would have done it, but they just haven't figured it out. And this, my architect, has figured it out. And so it is very easy, once you know what to do, because it's all made up of air source heaters, you know, uh, mechanical, um, uh, mechanical heat recovery systems. There's, there's, a few, there's a few special things, like the building behind the cladding is wrapped in a, uh, uh, an air-permeable waterproof layer, so it seals the building. And you think, actually, one of my neighbours said, well, why would you want to build here because of the noise of the traffic? When you're inside the building with it closed, it's, it is silent, completely silent, because it's sealed with triple glazing. And so all those sort of things can be diffused down, and that's the point of a paragraph 80 house. It's not to, it's not to win a prize on, you know, on Reba House of the Year. It should be to have things that can be diffused down to every other house. So it's not about producing... Ten wonder houses. It's about giving ideas to all the builders, and done at twenty percent lower than the average build cost. If you talk to Mark Gray, who's the building control manager, he will tell you that all builders are telling him that with the new Partel building regs that have come in, they're saying it will cost twenty percent more to build houses. Not the case. Done. I've got Councillor Byrne, and I've got Councillor Muir, and I think Councillor Gamley did you? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm playing a bit rather devil's advocate here. When we, those of us who went out on the site visit were presented with some very lovely, glossy photographs of demonstrating biodiversity and sort of green credentials. And you could say... Question. Are you, well, Question. Yes, 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 yes. You could say that you're ramping up <clears throat> the environmental credentials of this house so you can get a house built as a sort of good add-on. Or you could say it demonstrates real concern for the environment. So what are your environmental credentials? What can you tell us to say that's not greenwash, you are concerned? Yes, yeah, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that, because you know, people could say that sort of thing, couldn't they? Um, well, firstly, and you all, most of you know that I own a farm across the road from, from where this is and have uh, been farming there for some uh, or close to 20 years now. 
Uh, it's a grass farm and we have about 200 acres of woodland. So uh, I've, I have for the last 12 or 14 years, I can't remember, promoted a wildflower field which is species rich and uh, regularly audited by a lady called Dawn Brickerwood who's a sort of local expert in this area. And that's taught me an enormous amount about biodiversity and about uh, what, what wildflowers are, you, know, you should have or shouldn't have or whatever in this area. I've planted something like a mile of, of native hedgerow, at, not with any grants or anything like that. In the next two years, uh, I put a proposal to DEFRA to actually turn 200 acres of grass uh, into a, an area which is rich with wildflower and legumes. The wildflower will create a greater insect environment and the legumes will, uh, will help to lock in nitrogen in the soil. So overall it will dramatically improve carbon, sequest carbon sequ I can't say this word, sequestration. And, and that's, that's a major thing. So we will move away from, um, you know, from traditional farming. Thank you. Councillor Mir. Councillor, a couple of questions. Um, you've told us about the favourable opinion of the AONB planning unit, uh, for which we thank you. Um, I don't see... Uh, anything from the county landscape people? There's no county landscape assessment, and I don't see an opinion from our conservation officer. Can you comment on that? Um, the, well, it's down to the uh, officer to, uh, to fill you in on that because he would have consulted on the relevant people. He did consult with the conservation officer. The conservation officer came out to see the property, and, and I think within the report that's embedded within there. It might say conservation, but when I read it, I sort of figured that the relationship to the grade two listed houses and the other houses, that commentary, I think he'll confirm that has come from, from the conservation officer. The conservation officer also visited the prototype and uh, was, um, I have to say, from a conservation officer's point of view, blown away because he took photographs of it uh, juxtaposed to the, it's not a listed building, but it's more of a heritage building next door and was very impressed with how the two sat together. Hmm. And, and um, you, you say that in architecture, uh, form follows function, um, and the laws of physics do, de do determine a certain, certain shape which is consistent with being habitable. Um, so I assume that building to follow these principles would have to be approximately the same shape as this one. Is that right? Um, well, this barn, this barn shape, um, it wouldn't be possible to have one in, in the form of a, a cross, for example, with, with traditional wings thrown out or anything of that sort. Well, um, to achieve the result, you could have it, you could, the, the, the base technology you could apply to any house. And that's the point, it doesn't matter what shape it is. The reason it's this shape is because that is the shape of the high wheeled. And the objective here is to evolve that while still making it sensitive to the setting. Uh, but if you've had an area where you wanted to put a, if you wanted to build a building in a cross, you could, with as many windows as you want or whatever you wanted to do, this technology, or it's not, when I say the technology, all of this stuff exists. The question is, actually, nobody has figured out how to bring it together. So if you talk to the air source heat suppliers, they don't talk to the people who build, who make the, the, uh, uh, the MVHR units in the roof. So that, none of them have worked out all, how it goes together. This has... And that's why you get this very gentle air circulation in the building, which is you can't feel, and that is causing a really good environment. So uh, another very small positive aspect is that if you're a hay fever sufferer, you'll never have a, a pollen bad day again living in this house. The air in the house is cleaner than the air outside. Councillor Ganley, then perhaps I think we're probably ready to debate this and, and, and take a vote. Uh, <clears throat> Councillor, you, you, I, I didn't quite follow what you were saying earlier on about uh, improved broadband. Was it broadband uh, extending down to Eastview Terrace and so on? So about um, during COVID, as we all realised how bad our, bad our broadband was, Indeed. I decided to take on a project uh, as, and as big as I could to introduce uh, ultra-fast fibre to homes. So, you know, the fibre goes directly to your home, which gives you one gigabyte download and whatever upload, same upload. Yeah. And um, I, I worked with OpenReach and we agreed 
that it would run from uh, a little bit north of this site all the way down Hurst Lane, Churchill's Lane, Balcombe Green, the Guinea of Eastview Terrace, and all the way out to Jacobs Farm and Powder Mill Lane. These are the worst uh, broadband areas in Selston, if you like. And that is due to the... I mean, it's taken enormous work uh, to do this, a uh, completely community scheme that I've done. Um, and that will... It's, it's due to be installed... It was due to be installed in April. It'll be due to be installed in... in um, August. I've also done in one in three, in three Oaks and about to do one in Kent Street as well. Thank you. Um, my reason for asking is that uh, I should tell members of the committee, I, I live on that road, albeit a mile or two further north. So my question is, will it extend further north? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a fibre cable that runs down to the industrial estate that you could probably tap into. Oh. But uh, if you'd like me to explain how to get it done, I can. Yes. I, think, I think the green pod that they would run from is up at Cripps Corner. Um, yes. It takes some work, but yes, I'm very happy to, uh, to do that. And, and I will reflect on one thing, because one, uh, one, one of the pieces of advice, one of the comments in the report said that it was concerned about domestication because of the fencing around it. Uh, and but unfortunately, the advice from the A&B team was to put that fence in there and that was related to appeal, an appeal a few doors down from you at Morgay, Morgay Wood, Morgay uh, Farm. Upper Morgay Wood. Yeah, which is an appeal that was uh, lost would. by the council. So, yes. so that is why that's there. But I'd be quite happy not to have the fence. All right. Well, it was, it was one on appeal, and in my opinion, quite right. Yeah, and, and the use of the field. But, yeah. uh, can we... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say, that it's important that the use of the field, the rest of the use, can easily be conditioned. I think we're there. I think, Councillor, we you've probably had the longest the longest session ever. Um, are we all ready to, to debate vote? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Gordon, could I ask for a recorded vote, please? Because uh, he is a member of the council. I think, Sorry, should, what, I think I'd like a recorded vote. Who votes where? If I may. You need uh, three colleagues to stand with okay. you. <clears throat> As a reminder, I'm sure you don't need reminding, that in our constitution that we do not have political decisions. Uh, just as a reminder. I think that was a little bit premature about voting because I hope we can have quite a debate first. Um, yeah. I've actually flip-flopped all the way through this. Um, it's for and against, for and against, for and against. Mm. Sorry, sorry to interrupt sorry. you. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor. Uh, I'm You're excused. Okay. Mm. And I should be far more sensitive to speakers in the future <laughs> if I'm not already. <laughs> um, Councillor Drayson, I did have Councillor Norton's hand up. Um, I don't want to sound over dramatic, but I do think we could be on the brink of making quite a historic decision here today. I think we might look back in, in time to come on today as a bit of a landmark in our battle to combat the climate emergency. And I say that because the exemplar argument, and I think the exemplar has been the key word in this discussion today, the exemplar argument weighs very heavily with me. I think we all are very aware, aren't we, of the very poor quality of much of our new housing in the, in the Robert District. We desperately need models to improve it. And nobody can doubt that this is the most superb model. This is an exemplar par excellence. It ticks all the right environmental boxes with a vengeance. And as far as the plans to develop the site are concerned, it ticks all the ecological boxes with a vengeance. And so, for that reason, I enthusiastically support it. Are you recommending approval rather than refusal? Um, I think we're going to have some more debate first, aren't we? I'm yeah. happy to propose it, but... Um, we need to okay. I interrupted you, sorry. No, thank you. I was going to say, I was um, just flipping and flopping between it, sort of supporting and, and opposing. Uh, but I am concerned, I'll start with one question and one statement. I am concerned that the report from the AOMB planning unit doesn't seem to be in our pack. 
uh, and several speakers have referred to it and the fact that they support this wholeheartedly, but we've not seen it, or I've not seen it. I don't know if anybody else has. I think there was an update that was sent round to you from the agent. Right, I've missed that. I shall go back and look at that. Um, okay, uh, but then on the section 60, uh, section 80 specifically, and the question of setting precedence, if, if an architect comes up with a design of exceptional quality and is truly outstanding, surely it should be repeated elsewhere. We shouldn't require architects to try and invent, reinvent the wheel every time. And I disagree with the officer's uh, contention in paragraph 822, which basically talks about being a bespoke design. Um, surely there is no requirement for each time for a bespoke design. If a design has worked elsewhere, then surely fitting it in and it fits somewhere else, we shouldn't be saying no. I think in the notes the agent sent round, they made exactly that point, that it's, it's, uh, it's not a kit. Well, there we go. Uh, Councillor Gray. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I was lucky enough to see the prototype Wonder House and was absolutely blown away. Every single detail from the roof, the um, voltaic cells, from the light switches in the house, the <coughs> overhang of the windows um, to protect the night skies, as well as keeping the windows clean. It was absolutely state of the art. I thought Passive House was the highest standard of sustainable housing at net zero, but this achieves an amazing carbon negative of three tonnes per, per annum. After carefully considering the application proposals, I do think they meet the terms of Part E of Paragraph 80 of the National Planning Policy Framework, which is a material consideration in respect of this application. In my view, this scheme does meet a truly outstanding standard of design through its form based on the shape of historic barns, the materials, appearance and function, achieving a carbon negative standard. It is also clear that due to the method of construction and affordability, the proposals can act to raise design standards locally, thus contributing, contributing to the aim of achieving sustainable development and addressing the climate emergency. The design can also be considered on a site-wide basis, where it has been demonstrated that the scheme will restore and enhance the character of the high wheeled landscape and net gains in biodiversity within the wider site, thus enhancing its setting and will be sensitive to the local area as acknowledged by the High Wheeled AONB unit advice. The lift work arrangement of the proposals and the improved highway safety are further material considerations in favour of the development, and when considered in light of the Council's current housing supply shortfalls, an approval is considered to be justified, subject to the imposition of suitable conditions and securing the long-term landscape and ecology benefits by legal agreement. It's not an easy decision to overturn officers' recommendations, but in this case, I think we must make an exception. In paragraph 8.2.7 on page 59, it stated that whether, whether, whether this fits the criteria of outstanding design is a, is a matter of subjective judgment. What could be more truly outstanding than this? We know it's been awarded the Red Dot Award, the highest design award, internationally recognized as outstanding. It not only addresses the climate emergency, and heaven well, knows... surely pre-judgment. We're supposed to make our decisions... Excuse me, could you let... Yes, no, finish? no, I'm just saying, point of order, that this is actually a report that was written earlier. It does not show any evidence of, any, of, of, of anything that has happened during the course of the meeting. It is a report that has been written in advance of the meeting, and I don't think that's right. I, I, just because okay. Councillor Gray has it's, to write things down before a meeting, I, it's not to be detracted I, from. I, I, be aware of that. Uh, I prepared this from going through all the papers, Mary, and uh, as it's quite long. Uh, I'm, I'm Continue, almost, Councillor. I'm Councilor. almost there. I'm sorry. Um, a matter of subjective judgment. I'm saying what could be more truly outstanding than this? We know it's been awarded the Red Dot Award, the highest design award, internationally recognised as outstanding. It not only addresses the climate emergency, and we are in desperate straits. We are in dire times. Only this week, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, said we are all facing collective suicide. But it also addresses the cost of living crisis by eliminating heating costs. This is a gold standard that we should be aiming for in Rother in all our new builds. We have no time to spare. Let's start the ball rolling here and now. And I would like to propose approval. Thank, Thank you. you. That sounds as though you're seconding it. 
I, I am, if it's already been proposed. Um, actually, it would be very useful to have what you've written, um, because if we are, if it does get approval, we will need reasons for approval. And I think you've described it from the, actually from the report. You've described it well. No, you're perfectly right to do what you've done. Just because a member doesn't agree with you doesn't mean you can't say it. Councillor Stevens. Hi. Um, this is a house of fantastic eco-friendly, but I live in Rye and we have turned down buildings, not as good as this one, I appreciate that, in, you know, outside the boundary, area of natural beauty. I mean, this council have always stuck by them rules. I don't know why this is, you know, going to be... Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, it is beautiful, but I can't support it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I've got Councillor Ganley next and then Councillor Byrne. Yeah, a question for Mr Worsley. Um, Pre-application advice, I understand, was taken. Uh, do you consider the pre-application that you gave was was uh, followed. Okay, to clarify, the pre-application advice um, was sought by the applicant from the AOMB units. Oh. Pre-app was not um, sought from Rother District Council, so we didn't give an opinion at the pre-app stage. Well, um, I must say that it um, <coughs> it is rather surprising that that anybody would, would submit an application um, which attracts five reasons for refusal on planning grounds, I might I, not not from the reasons of the heart, but solid pro, uh, planning reasons. Um, most refusals are based on one or two reasons. Five is quite exceptional. If I can't remember so many for an application, certainly not in the last year. Uh, it's outside the defined development boundary for Settleski. Um, the design is beautiful, but it's, it's not exceptional to justify the, 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 the um, rubric of um, satisfying the, the condition. Um, It's in an unsustainable country location. It ap the application site measures more than 0.2 hectares in area. Uh, and, and as such, is required for... Um, uh, affordable housing is required on such a site. I mean, there are five reasons there for refusing this application. And how do you overcome those five reasons? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Byrne next, and then Councillor Langley. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really, to answer one of Councillor Ganley's points, I notice in the uh, notes we got from Dr. Fletcher that he remarks that uh, rather have already given approval, delegated uh, by office, delegated to officers, for other buildings in the AOMB that do not meet the test of 1.2 hectares, or sorry, 0.2 hectares. So uh, certainly a precedent has been set before for that not being um, a deal breaker in terms of uh, the area and where it is. So a quick question to officers, do they believe that the, um, the planning applications that are quoted as exemplars here, are they in fact examples? I, I must admit being new on planning, I, I haven't had time to read these, the, the ones that are quoted. Yes, I, I had a look at them, but I'll ask Matt. Yeah, well, well, sorry, which paragraph am I looking at? Um, so that's Very the, that's the ones, you, the ones that have been granted, the yeah, the ones that have been granted in the AONB, which seem to equally conflict with, um, or at least seem to conflict with some of your reasons for refusal. Okay. Ooh. Shall I let give you time? I was only going to try and find where it is in the update sheet. 
Councillor Langley, would you like to come in while oh, I've got Matt's a, I've doing got a it? second while we're at it, oh, oh, go if on. I may. Sorry. Um, going to paragraph 80, which I think is really the nub of this whole matter, uh, reading, it says, is truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture. Now, the question there is, is architecture purely the external view, or is architecture considered to be uh, the internals and the, and the, the overall, uh, the overall, the overall, really, of the building? Uh, I would contend that architecture is, is all of those things, not just the external. Um, also, with uh, those who may not know, I'm a cabinet member for housing. It would appear that with government thinking at the moment, the, there is the presumption more and more and more that planning committees will grant for greenfield as well as brownfield sites. And I think we may well find that the ability of an AOMB to protect its boundaries is somewhat eroded. Now, I'm not saying whether that's good or bad. I'm just saying, in my opinion, I think that's something that's coming down the track. But also, we haven't got our five-year supply. And, that needs and we haven't got our five-year supply. So, uh, paragraph E also says, would significantly enhance its immediate setting mm -hmm. and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. Now, if we are going to have some sort of creeping erosion of AONBs throughout the country, this is our chance to set a standard saying, OK, if it's got to happen, it's got to happen. But uh, this should start to define the sort of building we're going to build in those areas. So uh, even though it doesn't, define, it, it's, it doesn't define the characteristics of the local area now, I would say in the future, this is our chance to, to put a peg in the ground saying, this is what we expect in future as, uh, to define that area. Has got to, it's, it's got to be as environmentally friendly as this. It's got to be as well thought through as this. The materials have got to be looked at uh, sympathetically with whichever A, A or B you, you're, you're looking at. Now, I know we're just looking at Rother, but nationally, my view is it's going to happen. This is our chance in Rother to put a peg in the ground and say, if, if you're going to do it, here's how you're going to do it. And this represents an excellent example, if we're going to have to have houses, of the ones we should try and strive for. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, to pick up on your first point about the examples provided, um, I would say of that list of rather applications we've been given, MOM were determined in respect or against paragraph 80E. <laughs> so it was different policy tests. So either a replacement dwelling in the countryside, perhaps edge of settlement. I don't, I mean, I'm not going to go through each one and Explain in the, yeah. in the AOMB, yes, they were, they were in yeah. well, we're told they're in the AOMB. Um, the, the, the point is, MOM were determined against paragraph 80 e of the MPPF. So, so, wasn't, so paragraph well, we've got different policy tests for, for example replacement dwellings in the countryside can be acceptable if they have a similar landscape impact. If you've got an undeveloped field, appreciate there's a small storage building here in the track, but apart from that, undeveloped, then we haven't got a policy that allows it in the core strategy, so that's going to maybe a plan. The material consideration for you is paragraph 80, which allows exceptionally designed houses um, on these isolated sites. Um, I don't believe so, no. They, well, put it this way, we rather have not granted a par paragraph 80 house before that I'm aware of. But we have granted permission for houses in the AOMB against different policies. Uh, now, I've got Councillor Langland. Thank you, thank you. Well, actually, then, if that's the only autonomy we have, paragraph 80E, then bring it on, because I think so many of our policies, 
in terms of climate change are outdated and not actually responding to the needs of today. And my argument is we have 80% of our district is AOMB. And we're not going to have any AOMB if we don't start thinking about how we can build properties that are sustainable, that support the um, community, and are really environmentally friendly. We have to start thinking about that. And something that has this level of excellent design <coughs> cannot be ignored. It's got the red dot approval. I just can't see how it can be ignored. We, we have a serious... I'm going to read. I'm sorry, Mary, but I can't express myself without doing that. So I will be reading. Uh, I have a serious difficulty, we do, having our five -year, meeting our five-year land supply, and we have the autonomy to make decisions that protect and enhance our district. Paragraph 80E of the MPPF gives us, the planning committee, the opportunity to look outside the box and recognise that we will be of value to our environment, landscape and community in the future. What is exceptional in this design and quality? I believe this application is the first one I've seen that pushes the boundaries of our very outdated policies in relation to climate change. I'm not blaming Rother for that. I just think the government and everybody else is not moving forward fast enough. We are still obliged to approve large developments that use totally inappropriate materials and install gas boilers each house produces 1.5 tonnes of CO2 in construction. This application is sympathetic to our AOMB and actually saves three tonnes each year, making it significantly carbon negative in an environment where our aim is to preserve woodlands, wildlife, agriculture and create a balance in our ecosystems. So what do we as individuals see as truly outstanding? Because that's what it's down to, really. It's down to us as individuals today to see what's outstanding. Architecture has many functions, and what it is used for determines its design and technical construction. This piece of architecture has been designed to have a function at a time when climate change is impacting on all life forms. It's a sustainable way of living and is putting energy back into the green. It's constructed from natural and recycled materials, stores water and energy, and is used technology to enhance its functions. It offers living and workspace, reducing the need to travel and further impact on our infrastructure and carbon emissions. We as an organisation should be fully supporting this because it, we are fully supporting working from home. It will sit in an agricultural landscape and epitomises the barn-type structure, sensitively adopting the colours recognised by the High World Design Guide. The design has even considered the use of gutters, fixings and photovoltaic cells to ensure they are built into the structure, producing clear lines that enhance the design. The surrounding environment will be enhanced with higher levels of biodiversity, including native planting, and a pond. The highest standards in architecture in rural areas have to be based on sustainable architecture. This is an outstanding design with an outstanding function and it fits in the natural environment in a non-obtrusive way. I fully support the application as for the first time it ticks all the boxes for addressing climate change and it will respect and preserve the wonderful area of the AOMB that we are currently custodians of. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Curtis. What to say after that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, thank you, Chair. Without the fear of uh, iteration, no, um, I think absolutely everything uh, has been said. I think the confusion came earlier when, uh, because we're looking at the house in the AOMB and it suddenly became a house in the AOMB, you've got to look at it separately, which is sort of um, about building in the countryside, etc. 
apart from the uh, superior qualities of the build that's proposed. So then will one fit in the other? Um, and then, of course, because of the superior standard of the proposed building, it actually does tick all the boxes required for building in the countryside, where it says it should have this and it could have this and carbon neutral and, that, and it work, live and work, etc. So suddenly it does fulfil those um, requirements. It's minimally invasive, um, there's no noise, uh, it's sustainable. It's, um, it's, this is what, I guess, sustainable houses will look like in the future. Um, I did pick up on a couple of comments about, well, yeah, but it doesn't look very nice. Well, usually, if you look at everything modern today, it doesn't in comparison. Um, you know, and I live in the country and I, I'm used to old buildings, etc. And, of course, the other thing, um, which not necessarily swaying me, but I can only speak as a fine, is in Catsfield, we have this very same property, which was uh, approved by us two years ago. And I have to say, when I first, um, there wasn't all that keen. Um, but it's totally carbon neutral. It's, there is no cost involved in it. It sits in its own ground. And it is next to a um, Georgian uh, large edifice, if you like. Um, and it now blends into the, everything's, you know, the oversight's probably growing up and the, some of the bushes are coming back, etc. The, the, the good thing about that, I don't think there was any tree removal required, um, which is always a plus point. And I know on this application, uh, tree removal is minimal. I mean, it's apart from um, the land iron, etc., which um, is not necessarily a loss, but there would be some other species better. Um, so we've got one, <laughs> to coin a phrase. We've actually got the property... And there it is, and it's costing absolutely nothing and putting back something to the community. Um, oh, I'm missing anything. And, of course, the other point, the very important point is, and we know we've been quite... Um, have different opinions on this about building in the countryside and the AOMB. The most important thing is, because the rules and regulations are there and we look at them and it says you can, you can't, you should, you shouldn't, etc., etc. But I think at the end of the day, it is most important to look on each case as an individual um, issue. In certain instances, I'm sure my colleagues may agree, well, you go and look at something and you think, yeah, that, that fits. You know, it's, you get, an, you get a... Um, uh, an opinion of it. Or you might look at it and think, no. And that's before you've argued over whether you can and can't, and etc., etc. So it is very important. It's such a contentious issue um, for there's winners and losers, there's people, you know, there's, for neighbours, for it's, we're, we're totally mindful of that. I think from um, what I hear on the committee, there's quite a balanced overall view. Some good, some negative. Yeah, that's what a committee is all about. But I do think we give a balanced view. So anyway, um, we can't. You can't get better than the standard of the house that has been proposed. That you can't. That's the the pinnacle of the um, of the standard. So we the the um, argument then comes: Do we create this building in the countryside? And I think, as it all happens at the moment, it would appear that it would fit. But I'll let that on to my... Thank you very much. That was really yeah. useful. And I think you've put your finger on the whole crux of the matter, is that, and it's said in the report, this is subjective judgment when you deal with 80, um, that policy. Um, I've got the... Um, Jay Greek would like to come in. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to address the committee on a couple of points. Firstly, um, I, know, I noticed there's been an issue raised about talking from pre-prepared notes. Now, generally, there's not a problem with councillors looking at papers beforehand and preparing notes based on what they've been presented with. But we have to be a little bit careful that we have had an open mind during the, during the committee as such. So I just remind councillors just to keep an open mind in respect of what matters that have come up for discussion today. 
Um, aside from that, I'd just like to go through some of the, the duties in play. Um, they do seem to have been well grasped by the committee, but I just think it's useful to go through them. So fundamentally, um, according to Town and Country Planning Act Section 70, you're obliged to uh, make a determinations in relation to planning applications in accordance with the local plan unless material considerations dictate otherwise. Um, and in particular with this application, you are also obliged to consider Section 85 of the Countryside and Rights to Way Act, which basically says, in exercising or performing any functions in relation to or so as to affect land in an area of outstanding natural beauty, a relevant authority shall have regard to the purpose of conserving and enhancing the natural beauty of the area for outstanding natural beauty. So that's an overarching duty. I just wanted to make clear that that's in play. Um, section 80, so paragraph 80 of the MPPF effectively does encapsulate that section 85 um, and creates a, an opportunity for members to effectively decide that they're, what they, what's in front of them um, can effectively overcome um, what is in the local plan. And so I just wanted to specifically reference Section 85 because that duty exists. Um, and in terms of the 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 um, paragraph 85 and, and the local plan, um, essentially, um, as you've all grasped, this is a judgment call as to whether you believe the application in front of you is unique enough to meet the criteria in Section 80E. Um, so I just wanted to go through that just so everyone knows exactly, you know, what they're considering and why. Thank you. Thank you. And just speak, could I ask you, do you have a view or a comment on the fact that a member has asked for a roll call? Because we've never had that on planning. Um, it, it's something that constitutionally, as you pointed out, three members are in, in, agree, in agreement. It's something that you can do. Um, Ultimately, it's a matter for the committee to, to, to consider if, if the num relevant number of parties um, do indicate that that's what they want to do. I mean, it may be useful given the identity of the party who, who's made the application. But I would reiterate the comment you made, um, Chair. Fundamentally, this is not a political committee. Our, our members are obliged to make decisions based on the material considerations in front of them and the application that's in front of them. Um, so, um, if, if it will help with the transparency of the matter, you know, I, I wouldn't be against it, but fundamentally it has to be um, suggested by the correct number of people before we can consider it. Thank you. Councillor Harmer, wait. <laughs> Councillor Harmer next. I've got Councillor Harmer, Councillor Mir, Councillor Barnes again, um, Councillor Gamley, and Councillor Errington, and Councillor Gordon, and then I might say, let's take a vote. Thank you, Chair. As ex officio, I don't normally speak, and this is the second time today. Uh, I do feel passionately about this one as well. I'm not going to read War and Peace because everyone else has done that very eloquently. <laughs> Thank you very much. So this is my scratched observations. Um, three paragraphs. Um, whether the proposal enhances the AONMB, and I think it does, um, work it, for instance, replacing the native trees and, remo and removing the access I'll stand in. Um, the high wheel day on MB units support it, and surely they are the experts. Um, I think it's a brilliant biodiversity plan, and we have heard from Dr. Fetwell, thank you very much, before. So we know he has been involved in the plan, and it's got to be a good one, in my opinion. The difference with this application is it can actually prove its amazing carbon saving and that is what I think this council wants ultimately. Uh, this will set a much needed standard in rather for houses in the rural areas and I think someone mentioned earlier we're at a really important point here. Uh, I think everything should be taken on its merit. I personally think it's a great thing and I would support even though I can't vote. Thank you Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mia. Oh, Chair, um, in, in fact, I was going to say I hoped that a lawyer would be listening in, and, and indeed he was, and I'm very grateful for that advice. Um, in, in answer uh, to one or two comments, I think, from uh, Councillor Stevens, um, obviously this is outside a development boundary, etc., etc. That doesn't fit with the Settlescombe plan, and so on. But the point is we do have paragraph 80 of the National Planning Policy Framework document in front of us, 
and it is that we are being invited to consider. And if it falls within that, as a matter of our judgment, as a matter of fact and degree, all the rest, um, then we, we would be entitled to grant the, the application, not, notwithstanding that it's outside the development boundary and, and so on. That's the whole point. That is the whole point of paragraph 80. Um, as to the question of architecture, does architecture include design? I, I, I would say yes, I would, I would agree with Council, Councillor Byrne on that, but it's the, it's the whole thing. It, it's the internal design, the external design, the engineering of it, the, um, the, of course in this case the energy efficiency or and positive contribution that it makes. Um, I would think that those things are that we can take into account, but we have to consider those things to be truly outstanding. Um, as to enhancing its immediate setting, uh, we've heard from the ALNB um, that there are well, no objections. They are actually positively supportive. Uh, I think that's a very important um, a, a opinion, and we should place proper weight on that. Um, it, the proposal will improve, uh, I wouldn't call it a derelict site, but one which has been very badly planted, and it will create more better better conditions for wildlife. Um, so I think it probably would enhance its immediate setting. Uh, and uh, to be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area, again, I don't think it, I don't think it has to be a pastiche. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be an, like an actual barn. It, it doesn't have to have a red tiled roof. It, it, it doesn't have to have um, white painted boarding or whatever. Um, it has to be sensitive to the divine, defining characteristics of the local area, and I would say not just the, not just the buildings, but also the, the, the landscape, which, which is so important in the AONB. Uh, so I, I, I would say that this particular application does, it, it strikes a lot of good hits, and I, I hope councillors will take those points in, into consideration when voting. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just ask the committee's um, opinion, please? Because uh, Councillor, um, Councillor Maynard is here as the ward councillor. Unfortunately, he wasn't here at the time when I would have invited the ward councillor to speak. Are you willing to actually hear him? Yes. Councillor Maynard. Can everybody hear me? Fantastic. Thank you very much. I assure all members that I've been watching the meeting sitting over the road. I thought that, uh, um, I'd be able to come in early, but I wasn't able to. So um, thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chairman, of allowing me to speak. I think that clearly uh, there's been a very long debate. I've watched the entire debate on the webcast. And um, you have a, um, a certainly a, a difficult decision in front of you. But I would draw your attention to um, the officer report again in point 1.3, 1, 1. Which, which references, on top of the harm to the AOMB, the development is found to represent the creation of a new unjustified dwelling in the countryside, contrary to the spatial strategy for Settlescombe and of the districts as a whole. The location of the site is unsustainable and no affordable housing contribution has been provided. I think there's a, there's a fundamental issue here um, for all members to address, and that is in terms of its relation to the local plan, and in terms of its relation to the neighbourhood plan for Settlescombe. And as we've heard from, from the officer team, those two do count. Uh, they're not to be uh, disavowed and, and ignored. And quite simply, I very much worry, and I think as Councillor Mrs Mary Barnes alluded to earlier, the precedent of allowing a new dwelling in the countryside um, that officers of the opinion doesn't um, properly address the Section 80 issue, which has already been discussed widely throughout the debate. Uh, is significant because were you to grant planning permission for a new dwelling in the countryside, you would quite possibly see a lot of applications coming in where somebody has a farmstead with, for example, say 20 or more acres and, and then have a justifiable precedent here for building another new building in the countryside. And I put it to all of you. I was on the planning committee for eight years. Every single time we met as a committee, we were told about the importance of retaining the AOMB. Most of you sitting around the table today, especially those who represent rural wards, are well aware, and most of you put it in your election addresses, ladies and gentlemen, a pledge of protecting the AOMB. 
if you allow this to go forward and you support this proposal, you are not protecting the AOMB. It is as simple as that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your views. Um, I now have Councillor Barnes. Barnes, thank you very much, Chair. Um, right, so if you look at page 59, 8217, um, the NPPF has removed the innovative section of the, what would be uh, allowed on this proposal. And purely left is outstanding. In my opinion, this is not outstanding. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the, um, uh, the criteria that uh, buildings in the vicinity of a, of a listed building should be sympathetic to those buildings. We've all got so carried away by carbon neutral. So let's take it that that's the innovative side of it. But that is not all. This is a building that the, <clears throat> that, the, that the parish has got to live with. It is, frankly, when you look at it, ugly. I'm sorry, I'll say that absolutely straightforwardly. It's ugly. It doesn't fit in its surroundings. You're all quite right. It's absolutely wonderful as a prototype for what is going to uh, hopefully be the houses of the future. But what we are doing is, is absolutely riding roughshod over our own policies. Our own policies are, first and foremost, that we look at every, at every case as, that it fits into the policy that it, it, it's there to protect. So we have, we're looking at something which we don't have a policy to actually deal with. So can't can't just Barnes, wait. could I quickly interrupt you because it's, what Councillor Mir said earlier was exactly right, is that policy 80... I'm sorry, Chair, but you and I are not having an argument about this at this moment. Uh, let me make my, my points and then you'll feel perfectly free to come in with yours. Right at this moment, I feel very worried. I feel that we are actually not discharging our duties as councillors. We are not looking after the AOMB. And what we have, have furthermore is... Uh, an applicant who is known to us all, and we are all being very careful not to cause offence. That is my feeling. Oh. We are bound, as councillors, to protect the AOMB and to listen to what our planning officers are telling us will be acceptable. This has not been deemed as acceptable. Thank you. What I did want to point out, that the whole policy we're resting on is actually how you build something in the AOMB. So that was, I, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, right, I've got Councillor Gamley next. Chairman, uh, of course I agree with the officer who told us that it was okay to read out from prepared notes. Um, what is not okay is to read out from prepared notes that state I categorically support this application because those notes were written before the planning meeting and before hearing all the arguments for and against. That is predetermination. I applaud the fact that this application will supply free energy to the national grid. That's to be applauded. But it could be achieved by putting a few solar panels in the field instead of a uh, new dwelling in the countryside, in the AONB, outside the boundary, and outside the Saddlescombe neighbourhood plan. Thank you. Councillor Gordon. Yes, uh, I pledge to protect the AONB to my constituents, and uh, I think the house is a very nice house. It does fit all the uh, you know, carbon neutral boxes, but it's an area of AONB, and I don't think it actually qualifies for Section 80, if you don't mind me saying. And also, I call upon for the, uh, you know, the uh, recorded vote quite simply because it is a fellow councillor and I'm new to, you know, planning committee. And for that reason, I ask for a recorded vote. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a useful explanation. Thank you. Um, I've got councillor Mia. Uh, Chair, um, councillor Mary Barnes has said that the building is ugly and she is perfectly entitled to form that view. Um, it's what, what, what we're here to consider, and opinions can vary on that. 
Um, and that would be a material consideration, I'm quite sure, in the AONB. However, what we do have is the support of the AONB planning unit, which does not come to that conclusion. It does not come to the conclusion that there is harm to the AONB. Um, and, and that is respected advice, which, which is being given to us. The we have not been given that advice. I haven't seen this report. Thank you. Can I just clarify something over these AOM, AOMB unit comments? Um, within the update you were sent uh, Tuesday evening, um, the first paragraph um, of office comments, my comments, it did explain this issue. Paragraph 80E is two. There are a number of criteria you have to meet. It's set out in two bullet points. So the first, it says it has to be truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture and would help raise standards of design more generally in rural areas. Yeah, my reading of the AOMB unit's comments, um, they, they didn't want to comment on the architectural merits of the proposal. It really was about, it was really to do with the second bullet point, would it significantly enhance its immediate setting and be, and, and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. Their, their comments were focused um, on that and, yeah, the sighting of it, the landscape impact. So they were, they were very positive about taking out non-native trees, putting in native trees um, and the biodiversity improvements. Um, and they also commented specifically on these architectural um, grade recycled materials, which they said were appropriate, right colours in line with the um, AOMB high wheel design guide. Um, so, yes, they're supportive of the second bullet point, but your, your consideration on paragraph 80E, it has to be, as a whole, everything has to be truly outstanding. So the live-work unit, inside and out, the landscaping, including earthworks, the driveway, opening up, um, as well as the, po the positive things, biodiversity improvements, um, the new native species. So I just, it's really important that this is considered as a whole, each individual element of it being outstanding. Councillor Mayor, you wanted to come back. And, and to come back, it, it was uh, something that Councillor Barnes said was that we had an officer recommendation and that we should follow it. I think Councillor Mary Barnes came very close to saying that we should delegate our decision to officers, to hand, hand over our decision-making powers to officers. And I think that's a very dangerous thing indeed. We, we should, of course, respect officers who have the proper qualifications and training but we are the decision-making body, and that's for some reason, and we have to exercise our independent judgment and take all the factors into account. Thank you, that's useful. Uh, Councillor Errington. Thank you. Just, just to say that two years ago, we, well, a, a Wunder House was delegated to an officer to make the decision, and it wasn't called in. So at that time, two years ago, we were perfectly happy for a, a delegated decision to be made about a wonder house being built in the ANOB. So that's one thing. The second thing is I am concerned that we are going to continue to build houses like this, but this is only the second one to come up in two years. And perhaps to, to counterbalance that and some of my concerns, could we have a condition to say, if this goes ahead, could it not be extended? Because it's two bedrooms at the moment, and I can see it being lovely and the guy who lives there meets somebody, they want to have a family, and it gets extended, or, and or, could we have a condition that says that is the only property on that plot, because it is, as we've been told, quite a small footprint on a beautiful plot. So would that help address some of the concerns that the residents have? And yes, it's on the A on a B, but, but it's in a huge, huge plot, plus all the biodiversity stuff. Would that 
mitigate some of those concerns, those two conditions. Just to say that a few concerns came up at the, on the planning visit, like it couldn't be holiday cottage, uh, etc. So I think we would have to delegate, if, if it won the vote of approval, um, we'd have to delegate it to officers for conditions. Yeah, on the conditions, um, you, you can remove permitted development rights by condition. So that could be extensions to the house, outbuildings, um, hard surfacing, yeah. all, all sorts. So it, it could be, you could choose certain elements or... Yeah, yeah. Um, on your first point, the um, prototype in Powder Mill Lane, that was granted permission um, on a different policy justification. It was granted as a one-to-one -one replacement, which core strategy RA3 um, allows if it has a similar landscape impact. So it was, it was different. Councillor Curtis. You didn't have your hand up. Oh, sure you did. Sorry. I'm going to draw it to a close. I've got Councillor Drayson, no? Council, Councillor Langan, you're going to have the last word. Well, it, it was just lit, ri literally to come back on my notes, because I was a little bit offended by that. Um, I didn't read my notes but all as they were written, I picked out bits and I added on that I was <coughs> um, fully in support of it. it. Having heard, there was no predetermination at all, I can assure you. If a councillor has concerns, if this is not the place to discuss them. No. Well, we've had a good debate. We can't say anything more than that. We've got on the floor approval. Um, and we've also got a roll call. Are you ready for the roll call? The reasons for approval, I would suggest, I, I don't know, it seemed suggestion was what um, Councillor Gray had written down. I haven't seen, I haven't seen what you've written down, Councillor. Right, I've got the explanation of how, why, if it does go through, um, of, of how we would word it uh, from our officer. If you Sorry, I hope it doesn't sound arrogant. This is the second time I speak. Um, I, I think what, what we, 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 we've all wrestled with is the word exceptional. And, and it's, it, the, the, the remit is with you to determine what that word actually means. And in light of the fact that this could set precedent, and that other schemes will come forward to use that same word. I think your wording that you had there, Councillor Bray, of, of actually that you agree to approve this on the basis it is exceptional under the following conditions of defining what you mean exceptional gives us all that very clear definition in the future, not just on this application. But that's just a comment. I, I have no further um, remit in terms of making the decision. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really useful. Um, so we'll have a, a roll call of voting. You vote on the table is in favour of the application, for the application, uh, and you just say for or against. Okay. Can I, before we take that vote, perhaps explain my position or, or how I'm going to vote after this long debate? I wasn't sure at all before the debate. I wasn't sure. But it seems to me, very shortly, I certainly won't repeat all the things we've heard this morning, but in, in, this, in this application, we have the application itself. Then we have another player in this drama, is the AOMB. And we're all absolutely, totally committed to the protection in law of the AOMB. Then we have our policies, and here we have an exceptional policy, which is what we've been debating on. Is it good enough to say yes to? And then, of course, we have the planet. 
And I'm voting with the planet, just to be clear. Okay, Julie. Okay, members, I'll call your names out in alphabetical order. I need you to say for, against, or abstain. Don't forget two microphones. So, Councillor Mrs Barnes. Against. Councillor, Cur uh, Councillor Byrne. For. Councillor Curtis. For. Councillor Drayson. For. Councillor Errington. For. Councillor Ganley. Against. Councillor Gordon. Against. Councillor Gray. For. Councillor Langlands. For. Councillor Maidley. For. Councillor Mia. For. Councillor Norton. For. Councillor Prochak. For. And Councillor Stevens. Against. Ten four, so that is carried. You can still stay here if you like, but we're going to have a lunch break. 40 minutes. Councillor Drayson can be the, the police. Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session. Um, thank you for being promptly back. Right, the next application after the morning session is the... Um, it's 10, isn't it? We're on 10. Yeah, agenda item 10, page 69. Miles, did you want to speak? Yes, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just regarding the last application, um, there wasn't clear on the reasons for granting permission. And I have to just clarify, it was a resolution to grant, because it would be required a section 106 contribution for the affordable housing, you know, in lieu of provision of affordable housing, given the site was more than 0 0.2 hectares, and also obviously delegate down to officers the decisions, the conditions, excuse me, worded conditions attached to that grant and any permission. Thank you. That's what I understood, Miles, yeah, that they were delegated. Matt. I'm not sure that point was specifically discussed about. Affordable. Well, affordable definitely wasn't. The conditions, um, I mean, yeah, if, if it's delegated to officers, then it can be in line with consultee responses and things. Um, if there was anything specific, it would probably be good to have a steer on that. But, yeah, we need to decide what, what, what's happening with the affordable. Okay, Miles. Uh, it's okay. What was the reason for granting permission? That wasn't clear to me. I may have missed it, but it didn't seem clear to me what the reason was for granting. It was based on the explanation that the officer gave of exceptional and that we felt it was exceptional. Right, that was the sole reason. Paragraph 80. Yeah, 80E. Right, okay. Yeah, thank you. Can I just say, I hope you define exceptional very tightly and in detail, because as a rural member, I'm very worried about the impact on my seat. Thank you. <laughs> with, with the conditions about the building itself not to be extended or yeah, another yeah. building, but maybe a small shed or something, but no major yeah. extension or replica building in the corner. We did discuss that. And... So, yeah, so, so remove all PD permitted yeah. development rights. Yeah, yeah, that can be done. Right, agenda item 10, members, which is uh, RR 2022-219P, Glebelands, Potmans Lane. And we do have a speaker 
No, sorry, it's your Matt, it's you. Yeah. Right, this site is in Catsfield. It's Glebelands to the south side of Potman's Lane. Um, it's, a, it's around 0.3 kilometres from the village of Catsfield. <laughs> the land ownership, um, you can see on this plan, um, is... The area outlined in red and blue, um, that totals around three and a half hectares. Um, to the northwest corner of the site, you've got um, what is a stable style building um, used for agricultural purposes. That was granted in 2015. Um, the, um, the applicant, well, I believe the applicant's here today, so they will probably explain a bit more about what they do on, on the site. Um, but, yeah, essentially back in 2015 when we granted permission, it was um, a very small-scale holding, three, yeah, like I said, three and a half hectares, um, kept a small number of um, animals on the site, um, grew, and grew some vegetables and plants and things. Um, some of the animals they keep, they, um, they um, yeah, goat, I think in the, um, sorry, in the report it lists um, the type of animals that are kept there. <clears throat> um, and, yeah, when they, they um, take use the wool from the animals to make um, clothes and things like that. Um, the proposal is to convert the about two-thirds of the, um, the stable block into a live-work unit. Um, around six years ago, they um, converted the northern wing to residential accommodation without um, permission. That was subject to a lawful development certificate um, last year, which was refused, and this, this application essentially follows on from that um, to seek permission for a live-work unit. Um, within this proposal, there would be a small extension within the courtyard area, um, and also they would change um, the use of some of the previous agricultural storage rooms to um, the sort of the working areas, so the dyeing of the wool, um, processing and storing of that, that material. Um, the site is located within, within the countryside. It's not within the AOMB, um, but um, being in the countryside... Um, for a new dwelling to be allowed here, it does have to meet one of our exceptions in policy RA3. Um, in this case, um, they're, they're trying to justify it under policy RA3 part A, so it's essential for um, a rural worker to live on the site. Um, given the size of the holding and the the business plan produced is projected income for the next year. Um, we're not, as officers, we're not satisfied that that test has been met. Um, the, um, the business plan shows that nearly half of the income com comes from renting out caravans on the east part of the site. Um, only about half comes from the agricultural activities there. During the application, we received a revised business plan, um, which increased the predicted profits. Um, and we don't, we don't know. They're predicted. So um, we, whether they're going to be accurate or not, um, it's, it's hard to tell. 
<coughs> all we can say is it is a small land holding. There aren't many animals kept on the site, and it's um, it, from an officer point of view, it's hard to see how that functional need of um, a rural worker, why they need to live on the site. Um, so we're not, we don't think the functional need has been proved, um, nor that the business operations are financially sound or remain, um, will remain so. Um, policy RA3 also um, usually requires dwellings in the countryside for um, farming activities to be approved temporarily for the first three years. After that time, you review it again, um, and only if it's established and has a clear prospect of doing so would you, um, would you allow it permanently. Um, other policy tests are that um, there aren't any other houses nearby that are suitable um, and that the residential use has an acceptable impact on the landscape um, character of the area, in this case a rural, rural location. Um, there are three reasons for refusal, um, which explain the um, agricultural need for a house on the site hasn't been justified. Um, we're also in an unsustainable location here. Um, no, no footpaths or link, direct links to um, the village of Catsfield. Um, no access to sustainable modes of transport, so you're going to be car reliant here. Um, and also we've got... <coughs> Um, concerns over the impact of the proposal on the, well, domesticating the countryside, um, basically. Not, not the building itself, because that is existing. It's these sorts of, uh, any external uses in connection with the residential use we've, we've got concerns with. Um, like I said, recommendation is to refuse. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, just to mention, I hope, and Councillor Drayson in particular, You've got the extra information that was circulated about this. Thank you. There are a few more slides, actually. Um, okay, sorry. Sorry. There are, it's only one of the aerial shot and then um, a plan of, um, plan of the building. Um, so, yeah, northwest corner of the site. Um, you can see on the aerial photography that um, there's a U-shaped... That's where the on stable building is um, where the dwelling is um, and then the fields to the south um, <coughs> bounded by that sort of V-shaped tree line um, is the, the applicant's ownership <coughs> um, this plan shows the yeah, existing and proposed elevations so um, the small extension inside the court, courtyard area just really link, would link the um, existing residential use um, in with each other. Uh, essentially, it was a stable block that had each room had an external door within the courtyard. They created a um, porch-style entrance um, for the northern part of the... Um, the accommodation, but yeah, they're now proposing to continue this down so that um, you don't have to walk outside to get from room to room. That's it. Thank you, that's it. So may I now introduce the um, applicant, uh, Gary, Gary Morris? <coughs> Gary, if you could come forward. I think you were here this morning, so you probably know what you're supposed to do. As soon as you switch, switch on your microphone, we'll start timing you. And you have five minutes, as you know. I would like to thank the members for the opportunity to present the proposal to committee. 
We feel there has been a considerable misunderstanding in the officer's consideration of what we are proposing. In this summary of this report, the planning officer considers that the holding is small and there is no need for an on-site present and that the business is not viable. We note the Council's Royal Estates consultants has made no comment on the justification of the business and that the conclusion reached is based on the officer's considerations. In addition to the officer's negative conclusions on the viability of the business, in terms of income, it remains the case that the site requires an on-site presence for security and animal welfare. We have a number of rare breeds on site. With a lot of our equipment on site, we need to ensure it's not stolen. Members will be aware that Glebens incorporates the keeping of livestock, which enables the production of fibre to be manufactured into yarn for knitted garments. To ensure that the process remains organic and inherently sustainable, the yarn is dyed using plants grown within the holding. This is a small holding which seeks to create a commercial fireball enterprise into the future with the production of fibres from the resources on site. In terms of livestock, the officer refers to the number currently on site, but we do not feel he has considered the value attached to the livestock and the sub sub subsequent production of fibre. The number of animals may not compare to larger farming enterprises where numbers dictate income, but this holding differs as the resulting income from the process we undertake and the end product is substantially different to that of a normal livestock herd sold for meat. We feel the officer has certainly not taken this into consideration. In addition to the obvious unfriendly conclusions on the viability of the business, it remains the case that the site requires an on-site presence for security. The officer refers to the caravan licence, which has been at the site well in excess of 20 years and prior to our purchase and that it cannot be included in the income associated with the holding. We ask the members to consider that this view does not appear to be in accordance with the current emphasis from the central government with regard to helping farmers diversify their holdings. The right diversification activity for your farm will inevitably depend on the existing resources you have and camping caravan is seen as a viable option. To discount this because it doesn't occur, accord with an earlier policy which is now out of date, with current government thinking, seems somewhat short-sighted to us. In addition, members will be aware that Policy RA2 of the 2019 plan sets out the overarching strategy for the countryside, which is to support rural businesses and strictly limit new development to which supports local agricultural, economic or tourist needs and maintains or improves rural character. We consider our current holdings certainly complies with the spirit of this policy. We also believe that lift work opportunities can bring business back into rural areas, which in turn will improve the vitality and viability of local shops and services. Consequently, the introduction of lift work into rural areas can help reverse the decline of local services to the benefit of the wider community. As we submitted with this scheme, our intent is to further invest in the holding to enable investment for additional livestock and equipment. We have owned and managed small holdings for more than 30 years and feel confident we can achieve our goal. In addition, we are content to accept an agricultural occupancy, occupancy condition tying the property to the land or even a temporary permission if this will make members consider the scheme favourably. The scheme proposes a small one bedroom unit set within the existing buildings on site. We are not asking for a new build. The officer ref references no external amenity space. As the residential element would be tied to the holding, we are not seeking to create a separate curtilage. This is in line with many other agricultural occupancy dwellings with all holdings. The fact it is a conversion rather than a new build. As alluded to above, we are not seeking to create a new build dwelling, but utilise the existing built we have on site. This was an intentional to ensure that we have no greater impact on the character of the landscape. Aso apart, aside from a small extension enclosing the existing walkway, there will be no greater impact on the surrounding landscape, and this was not noted by the officer in his reports. No overlooking or loss of privacy due to the distance to neighbours and existing boundary planting. We are also aware that increasing biodiversity is a key consideration for councils. In this regard, the number of fairy plants we grow for the dying process provide a significant increase in species-rich planting, which we hope will be recognised by members in their consideration of the scheme. We understand from our planning consultant that the 
Site is not in an AOMB. The tilted balance applies as the Council cannot demonstrate a five-year house in land supply. We also note that this proposal would not set a precedent along Poppers Lane, as there have been a number of dwellings allowed in recent years in holdings close to our sites. Mr Morris, you've reached your time. Oh, OK. There was only one line left anyway. Oh, go do the one line. <laughs> oh, one and a half. Therefore, we hope members will view the scheme of our proposal in a reasonable manner and through what we are trying to achieve positively. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Oh, of course, no. I was Thank just you trying to escape. <laughs> members, questions? You've obviously done the job really well. Nobody's no? got any questions. Oh, yes, Councillor Langland. Hello, that was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> one question. Uh, do you use that your facility in an educational way at all? Yes, we do. We've uh, recently approached local schools and we're going to be doing educational school tours with the variety of rare breeds we have and also showing them um, how we plant the, the, the planting of the process of the flowers, going right through the dyeing process and the spinning. It's all, it's all hand spun, hand dyed. We're going to do edu educa educational tours for that reason. And, yeah. Yes. A real country craft, by the sounds of it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and also hands on. Yeah. Um, getting children hands on with planting. So, how are your animals actually cared for at the moment? How, if you if you aren't able to be on site, how do you ensure their safety and security? Well, the thing is, with our animals, they're not like um, ordinary agricultural animals. The, the, the alpacas we keep are, are, are actually um, um, the alpacas and the angora goats are um, after the night. What are they? Um, more domestic? No, not the non-domestic. Okay. Um, yes, anyway, they, 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 do, they do take a lot of um, care and looking after. We have to be there an awful lot. Um, we'll start a breeding, breeding programme again shortly, hopefully, and um, we have to be there on site. When, because they breed on, on hoof, you don't breed them like lambs and all have them all in the same time. They breed during the year. So we'll have animals on hoof at various times of the year, which we need to be there for them. But obviously we have to feed them in the morning, look after them. In this heat just lately, I'll spend hours just getting water to them all the time. Um, top the grass for the mowing, keep the fields. We've created about four acres of hay fields now where we get a lot of our plants from, from dying. But also it brings in a lot more animals and it's much better for biodiversity. Councillor Arrington and then Councillor Byrne. Thank you. I don't know if this is for Mr. Morris or, or for, for Try. Matthew. Um, I think he mentioned it, and I've put it down on my notes. The Rural Estate Surveyor, would they normally look at the business plan? Um, because the bus I, there was reference to, to it somewhere in the papers, but I couldn't find any stats. And then the stats came in at the last minute as, as a business plan. Um, but the educational thing isn't mentioned in here as well. So I was wondering... Did it come in too late to go through the rural estate surveyor? That, that was one of the questions. We can deal with that when we get to the uh, committee bit. And just, I won't forget it. Any other questions, Councillor Byrne? No. no? Well, I think, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Morris. Okay. Uh, the word I was wondering was exotic. Our animals are exotic. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Now, uh, Councillor Curtis called this in. Um, do you want to have your say? Thank you, Chair. Um, well, quite a, um, a good resume from the applicant. I think it explained most of it. I'll go through my list and then if I miss anything else. Obviously, um, the emphasis is on uh, agricultural and rural crafts. It's, it's not a garage. They're not, made, they're not seeking to put an extension on or a, a builder, you know, something which, as we all fear, sometimes could then be extended into the countryside, etc. Um, it's got off-road, plenty of off-road parking, and the entrance is um, fully within um, highways guidelines where it's got wide space because it does share an entrance with um, the site next door. So there's, uh, there's no issue with transport or, or traffic. Um, you talk about sustainability. Um, for anybody that lives in the country, it's always a difficult one because 
Um, we'd all like to have a bus in Potman's Lane, or um, unfortunately it doesn't happen. There are limited bus services in Catsfield, which is um, sustainably accessible. You can get there, you know, it's a 15-minute walk into the village, to the post office, the pub, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, the unfortunate thing is, and, and I defy anyone to tell me differently, anyone that lives in the country use their cars. At the moment, um, they haven't got access to um, electric points and any other form of sustainable power that they would probably use if it was available. So uh, I try not to use the use of the car as, a, as an enemy. It's, it's a necessity. Um, employment opportunities. Obviously, I mean, if I can... Um, the talk, obviously, this is all... Some of the um, um, ideas are subject to what happens here today, um, understandably so. It would, I mean, bearing in mind that they're um, valued members of the community. They've been in the village a long time. They are a, a, an asset and they contribute to our economy and our education, if you like, with all the things that are going on with the school. Um, but, you know, they talk about um, there are employment opportunities. They would like to take somebody on if they could. It's, but, of course, for anyone that runs a business, there are certain things sometimes that you, you have to hold back and think, well, if that comes, you know. But um, they've got a viable caravan site next door which supplies income. So they're not, they're not dependent. We're, we're not paying for them. They're not claiming benefits or um, they're actually paying council tax, rather as designated, I was actually charging council tax on a residential property, so I'm, I'm actually a bit confused at that sometimes. And they are paying the council tax. Um, so we dealt with the opportunities. Um, security. Now, they talk about security. Well, I'm sure you all understand, and as the applicant has already outlined, that um, with animals, especially um, exotic animals, as he put it, um, animals of any kind, we've got animals. You have to look after them. They take time. And it's not, um, you, you can't set it down to a calendar sometimes. Um, security is paramount, and especially with um, the equipment and, uh, and what they've got. It's a it, it is a shame, Chairman, that we weren't able to visit this on um, Tuesday, because it's beautiful. It's, now, I understand that beauty is not necessarily, a pl you know, well, we should give it plenty, and I understand all of that. It's beautiful. It actually enhances the local community. There are other properties in the lane of a similar ilk. So it's not even, it makes no, there is no issue to anybody. There were um, 12 letters of um, support and three in objection. So that in itself tells you, especially in such a close community. Um, now, secure, I'll come back to security. So. It's obviously worrying, and there have been issues before. They have had issues, and where, the, where this is mostly important. Now, uh, I noticed that not too much um, sway has been made on this in the officer's report. But if I can just show you um, the Sussex Police um, monthly report for um, June, which gives you 15 or 16, 17 issues of crime in our area. Okay, it's across the district. And then for this month, it's already... Rural crime is on the increase, unfortunately. So it is important, and hence why, if they could, they'd like to be there, and then that would probably answer a lot of issues. Um, other properties in the lane. We spoke about the Kirklidge. Um Without... Um, that, I'm not seeing, but you know the applicants are becoming senior in years. Um, they, they support themselves, um, and I think if we were able to um, assist them in their endeavours, it takes another person off of our housing list, if you like. Which ordinarily, if they weren't there, they could be somewhere else. It's all. I know it's all sort of. Um, don't all reach your hankies just yet, but um, I think. I've covered everything. If there's anybody who's got any questions, I'm quite happy to. Let me just have a quick look at my... Um, and the living work unit, that's another one we've spoken about today and on other occasions. You know, it's 
sustainable, if they're on site, they, you know, and this opportunity and stuff for the local community, which in Catsfield is most important. And it's, they are an asset rather than there's no issues whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you for that. And you can always come back in again. Um, can I just address the estates, um, the rural estate survey that you, you picked up on Councillor Ington? Yeah, OK. The, um, the revised business plan was only received over the weekend, so or four days ago. So um, we haven't been able to consult the Royal Estate Surveyor on that. Uh, the original business plan, because it was it said there would be less generated and we didn't, uh, we, we as officers didn't feel it uh, um, proved that it was... Um, a financially viable business. Um, we didn't. We didn't consult them to start off with. Um, but yeah, I think yeah. Usually, to justify an agricultural dwelling, we would um, we would get support from the rural estate survey. Could I, from the chair, then make a suggestion? And it'll be up to to the council. Curtis is is uh, agreeable with that. I mean, there's obviously new information. That officers haven't had time to, to um, include in the report. Um, would it still be an opportunity if we deferred it for a site visit and to actually get the Royal Estate Surveyor? That, that would be okay from my point of view. Um, I just wanted to draw your attention towards the update that did sort of, it did summarise the revised business plan. Um, and yeah, shorter short assessment without without the benefit of the rural estate surveyors' comments. But um, it was officers' opinion that the reasons for refusal stood. What, was it a um, an improved picture? Was it sort of more information that you needed? Would it be well, safe they, to say they, they were saying that it was going to be more profitable? Well, if I may, chair, um, as I alluded to earlier on. Um, Running a business is always, a, in any instance, is a tricky affair. If we could all, apart from the um, utility companies, where we can all, we're balance sheet um, executives, where you can say, well, we're guaranteed this income, we're guaranteed that profit. In the real world, it doesn't happen. I think possibly for members um, that if they understand that they are efficient, the business is very busy, they are keep, you know, so obviously the business is profitable. And I think... In the current climate, I would say I would suggest that that is um, suffice to to say that there's nothing underhand and and uh, it's paying for itself. So, if you're happy with that, chair, well, your your knowledge is invaluable. Uh, Miles, you want to come in? Yeah. Thanks very much, chair. Um, I just wanted uh, members to consider the committee to consider their three reasons for refusal and whether they want to discuss that further before they decide on deferral or consider deferral further. Thank you. Members, it's on page 78. Councillor Curtis, I think we'll be led by you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on the... What's this on the balance, the balance and conclusion? No. no the reasons, for reasons for refusal. Okay. No, deferral. 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 Um, yes, I think, okay. If you, if I, yeah, let's defer it and then we can get the evidence. You, we can all go and look. And then there's, there's a fair um, picture then. I'll move. I uh, move. Uh, um, I presume refer. the applicant would be in favour of that. Have you got a seconder for that? Right. Those in favour? Any against? Oh, one abstention. So it is deferred then.
Okay, that's that's our, our 2022 1219P Pepperpot Barn, Carrick's Hill. Is that you? Uh, Michael. And where is Michael? Oh, there, yep. he is. there he is. It's been presented virtually by Michael Vladino. Yeah. Good. Over to you. No problem. Just bring up the PowerPoint now. Um, you mind if I request control, Matt, whenever you start it? Sorry, Michael. Um, if you just say next slide when you want it to move, okay. I can I can control that. Thanks. Yep. No, that's no problem. Um, so this next application is for the change of use of a B1 commercial unit to a mixed use live slash work unit, along with a single story rear extension. And this application is being called on the committee um, due to previous history with the site. Um, so just to make uh, members aware um, the previous refusal at the site um, should have been presented before committee, uh, but it was instead refused under delegate of powers and error. Um, so it's been brought forward due to that. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. As you can see, this is a site location plan. and um, So the site will be accessed um, off Cracks Hill um, to the north. Um, the site itself is outside of any uh, defined development boundary um, and in the countryside for planning purposes. Uh, the village of Darlington um, is 0.7 kilometres away um, and has a few facilities that are relevant to the day-to-day -day life um, and also the school. Um, as you can see from that site location plan, there is some sparse development located in close proximity. Um, but the majority of it is a scratching development. Um, just to give a bit of context, the previous application um, was for the same development um, and it was refused due to the site being an unsustainable location and detrimental impact on the character and appearance of the AOMB due to the um, extension and change in external materials. Next slide, please, Mark. So I'm not, I don't think the committee was able to visit this site on Tuesday, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the um, applicant has provided um, a couple of very good photograph um, images of the site. Um, so the next four slides um, will show you these four different areas. So the orange area, yellow area, and red area. And the orange and yellow showing the approach to the site, um, and the red and blue um Areas showing you uh, the site itself. Next slide, please, Matt. This is the access to the site, and um, so as you can see, it'll utilise an existing access. And um, as you can see, there is some built development um, at the access in the form of care home um, and some residential properties. And um, next slide. Uh, this is further on up the track. Um, so as you can see, once you get past the um, residential development, the character um, is very much uh, rural. Um, as you can see, with the various barns and stables um, seen in the photographs. Uh, next slide, please. This is just um, just before you um, enter the site. Um, so the immediate sort of just to the south, this would be the immediate character um, of the site. So, uh, yeah. As you can see again, um, very much used in, in agricultural purposes um, for the keeping and maintenance of horses. And then the next slide should give you an overview of the site. So that's what's currently on the site, um, as you can see. Um, so the site forms part of a relatively small field, um, which currently contains um, the existing building. Um, this building was permitted by application RR2020 333 P um, and it has approval for a commercial use. Um, just to give everyone a, um, an overview of the scale, 
And um, so this bed, this building would measure 15 meters by seven meters, um, and has a ridge height of 3.6 meters, um, and has a green metal cladding to tell elevation. So very typical of a of a agricultural building that is usually seen um, for the OMB. Um, and yeah, just to give an overview of the the site itself. So the field in which the building is located is surrounded by mature trees and hedgerow. Um, which are identified as historic field boundaries, and the site itself forms part of the patchwork of irregular shaped fields and pockets of woodland. And the site is it is visible from um, the adjacent public footpaths, uh, which run sort of to the east and to the west um, of the site. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see, that's the current block plan of the site. Um, this is what the site uh, looks like at the minute. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. Uh, this is what's proposed. Um, so as you can see, uh, the area to the, the right-hand side um, is used for a commercial area, and that would um, contain 46.4 square metres. Um, and the majority um, on the left-hand side, but that would just be used for the residential purposes. Um, it's just, so if you can see um, sort of where the bathroom is, and that's sort of what the dashed outline is. That was that's sort of the extension, the rear extension um to the building. Um and just for um a bit of scale, uh, the proposed commercial element um is thirty four percent of the overall floor space and the residential element is sixty six percent. Uh next slide please. Um, this is the what's proposed, um, so as you can see, it's quite a deviation away from um, the existing building. Um, the roof and actual materials um, would be changed um, from metal cladding to zinc and vertical timber cladding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a um, proposed uh, perspective views of the site and just gives you an overview of what the site would um, look like um, when it's proposed. Um, it is considered that the, so there was two previous applications at the site and um, one was for the same development, uh, which was refused. And there was one before that in 2018 um, for the change of use of a, agricultural building to a residential property um, and that was refused and dismissed on appeal um, and uh, it's been considered that this application um, would not be acceptable um, as it would be contrary to policy RA3 um, as it would be in a unsustainable location and the change in the external appearance of the building um, from domestic uh, from the Italian to domestic um, would harm the character and appearance of the um, high wheeled area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, that should be all for that one. I don't think there's any more slides. Thank you, Michael. We may call you back in when we start the, the debate. But uh, before that, um, Councillor Wendy Myers, Chairman of Darlington Parish Council, Wendy. Apologies for that, uh, Chairman. And good afternoon to members and Chairman. I'm Wendy Myers, as, as our chairman said, chairman of Dallington Parish Council and uh, ex-member of this committee for 12 years. <laughs> um, I've not spoken before, so many apologies, but I am known for fighting for my village, which um, <laughs> is very precious to me and all of us in the village of Dallington. Um, I went first of all to see this as a site visit in 2018 and I always go to wherever we've got anything in the, in the village and it was a long, low building for sheep, for 
for um, um, cutting, for, you know, fleeces being cut and for lambing and so on and so on. And I thought at the time, with the experience I built up over that time, that that was quite possible to be used, this redundant um, farm building, that it was quite possible to use it for um, a house. But um, obviously, uh, rather didn't think so. So it eventually got permission for an industrial unit, which is what you could say the farm building, the farm building is. What concerned me very much when I looked through your your report and all um, is it Michael, the gentleman that's yes, that you said, he talks about um, that, that this is 0.7 kilometres from the village. Now, we are a tiny village. All of this is Dallington. I don't know what, what he means by the village. We have no boundaries. We never have done. It's always been a, um, a point, some contention or whatever. But we are small, and all of this is, is Dallington, as far as we're concerned. No boundaries. Um, Sustainability, well, and I quote again from the report, this village of Dallington has few facilities relevant to day-to-day -to -day life. <laughs> you know what I can say. There is a lane right opposite to where this, this property is, and you can walk, and we do walk in Dallington, you'd be amazed, it's not, it's not cars. The next door neighbour takes his little boy to to the primary school, up this little lane, and straight in front of you, you've got these, what does it say here? We have few facilities. The church is right in front of you, St Giles, where we have festivals and two services every week, plus, plus. Next door to that, we've got the village hall, where everything goes on from poetry readings to, oh, we've got a library in there as well, and people's yoga, elderly people's yoga. That's what I'm very busy during the Queen's Jubilee. That was a very active use of that. Um, what have I left? On oh, the school, and next to that, we've got the primary school, 100 children, and a lot of festivals and fetes and things go on there. I am really most hurt to hear that... Uh, we have um, very few facilities. I think for a little village like this, and walk a bit further along, and you can walk across the road. We've got a shop, which many villages haven't got, and we've got the Swan Pub. And even further, we've got a recreation ground. I think we do very well, and people really do walk there. They do not get in their cars to go that sort of distance. It just isn't, isn't practical. Um, I see that on 8.42 in your, in your report, you talk about employment opportunities. Um, the gentleman who's asking for this permission is a carpenter and is much used by the village. Um, and you don't know, his business might well grow, he might have an apprentice, there, might, there certainly is employment opportunities there for living and, and working. Um, I think I'm very out of date now, but we were actually in my time promoting work living um, facilities and I actually went round last night and um, went over to Ticehurst where um, was one of our sites which um, is, well anyway, one of the sites um, that we tried promoting and at that time it was very, very difficult were commented on and were, were talked about having no street lighting. Now, please tell me what little bit, small villages have street lighting. Wendy, th Wendy, I'm going to interrupt you because right. you've run out okay, of time. Okay, okay. Well, I hope you will rethink um, and approve this application, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> don't, don't leave yet. We might have questions. Questions. Okay. Questions, members? Uh, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Myers, despite the similarity of our names, we're not related. I thought I should make that clear. Don't um, tell them. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I'm just uh, intrigued. Uh, under what policy provision um, are you suggesting that we could permit this particular development? 
Do you mean the employment or, or anything? Well, anything. It was the, it, the employment, I said, was under TR3, opportunities, employment opportunities, which I thought was, was possible. Um, it had been uh, an agricultural building, as I say. I, I really was most surprised when there was a problem about it at all at the very beginning. And, of course, obviously, we stick with it once we've made a decision. But um, definitely it was an agricultural building in bad repair that um, has changed. By the way, the pictures that we've seen, it really is very green now and nothing like the sort of working site it looks like on our, on our <coughs> screens. Um, very any, nice. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Councillor Errington. Thank you. I'm, I'm just a bit confused about the nature of the business. I think we, we, did we see in the picture we saw an office? Or is that the pre uh, And then is, is it a workshop or is it... If he's a carpenter, will the work be done on site? Will the customers be coming to him or will he be going out to customers? Councillor Errington, we've got the applicant to speak. I was going to say, I don't really feel quality. No, I could say what I, I think, sorry, Wendy, which is I'll that he, work, he is a working in there, yeah. but I think he ought to answer yes, thank that, you, sorry. if you don't mind. Thank you, Wendy. Right. Thank you for coming along and speaking. Thank you and very much. And we've got the applicant, who is Nick, Nick Harding. Harding, yes. yes. I don't know what I've done there. Right. Nick, it's already switched on, but our officer will take note of when you begin, and you've got five minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nick Harding, and I'm the owner and applicant of this application at Pepperpot Barn in Darlington. I'd like to start by thanking you all for your time today. I really appreciate it. I hope you've all had the opportunity to look at the images we provided for you at short notice following the, the decision to cancel the site visit on Tuesday. That's what you saw on the screen just now. Um, before moving on to the application itself, I'd like to give a brief summary of my personal connection to the site and the village, some of which has been covered in my previous uh, personal statement within the application document, so I'll try not to repeat myself too much. My family moved to Darlington in 1987 and are still there today. I attended Darlington School uh, and spent much of my childhood on my grandparents' farm in Darlington. Fast forward to recent times, I now have my carpentry business based at Pepperpot Barn. I'm also a member of Darlington Parish Council, which I hope after nearly three years in post, local residents will agree I'm firmly a part of the community. With regards to the application itself, I'm sure that you've all seen this as a resubmission of the exact same scheme uh, that we submitted in January of this year. Following the handling of this application, we submitted a formal complaint for maladministration and not following due process. Development manager Miles Joyce deemed it acceptable for, for a site visit not to take place and a decision was made using outdated Google Earth images. To say that I'm here today without a site visit taking place from either the officer or the planning committee is an understatement. Our complaint was upheld, as you can see in the application documents. It's worth noting that we received an overwhelming amount of support from local residents uh, on this application, including the parish council who represent the wider community. No comments or objections were received from Highways or the AOMB team, which suggests they have no concerns regarding this application. I'd like to draw attention to point two of the officer's reasons to refuse. Paragraph 104 of the MPPF seeks to support the transition to a low-carbon future. The word transition to me means change. I think we can all agree that change does need to happen, especially from a climate perspective, given the weather we've seen in recent days and weeks. I believe a change is needed from the current narrative and outdated way of thinking. We need to look at the bigger picture. We firmly believe the bigger picture involves live-work units like this one, particularly in rural, rural areas, which do need help to thrive. I think the return of small-scale rural enterprises, along with low-carbon individual small holdings, farm shops, live-work units, etc., will happen, especially given the current ongoing cost-of-living crisis and potential for food shortages. Not only will this be great for rural economies, it will in turn reduce the need to travel to a town 
for a supermarket, therefore leading to less trucks on the road and less road miles on our everyday groceries, which of course will reduce our carbon footprint. Whilst I do agree uh, with the point on reliance on a vehicle to an extent, given the points I've just mentioned, along with the fact that I already drive to and from the site each day, I think this would be a short-sighted and inaccurate reason for refusing this sui generis live-work application. I think trips would in fact be reduced. I'd like to draw attention to the fact that the sale of petrol and diesel cars will be coming to an end in the not-too-distant future. In fact, we already have an all-electric vehicle in our household. Our scheme includes uh, plans for PV panels to generate our own electricity, battery stores, a large thermal tank, heat exchanger and EV charge points, along with high-efficiency insulation in the walls and roof. Moving on to the design of the building, we have chosen materials that are not only sympathetic uh, to, surround, to the surroundings, but commonly, commonly used in conservation areas, we believe the building will retain its utilitarian appearance. Uh, there are some example photos included in the plans to help give you an idea. Incorporating all of these elements into the building and our plans for additional fruit trees and other native trees, plus wildflower areas within the wider site, along with the inclusion of a workshop and commercial area, leads me to conclude that we do remain adamant that this scheme is environmentally friendly, sympathetic in appearance, and does form a part of the transition to a low carbon future. Ultimately, we want to work with you, not against you. So if there's any questions from members, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, questions? Yes, Councillor Ganley. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your presentation, Nick. You mentioned that you had um, uh, made a complaint against the, the process that was used and that process was upheld and we could see the uh, report in the papers. But I, 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 where would I, Do you know where I could find that report? Or uh, I, it was included in our application. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, it's in the, it, it was one of the additional information online. parts. Yeah, it is included there. Thank you. I'll get my assistant here to find it on <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Ganley, could you switch off? I beg your pardon, yes. Any other questions for, for Mr Harding? Any other questions? Can I, it's the same question as I asked the gentleman before, but knowing that you're a local person and you were brought up in the village and things, do you work with the local school? Because your craft is invaluable, and I'd love to think that that was being handed down to some of the children locally in your village. To be honest, I don't. It's not, well, not yet anyway. Hopefully, maybe one day in the future. Um, but currently, I, I don't. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Ingram. Hi, um, thank you. Can you just explain a bit about the nature of your business? Because I don't quite understand whether it's going to be carried out <coughs> on site or whether you go out to your customers. So I'm not quite sure whether traffic is going to be people coming down that lane to see you. It looked like a sort of shuttle has come on this, or whether you're just going to use it as a base. Um, so the intention is that it will be a workshop for me, so I will be effectively doing whatever I'm making in the workshop and travelling out to to a client's house to, I don't know, fit a wardrobe or kitchen or whatever, but predominantly it will be being made in, in the building. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Harding. And we've got Alex Maynard also to speak. Alex is on behalf of the agents. Welcome. Hi. Hello. I've got quite a lot to read, and I think I can fit it into the five minutes, so bear with me. So um, um, I'd like to thank the members for their time and the opportunity to present the, propo the proposal to committee. Members will be aware that this is resubmission of a previous scheme refused wrongly under delegated powers as confirmed by officers following a complaint made against the procedure. There are a number of conclusions reached by the planning officer which we wish to address. The officer's report concludes that the proposed submission would amount to the unjustified introduction of residential development in an unsustainable location and the proposed use would be 
harmful to the AOMB. We disagree with this and offer the following considerations. A significant consideration for the officer is the council's housing supply position. The presumption of sustainable development and then how the site's location removes it from the presumption, thus discounting the weight that should be attributed to the scheme in this regard. Members will be aware that the Council has a long-standing undersupply of housing. The proposal offers a rare opportunity to contribute both to housing supply and the rural economy, which offers significant benefits. We are therefore seeking a pragmatic approach from members instead of officers who provide little or no quantitative consideration of the benefits of this scheme in the planning balance. Design has been a factor of the officers' considerations. The officers' report considers that the change of appearance from utilitarian to domestic amounts do harm. Similarly, the increase in built form is viewed negatively and felt it would result in an urbanising impact in the countryside. The existing unit comprises of green metal cladding to its elevations and metal, metal clad to the roof hinge doors and roller shutters for access into the building. It offers little or no architectural merit and yet is a common type of built form in rural areas. Members will note that the materials proposed include vertical timber cladding and metal cladding on the roof and elevations. These materials can be found in many modern rural buildings and have been included to ensure the proposal remains utilitarian in its appearance. In its appearance. It should also be noted that the provision of fences, external lighting and domestic paraphernalia can be controlled through planning conditions. And further details of landscaping and parking can be secured, perhaps with screening measures. With those conditions imposed, the, the con conversion to a live-work sui generis use would retain a strong sense of a former rural character of the site. Accordingly, the occupation of the extended building need not result in harmful residential intensification at the site. In view of this, it's difficult to understand exactly what harm would befall the AOMB from this development. At no stage during the process were we contacted with any form of positive or proactive discussion, which we find surprising given the errors made on the handling of the previous application. If materials were an issue, they could have been amended. Similarly, if the patio or parking areas were problematic, they could have been removed. In terms of the use proposed, we consider a sui generis live work unit represents an effective and efficient use of the site. It provides an excellent, uh, exciting opportunity for the applicants that would not result in any unacceptable, unacceptable impact upon the prevailing character and appearance of the surrounding area. In addition, members will be aware that the policy RA2 of the 2019 plan sets out the overarching strategy for the countryside, which is to support rural businesses and strictly limit new development to that which support local agriculture, economic or tourist needs, and maintains uh, or improves rural character. We consider the current proposal certainly complies with this in the spirit of the policy. We also believe that live work opportunities can bring businesses back into rural areas, which in turn will improve the viability um, and vitality of local shops and services. Consequently, the introduction of live work into rural areas can help reverse the decline of local services to the benefit of the wider community. The second reason for refusal refers to the localisation sustainability as set out in the supporting statement. The applicant has made a number of trips daily to the unit to work. The proposal would see a reduction in trips as the requirement to travel from home to work is reduced. It is also relevant to note that uh, paragraph 85 of the MPPF states, planning policies and decisions should recognise that sites to meet local business and community needs in rural areas may be to be found adjacent or to beyond existing settlements and in locations that are not well served by public transport. Clearly, the continued business use at the site would continue to apply with this. In summary, we understand that the site is AOMB. The tilted balance does not apply irrespective that the council cannot demonstrate a five-year housing land supply. We also note that the officer's emphasis is outweighed against development in the countryside. However, we hope you give, that given the points raised and following the additional information provided, that members will agree that the proposal is an exciting and efficient use of the existing commercial site, which would bring substantial benefits and enhancements, and that there would be no harm to the wider character of the area. Thank you for your time. <laughs> You've just done it. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. And first of all, can I apologise to the speakers? For some reason, our cameras are not picking up the speakers. and it's, we're, we're fine in the chamber, but it's not so good for people watching. So apologies to, to people who watch it. I don't know if it can be corrected on the YouTube. Um, so that's an apology. Uh, uh, questions? Questions um, for Mr Maynard, isn't it? 
Councillor Curtis. Hello, Alex. Um, just moving on from your um, excellent description and in the time allowed as well, I understand. Um, can you give us any further um, information to the wider landscape and how you would be addressing, uh, addressing any potential improvements to biodiversity, please? I can, and I know we've, we've had lots about this today, actually. It's actually been quite interesting. So a quick bit of background as to who I am. So I'm the applicant's partner, so, um, and I'm also a project, project manager for Europe's largest conservation charity. So a bit of context, which I'm going to just quickly throw in. And I'm currently delivering a climate action project, which is delivering over 42 hectares of new salt marsh uh, habitat through a tidal inundation system. So that's a very high profile project, which um, is all linked to how we grow biodiversity and we try and restore it back into, into, our, into the location. So in terms of what's going on on the site there, um, I find it quite you know, relevant uh, to be, be talking about biodiversity yeah, that purely because it's what I do. I do it as a job. I do it as a, uh, as a career. Um, and in terms of the, there was, a, there was a new paper that was published last week from the Environment Agency, which has something like it's 97% of uh, grassland uh, biodiversity habitats uh, uh, disappeared since 1930 in England alone. Um, so in terms of when, when we're looking at policy, when we're looking at particularly RA3 from, from Rother, which is focused around uh, agriculture and focused on, you know, favourably, if there was an agricultural uh, tie to this, the council would by default be, be looking at as favour. But actually, agriculture is the biggest harm to the environment that, that there is. And that's a proven fact. You know, it's, a, it's the most detrimental um, element. And actually, we have a beautiful location. You look across the A and B, and we go, oh, isn't that wonderful? But actually, the biodiversity is the worst, possibly, in the whole of Europe, if not in the world. It's just empty fields, which have been absolutely raided for any nutrients over years. So... When we think about the wider uh, landscape to, uh, to Pepper Pot Farm, this scheme we've actually factored in. We have factored in um, uh, rewilding new trees, habitat creation, which otherwise just wouldn't happen. And I, I note that there's been questions uh, asked previously uh, about, well, why aren't you doing it now? Why, why aren't you just getting on with it? Um, cost. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's who's going to maintain that? Who's going to look after that? It takes years to be able to implement these things. Um, and it also takes years for a load of sheep just to run in there and chew it all up again and destroy it. So um, in terms of the wider, the wider perspective, I mean, there's a commitment from us in terms of not only what I do as a day job, but also a commitment for, for we're in a, a climate emergency and a biodiversity emergency. So it's our, it's our choice to reduce travel uh, by uh, live work. It's also our choice to be increasing biodiversity, which we can all do. So i answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ganley. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> Did I understand you to say that this application is the same as the previous one that was refused? That is correct, yeah. But that was ref refused on the grounds of um, uh, failure to, uh, to, to follow due process, which was upheld. So it was refused, so, having not been pulled through to committee after a request. It was. You say it was refused on the grounds of not following the procedure? But it was refused with the, 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 uh, the delegated officer refused it before the due process, the timing in terms of us as the applicant being allowed to call it to committee. So it was failure to, call due, to follow due process, which has but, been upheld. I understand, yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. I've just got um, Joe Spruce coming, wanting to come in, our lawyer. Hello, yeah, sorry, good afternoon, uh, Chair. I just wanted to make the point, um, members uh, are obliged to consider the applications in front of them, so Obviously, if there's been an issue with some kind of maladministration and previously, that's not a planning consideration for you to consider today. So when you're looking at this application, look at it on the merits of, of what's discussed today, not the maladministration that happened before. Thank you. Thank you. That's really useful, Jess, but we don't get led down that rabbit hole. Councillor... I just wanted to help because I know what Legal just said, but if you're looking online, it's actually an additional letter that came in on the 11th of May 2022. You found it, because the two appendices just, are just appeals moment, for then, Gloucester. Just a moment, it's, it's our, our speaker's... Yeah, sorry, floor. but it was trying to help them find it. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? No? Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation and thank you for coming. Right, members. Um, Councillor Curtis? You're on Thank you, Chair. Um, 
contentious application. It's been, um, been a few issues over the last few months. Um, don't particularly want to dwell on it too much, but I have previously called it in and it was refused. It was, there's, sub, there's been other issues and etc. etc. and they've resolved that. Rather, this is what we're talking about. Um, it's a shame, again, this time, the application comes before us um, and members haven't had a chance to see it because we didn't get to see it on Tuesday. Um, whether we defer it to another date because of... Um, uh. Excuse me? That's probably Miles groaning. <laughs> Good. He's treading on down. Continue. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, so um, we dealt with all the. I mean, we should deal with it on an individual status, on its own merits. It's a. It's a different one. It's building in the countryside, but it's a commercial unit, and you know they want to live and work. So it's there are specific merits to it that could, should be considered, perhaps. Um, there's employment. Uh, sustainability has already been um, dealt with. The rural location, um, Wendy's already alluded to that. I mean, it's um, it a tiny hamlet, but it's spread out. And so any, any um, um, what's the word, improvement or uh, maintaining the, the area has surely got to be um, a positive um, and also, with all this um, government, you know, they want to sort of um, farmers to diversify and do as much as they can. We want to keep them there. You know, it's no good them just sh um, shutting the place down and going off to the town. That totally defeats the object. Um, from what I understand, the, um, the plans all conform to as close to the carbon targets that are available at the moment. Obviously, this is not the same as something we looked at earlier on where it's a state-of-the-art, you know, carbon-neutral building, but with a stone building or a, a metal bit, you're, not, you're never going to do that, but you can get close to it and obviously make the necessary um, adjustments. Um, and I think it's always a difficult one because with any defunct agricultural buildings, what do you do with them? You know, we've looked at them before where they'd say, well, we'll leave it as it is, which is not really what we want to see. But if we can make an improvement and maintain the rural aspects of our communities, I think is paramount. In um, whether we defer today uh, for give the, the um, committee an opportunity to go and have a look at it because it's quite a unique spot. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, I think I find this so difficult because when you have in the rural areas, and we have a lot in the rural areas, a lot of good workspaces, converted chicken sheds, whatever they are, and pro providing huge amount of jobs. And particularly when you have the parish council supporting it totally and the local members supporting it totally, it's a really difficult one. Councillor. Um, I know there's another deferral on the way as well. Um, and I know the officers. Yes, councillor. I, I, well, I would be against you, because I thought those pictures that were submitted were gave a really good impression of what, what the situation is. So, can I, Councillor Drayson, are you supporting the the recommendation? Because yeah, the recommendation is refusal, isn't it? So I, I was trying to dissuade a, a, de, a deferment. Against the deferment. Against the deferment, yes. Um, as a Bexhill councillor, I feel slightly uncomfortable taking a view on what is essentially a village situation rather than a specific planning uh, matter of, matter of uh, material planning matter. And I think so far we've had enough representation from the village to give us a complete picture of mm. how it sits within that environment, how it sits within Dallington. So I... I would be happy to carry on and make up my mind without any further, without necessarily needing 
go and see it. I think I've, I've heard enough from the local people and, and uh, residents. Um, Councillor Mir, could you repeat your question to the officers? The question that I asked of Councillor Mears, uh, with an S on the end, um, was, was that. The, que the question was, un under what policy provision is this application being brought? Um, because policy RA3 doesn't apply, and I can't see anything else which applies. The only thing is the lack of housing provision, um, where we're talking about only one house, and where inspectors repeatedly have given very limited weight to, um, to um, sorry, paragraph 11 of the NPPF, very limited weight to that, where only one dwelling is involved. Um, if we were to give permission for this, it's hard to see how we would refuse anything anywhere, almost. This is the problem. It may be that our policies are wrong, that they're too inflexible, but the, these are the policies that we're applying. Councillor Ms. Mary Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you take your minds back, for those of us who attended the Rother Rural Planning Roundtable uh, in the middle of June, which is approximately a month ago, um, in Climwell, we were absolutely fascinated to hear from the large number of businesses which are trying to um, plead for help. They... Um, accommodation is almost unavailable. They can't find anywhere to live which is cheap enough for them to live <coughs> in and yet to, to work. This looks to me like an absolutely ideal case for some help. Um, they've got the design, they, they've got the expertise, they've got the ability to be able to do the thing by themselves. I think they should be given a chance. I think that Everything that we've heard today, you know, the low carbon, the biodiversity, um, the support, huge support from the community, um, all to me adds up to one thing, and that is that they should be allowed to get on with it. They should be allowed to live there, have to get the order for the applicant to live there, and to be able to conduct their business. They're never going to be hugely wealthy. But on the other hand, maybe they will. Maybe I've got that completely wrong. But <laughs> let's help them by finding them some accommodation. And what, is, what could be better than the accommodation they've already got with a little bit of a... a, 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 a you know, um, tweak. Yeah, a tweak, that's the word. Um, and as far as the timber is concerned, we've got a, we've got a, um, a barn in Wallcrouch, which is used as a sort of vast ironmongery business, which we made them to um, uh, c cover with, with, uh, with, with timber. So what's the difference? But I think, you know, don't let's pither about on this. Let's just let them get on with it. I think it's an ideal situation for us to be able to put into, into operation what we heard at that planning round table and say, we've made a start. Thank you. I think the only thing about what we heard at that round table was actually it was space for businesses, not houses. Uh, but on the other hand, this is an absolutely, you know, sort of cast iron case, isn't it, where we should be as helpful as we possibly can. Just Keith again. Just Pete, sorry. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate some of the um, framework within which we're making this decision. So, as I've, I've raised before, you've got Section 72 of the Town and Country Planning Act that requires you to take account of local plan unless material considerations dictate otherwise. So you've, your officers um, listed the relevant policies in the local plan that apply. I'd also bring to your attention Section 85 of the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, which requires um, the council, when considering any function, not just a planning function, but any function, the desirability of preserving and enhancing um, an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, and all the, all the other considerations um, that are material are, are in your report and you've discussed. But I just wanted to reiterate that it's, it is a high bar um, and there is a degree of um, um, protection. There is a, a hurdle you have to overcome if you want to um, sidestep section in paragraph 80 of the um, NPPF. And I just wanted to bring that to the forefront of, of members' minds because that is the crucial question before you today. 
Thank you. I wondered if Michael wanted to come in, but I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Um, if, yeah, I'll just clarify a few things, if that's okay for everyone. Um, I think the first one was raised by a first speaker, Parish Council member. Um, the way of services, that just means that it wasn't anything against Dallington. It was just um, services in regard to different variation of shops, um, high schools, um, different things like, that, like doctor surgery. That's what we meant by services, um, not so much other services. Um, and in regards to the commercial aspect, there's no objection. We have no objection to the commercial aspect of this. Um, a commercial use on the site has already been approved, so they can they can carry out their commercial work at the site already. The only thing that we're considering now is this residential unit. And one thing that I think we should make clear is that there was a appeal on the site um, in 2019 for the demolition of the redundant barn um, to a residential dwelling, and that was dismissed at appeal. Um, where the inspector found that there would be harm to the character and appearance of the area and it would be in an unsustainable location. So I think we should just also take that into consideration as well um, when members are um, considering the, just the residential aspect of this. You know, as I say, the commercial aspect has been approved in 2020, so there's there's no objection to that. Um, yeah, just to make members aware um, of that appeal decision um, on the site already. Oh, that's quite an important consideration, yes. Councillor Lang. I hope I don't sound too confusing here because I'm looking now at the local plan and employment development. So please help me out here, Matthew, if I get a bit confused. But it says mixed-use developments can be achieved in both urban and rural areas. They offer an appropriate and effective means of providing further business opportunities, especially for Indigenous firms, to establish and grow. Um, and I'm looking at policy EM1 and what we need to be doing for that, but also policy EM3, reuse and adaptations of buildings in the country for a side for employment purposes, including tourism or as a community facility, etc., etc. And it says as long... Um, point two says they are capable of conversion without major or complete reconstruction. So I'm looking at this and thinking, well, this fits quite neatly in with these employment opportunities in Darlington. And I would think that the conversion of the, the barn is not too intrusive or difficult and would actually retain that business within that community. But... Um, yeah, so mixed-use development, I don't think that relates to residential and employment uses. It's mixed commercial uses, I believe. Um, which, which policy were you looking at? It's policy EM3, reuse and adaptation of buildings in the countryside for employment purposes. Is that core strategy 2014? No, no, it's a local plan. It's in the adapted Rother District local plan. What, 2006? So, not cool. yeah. If it's 2006, it's superseded. So, oh, um, the, okay. I mean, the, uh, our, our more up-to-date employment Sorry. land policies, that they'll, yeah, the, any, any mixed-use uh, commercial space is really, yeah, commercial-related development, not, not mixed-use in terms of uh, <coughs> residential uses. Residential uses, you need to look to policy RA3 of the core strategy. Um, and paragraph 80 is a material consideration. So, um, yeah, do, like, does this proposal comply with any of the RA3 exceptions or paragraph 80? Um, and I mean, Jasper clarified that. We have to, as decision makers, you have to determine applications in accordance with the development plan. Um, and those are your policies, policy RA3. Um, yeah, does it? And, and yeah, quite rightly, quite rightly, Michael pointed out the 2019 um, appeal decision. 
that was at a time when we didn't have a five-year housing land supply. So, um, the, yeah, if there was no harm to the AOMB, the tilted balance would apply. However, the residential aspect of the scheme back then found harm to the AOMB. Um, the, the proposal before you, um, it's very residential in nature. Appreciate you've got this um, business use also proposed to allow the occupiers to work there, um, but um, it would essentially be residential in character with a garden. Um, it would change from an agricultural field essentially to residential. And that's, I mean, uh, yeah, it's explained within the report, hence the recommendation. Sticky ground, I think. Councillor Mia, then Councillor Mr. Barnes. Yeah. Yes, I, I think we're making some progress. Um, are, we, are we back to paragraph 80 of the MPPF then? Um, uh, planning policies and decisions should avoid the development of isolated homes in the countryside, well, it seems to be an isolated home in the countryside as much as any of the others are, uh, isolated homes in the countryside, unless one or more of the following circumstances apply. Um, C... The development would reuse redundant or disused buildings that enhance its immediate setting. Um, can, 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 we, can we use that if we wish to grant this application? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, I mean, my understanding, this building was, was granted permission in very recent years. I mean, Excuse me. <coughs> I think the problem is, Councillor Mayor, is the recent inquiry, the recent rejection. Well, yeah, I mean, it's recently been granted permission for business purposes, and this size was considered appropriate, so uh, I assume at the time of that application, um, some justification was put forward, which we accepted for business use. I don't, I don't know the exact details. However, yes, 2019, it, a residential use here was found to be harmful to the AOMB. I, what, we, yeah, what's, what's different to two, three years ago? It's, um, uh, I've got Councillor, Mr. Councillor Mrs. Barnes, is that all right? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, Chairman, I wonder if, um, I haven't got my iPad in front of me, if we could have a look at MPPF 85, because I gather that there is something on that that might be of some relevance. Yes, that more or less sums up that planning policies and decisions should recognise that sites to meet local business and community needs in rural areas may have to be found adjacent or to or beyond existing settlements and in locations that are not well served by public transport. In these circumstances, it will be important to ensure that development is sensitive to its surroundings, does not have an unacceptable impact on local roads, and exploits any opportunities to make a location more sustainable, for example, by improving the scope for access on foot, by cycling, or by public transport. The use of previously developed land and sites that are physically well related to existing settlements should be encouraged where suitable opportunities exist. I would have thought that covered it, Councillor Mann. I think the problem with that is, is that's about the business use, not about... Well, I, I think we... <laughs> Councillor Mayor, you're speaking. Um, sites to meet local business and community needs. Well, maybe that means village halls rather than domestic dwellings. I don't know. Yes, I... I think it's very clear that it, this is... The history is not, it's not about domestic dwellings. Councillor... I've got Councillor Curtis. Um, I'll move approval. If we can find, obviously, they may say otherwise, but um, never find an answer. And that's him. Shop chair. And reasons. Well, Mary said. <laughs> 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 I, I 
just need to take advice on that one. Interpretation there of. And I would also add, Chair, as far as the security of the business is concerned, too, because certainly on their website, I notice they have actually had burglaries. So I think it's important because another point that came out of that rural roundtable uh, was the danger of having businesses um, um, burgled because um, equipment is so much more expensive than it used to be. So to bring it all under one roof would seem so sensible. Um, um, I, we can vote on that if you put it on the table. I do warn against it because... I think we, we need more of a reason. We can't just point to paragraph 85 of the MPPF. I mean, that is for business it's uses. Not for it's not for dwellings. Um, I mean, th this is an isolated location. We're in the mm. AOMB. We talked about precedents earlier. Are we, yeah, this could apply to lots of sites. I mean, I just, yeah, ask for more, more of an explanation if we, if we are going down that way. Professor Mir. I, I'd just like to seek some clarification on the harm to the AOMB. There is already a building here. Um, what, what, what exactly is the harm to the AOMB? Thank you, Chair. Just, I think there's a lot of discretion in paragraph 85. Planning policies and decisions should recognize that sites to meet local business and community needs in the rural areas. Now, I would argue that a live worth unit does, in fact, meet a business and community need in this rural area. Uh, it then goes on, essentially, to, to say the position of this particular unity is not a problem. But just that first sentence, I would have thought, gives us room to say we can do it. I, I think we need to recognise that the NPPF is, has got chapter headings, and then it's got clauses attached to it. So if we want to look at 85, we first need to look at the chapter heading which talks about prosperous rural economy. And 84 talks about businesses, and then 85 talks about businesses and community. The word community is about community facilities, commercial, retail, etc. If they were to imply residential, they would have put it in there. But it doesn't, so I would tend to err to say when they use that word community, it has to do with some type of employment or economic generation rather than a living space. And uh, just to read our legal advisors indicated. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, j just one quick point about the certain question that was raised by councillors as to well, what's the harm? Well, residential development in the countryside is harmful by its nature. That's the starting position you have to consider everything from. Um, and then you have to justify in that context as being able to effectively overcome the existence of that harm. So residential development in this plot is harmful by its nature. That's the harm because of its location, because it's within the AOMB. Um, and if you go through the, the relevant chapters in paragraph 80, which we obviously we all looked at quite extensively earlier, um, if you were minded to look at this current situation, you'd have to fit it into one of those exceptions. I and mean, I can go through them if you'd like. And you, your planning officer might prefer to go through them. But it's difficult to justify the applications in front of you by reference to any of those paragraphs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ganley wanted to come in. Chairman, I, um, I'm sure we all want to help this applicant uh, to achieve his objectives. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, we will have to forget our policies, or well, indeed bend them. You might as well, because what's the point of setting... Anyway, you would have to bend your, uh, our policies. Perhaps more importantly, uh, we would have to ignore the appeal inspector's views on the matter. And that is a serious matter. I, it's not one that I would certainly go, recommend or go down uh, the route of, uh, and I would suggest that you should not either. 
Thank you. Um, I agree with what you have just said, Councillor Gandhi. Um, but also, if we are going for approval, we still haven't got enough basis on which to rest the approval. Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Is it reasonable to ask officers, because it's a matter of interpretation, to, to see whether there would be a way, or is, it, or is the wording so prescriptive that it can't be done? Is that a, I, understood, I understand that might be awkward for officers, but... That was Councillor Mears question right at the beginning. Well, paragraph, paragraph 80 of the MPPF is under rural housing. Yeah. Paragraph 85 is rural business. Yeah, exactly. So our advice is that, well, the recommendation in the report is that it's contrary to paragraph 80. If you were to be granting it, you would have to say it complies with one of these exceptions in paragraph 80. Um, I... My advice is it doesn't, um, as the, the officer report states. I was looking at the other list of policies you said would not accord with policies, and then you go on to list the policies. Um, I apologise for not having read each of those policies in detail. <coughs> Which, uh, Reason, um, when you say reasons for refusal. Reasons for refusal. Yes, right. I think it's one of those decisions where it's heart and mind. Um, but Councillor Mears' point was, are we actually allowed to? Are those policies so tightly worded that we can't? Because I think it's pretty obvious that there's all, there might be a majority in the room. Because of the to... previous inspector's decision. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the policies listed in the first reason for refusal, so harm to the AOMB, that's policies OSS2 of the core strategy, which sets out our spatial strategy for Rodder District. So focus new housing in existing settlements. Um, I'd, um, yeah, I'd, I listened to the discussion earlier about Dallington, um, but there is, there is a small village centre, I would argue. Appreciate it hasn't got a development boundary, but there's a difference between... Dallington, the small village where the school is, and the surrounding AOMB countryside, which is scattered residential properties, open fields, woodland, typical of the AOMB. Um, so, yeah, it's contrary to OSS2. OSS4 is general development considerations, so um, development has to be in keeping with the local area, um, protect the living conditions of neighbouring properties, etc., whether it's in keeping or not is a matter of judgment. RA2 is countryside policy, so sort of principle of promoting economic and agricultural uses in the um, countryside, restricting residential development, um, as does RA3. That RA3 gives you the list of circumstances when you can approve new dwellings in the countryside. Um, our advice is it doesn't meet any of them. EM1 is about protecting landscape character, particularly in the high wheeled AOMB. Um, I mean, as you're aware, it's the best preserved medieval landscape in Northern Europe. I think we all got a duty to protect it. Um, approving dwellings in isolated locations is not going to protect it, in my view. I think it's um, so, <laughs> No. In my view, there is not, but that's, that's officer's, officer advice. Could you ask the officer to read out RA2, please? Would you mind, for the members? Uh, RA2, RA2, yeah, bear with me a minute. Um, core, core strategy. I have, uh, I've got a lot, Matt, if you want me to read it, or if you want to go for it. Oh, no. you go for it, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. 
So policy RA2, uh, general strategy for the countryside. The overarching strategy for the countryside is to maintain the farming capacity of the district and support the agricultural industry, including diversification within farming. That's the first point. The second point is encourage agricultural practices, land-based economic activities and woodland management and related agri-environmental schemes that reinforce local distinctiveness, landscape character and ecology. Point three, strictly limit new development to that which supports local agricultural economic or tourism needs and maintains or improves the rural character. Point four, retain traditional historic farm buildings by continued agricultural use or by appropriate reuse. Point five, support rural employment opportunities in keeping with rural character and compatible with maintaining farming capacity. Point six, support enjoyment of the countryside and coast for improving access and supporting recreational and leisure facilities that cannot reasonably be located within development boundaries, such as equestrian, compatible with rural character. Uh, point seven, support tourism facilities, including tour- touring van, caravan and campsites, which respond to identified local needs. And the last point, generally conserving the interesting value, locally distinctive, rural character, landscape features, built heritage and the natural ecological resources of the countryside. That's um, RA2. Uh, in full. Um, yeah, and then RA3 is development in the countryside, um, and that goes on to state where um, we would, in some instances, um, allow the creation of new dwellings in extremely limited circumstances. Um, so that's RA2. I think we're going to have to tackle this one with a vote. Go on. Point three, Chair. Point just, three? Just point three cover it. Michael, could you read point three again? Um, point three is strictly limit new development to that which supports local agricultural, economic or tourism needs and maintains or improves the rural character. I think in relation to the report, um, the reason for refusal, uh, well, I didn't, um, in my opinion, um, I didn't believe the character, uh, the development would maintain or improve the rural character. Um, and you know, that's what was used. You know, essentially the um, the domestic the, the change of use from um, commercial to domestic would um, would harm that. Um, yeah, but and um, that's that's point three for everyone. Right, we've got on the floor, and officer's going to have to help me here if I'm going the wrong direction. But but moved by Councillor Curtis, seconded by. Councillor Barnes, is that you want approval based on that point three that has just been read out? Members are... The f- sorry, Chair. Um, the fact that um, rural um, property is, is over, so overpriced, you can't, they can't move into it anyway. I think so. the thing is, Councillor Curtis, um, and I'm probably stepping over as Chair, but I, we agree with everything, particularly the agree with what, what the... But, but then, but then we have a duty, and as Councillor Ganley has said, we've got a duty to abide by our policies. Um, but it has been moved and seconded with a, with a reason which our officers are not particularly supporting. But no, let's sorry. let's take it to the vote, though. Those in favour of approval. Those against? Thank you. So, so that is one. Approval is, is one. But conditions. we need conditions. What conditions? Remove permitted development rights. Removal of permitted development rights. Is that it? Councillor Ben? Uh, I don't know how this is phrased, but the continuation of the carpentry business. Tying it to the applicant? Uh, yes. We seem, 
but we seem to be justifying it on the fact that that sort of business enhances the local economy, and I don't know that that resides specifically within a person. But um, I, I, I wouldn't have any problem with uh, tying it to a person rather than necessary um, to... Matt, Matt, before we come, this Jess Breek wants to speak. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, if you approve the application, we'll also need to do it within Section 106 and um, civil contributions as well um, as part of the resolution. Okay. Um, Jasper, could you just explain why we need the 106, please? Um, I thought that was a reference in the um, report to a sum required under seal. Unless I've mis misread that, sorry. So you're suggesting a 106 to be appended to the commission? No, sorry, just bear with me one second. I might be looking at the wrong. But I saw a figure. Yeah, the still, still 21,000. Yeah, okay. But if, yeah, that's fine. And if we're dealing, we're dealing with that under seal, then that's okay. Any other conditions? Okay, Chairman, did I gather that the 106 would tie the house and the business together? We don't need it. I, mean, I didn't quite The condition it. could be to tie the business and the, and the dwelling together? Yeah. 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 Can we do that? We, we can... We can specify the um, the use. I mean, in the unless it's covered in the description of development, um, change of use of a B1 commercial unit to a mixed use live work unit. I suppose the work bit needs to be. Um, I mean, how specific do you want it to be? The the applicants um, explain their carpenters so carpen to be used for carpentry purposes. Yeah. Um, can I also ask about um, materials, landscaping, parking, all those sorts of things? No, I mean, I mean you're approving, you've approved the residential use here, so that, I mean, that'd be unreasonable to remove things like that. You've essentially said that a residential use here is acceptable, so... Members, I think it's quite difficult to think of conditions on the hoof. Um, would you be happy to delegate it to officers? Carpentry. Delegate. Just for Sorry. standard. Councillor Meadley, okay, through confirmation I'll back the to condition. the chair <laughs> that you're happy with what's been agreed. Councillor Meadley has asked that it be confirmed by the chair, the conditions. Shared with me. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so standard conditions for a dwelling, but yeah, we'll share them with yourself. Yeah, so that's fine. Jasper, did you want to come back? Sorry, um, yes, Chair. I just wanted to say if, if it's the case that we're approving on the basis that um, in the proposed mixed use enhances the rural area by reference to the third limb of flood policy RA2 then it may be useful then to link the limitation on the use yeah. back to um, policy RA2 somehow, um, because that's the reason we're saying it's acceptable. I mean, it may be better to do that in a Section 106 agreement, um, um, but it's, it's difficult to think of, um, you know, really tight wording on the spot, I must say. Thank you. Thank you. I think it, it needs to be thought out, doesn't it? Yeah. Move on? Yeah. Let's have a quick break. Ten minutes? Right, welcome back. Um, there was a bit of a discussion in the break about whether we plough on or we div um, adjourn to another day. The general feeling seems to be we plough on, uh, but also I think 
with respect to the people who've been waiting such a long time, I think we should perhaps rejig the order. But our, our, the first one that we're next on is the um, is RR 2021-2804P, Villa Flair, Union Street. Um, I'm not going to ask Matt to introduce this one because I'm in consultation with the local member. Would you like to... Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I know by now that the, one of the speakers has gone home. Um, and I think, uh, I hope I get the committee um, support for this, that I think this is, a, this is an application which actually needs a site visit. Uh, you can't get an appreciation. There we all got there in the end. Um, so this proposal um, or the site is one that we went to see on Tuesday. Um, it's a site between Breed and Broad Oak on the east side of the A28. Um, it is outside a development boundary um, in the countryside, in the AOMB, um, ne next to a listed building, um, and there are public footpaths um, behind the site. Um, the proposal is for the change of use of the site um, to residential use um, for a Gypsy and Traveller family. Um, the family consists of uh, two adults and three children. The three children are in local schools. Um, the change of use would involve bringing a static mobile home onto the site, um, be positioned close to the southern boundary, um, to the east of the stable block that we walked past. Um, the stable block would be retained. Um, they're also proposing a brick and tile um, day room to the north northeast of the mobile home. Um, so, the, if you look on the slide, the, the mobile home is along the southern boundary of the site. The smaller rectangle to the north is the day room, which measures around eight, eight metres by five. There's a um, proposed bathroom, <laughs> utility room and seating area. No um, sleeping accommodation um, as, well, day room is yeah, day, day use. Um, it's got an existing access um, with an area to park. I, would, I think there were three vehicles on site when, when we, we went there. Um, I know drainage was raised as an issue at the site inspection. Um, upon reviewing the plans back in the office, um, this this plan actually shows a below ground septic tank um, which would um, be linked to the mobile home and the day room. Um, I don't know if it's been if that's in place yet or not. I haven't got that information, I'm afraid. Um, You'll hopefully have read the committee report, um, and that, that explains this site in the countryside, in the AOMB, um, and there is some harm. However, we believe that harm is um, reduced due to the fact that the mobile home and day room are set well back from the road, um, it's screened by the existing stables, it's quite significant vegetation screening around the sides of the site. Nevertheless, it is harmful. Um, paragraph 176 of the MPPF requires you to give great weight to the um, protection of the landscape and scenic beauty of the AOMB. Um, in respect to the listed building next door, because of the separation and vegetation screening, um, officers felt that the setting of the listed building was not um, affected. Um, in terms of location, although it is in the countryside, um, the site 
Uh, there is a footpath outside of the site which links to both Greed and uh, Broad Oak. It's a few minutes walk away. Broad Oak, we've got the primary school there and shops and um, other services. Um, highways do not raise an objection. It's a reasonably straight section of road. Um, and, yeah, no, no objection there. Um, really, this, this comes down to the planning balance. Um, and because we, because we, um, we got sites allocated in the DASA for gypsy and traveller use. Um, however, a recent appeal did question the deliver, deliverability of uh, these sites, um, especially the one in Bex Hill, which is a material consideration. Um, the best interests of the children living on the site are also a material consideration. Um, and in the balance, officers felt that the, the limited harm to the AOMB was outweighed by these other considerations, hence the on-balance recommendation to approve this development. One thing I haven't mentioned yet, caravan tracking diagram, um, which shows you can get a caravan in and out of the site. Yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we do have speakers. Um, Councillor Nottage, would you like to come? To the hot seat. <laughs> um, you, you gathered that you, you will be timed from when you push the button? <laughs> That's it. Right. Thank you for allowing me to speak at the planning committee to planning committee members. As chairman of Breed Parish Council, I would like to expand upon the reasons Council gave for supporting refusal of this application when it was discussed at a parish planning meeting in April 2021. Firstly, it is in, within the high wheeled area of outstanding natural beauty and the Breed Valley Landscape Character Area, which describes it as a largely unspoilt and tranquil rural landscape. The management strategy for these areas states that new development should respect the character and form of the landscape and existing settlements. The IOMB states that the characteristics of settlements within it have a limited palette of local materials such as tiles, bricks, clay, stone and timber. Mobile home accommodation, such as proposed in this application, is not characteristic to the area. Secondly, it is outside the development boundary for Broad Oak, as per the development and site allocation local plan for Rother District Council. To approve this application would be contrary to both the planning policy OSS2 of the Rother Local Plan Court Strategy and the National Planning Policy Framework. Another application for outline planning permission just a few metres up the road was refused only earlier this month for exactly those reasons. Previous applications for the site have seen refusal of any residential applications. Thirdly, it is too close to the Grade 2 listed building, Kingwoodland, which was registered in 1987. As you will be aware, in Apex, uh, Appendix 4 of the Rother Core Strategy, key design principles, 
It states that, in relation to the historic environment, the impact of development on the fabric, legibility, character and setting of the particular heritage, heritage asset will be a consideration. King Woodland is currently a single property surrounded by fields and ponds. There is no other development either side within 140 metres. To allow development not in keeping with the current local characteristics would be incredibly detrimental. Fourthly, there is already enough provision for travellers' sites within Rod Rother, paragraph 25 of the planning policy for travellers' sites, states that local planning authorities should strictly limit new travellers' sites in open countryside that are any away from existing settlements or outside areas allocated in the development plan. Finally, the site does not meet the criteria for assessing suitability for a traveller's site as per policy LHN6 in the Rother Core Strategy. From this policy, subsection 2, states that there should be no adverse visual or landscape impact, especially within the AOMB. And this site is very visible from the well-used footpath. There is some screening in the summer months when the vegetation is in full leaf, but it's only for around five months of the year. Subsection 4 states the site can be ad adequately accessed by vehicles towing caravans. The current ex access is not suitable, and the report from Highways dated 9th of the 1st, 2022, has advised that a reconstructed access layout to accommodate manoeuvres and visibility displays should be included in any permission granted. This does not change the fact that the access is onto a main A road near a bend at the bottom of a hill and a narrow road which is known for its problems with large vehicles. Only last week there was another collision in the vicinity of this application to increase the movement of large, vehicle, large vehicles and towed caravans on this road would be full hardly. hardy. Breed Parish Council urges councillors to consider this application very carefully. To grant planning permission for this application, despite these objections, could set a precedent for the future applications outside other development boundaries in Rother and within the high wheeled area of so outstanding not natural beauty. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Uh, questions, members? Any questions? Yes, Council, Council Gordon. Hello, Council. Oh, there's, um, vegetation wise, you'd say that most of the trees surrounding um, the site are deciduous trees. Would you agree with that? Uh, across from the footpath, uh, there is virtually no uh, coverage from foliage. Uh, from the road, yes, it, it's a mix. Okay, so from the road you can see the site in the winter months. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Councillor. Oh, sorry, Councillor Langland. <laughs> I've almost forgotten my question. I don't know um, how long you have obviously been on the council, but could I ask, do you know about that very old static caravan that sits there already? and why it was there and what purpose it served? I've lived in the village for 40 years. I've been on the parish council 19. No, and I wish it wasn't. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if you want my personal Answered. opinion. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, yes, Councillor Gray. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, if, if we don't grant approval, do you know what will happen to the families that are living there? Uh, from my understanding, and this is all Pearson, um, they have property elsewhere. Uh, they have property in Kent uh, and, and property elsewhere within the country, is my understanding. Sorry, but I understand the children are in local schools. Uh, 
to the best of my knowledge, the children do not go to Breed Primary School. At one time, they were going to Northian School, but I have since heard that they are, have moved from that school and are attending another school, so they are not going to, another, to our local school. Councillor Gordon. Yes, we have, a, uh, we have an information update, which we got yesterday, by the way, and uh, it basically stated um, there are two previous addresses that possibly may exist for the applicant. I believe one in Kent. In fact, both, both in Kent. Uh, uh, so, no, I haven't. I'm sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I've got, um, I've got our, our legal advisor on, and I, I think I might have to take his comments before I let you start. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so, thank you, Chair. No, no, stay there. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to make, make clear that uh, um, uh, statements as to that aren't that aren't uh, uh, we aren't able to corroborate with any kind of evidence, aren't planning considerations that we can take into account in terms of being a material consideration in relation to the application. If there is some kind of corroborative documentary evidence that can um, indicate something, some element of the officer's report is not correct, then that can be relied on. But a statement that the, um, something in the officer's report is not correct is, is just not something that we can take into account in the balance. I just wanted to make that clear that when we make a decision, we're making it on all the correct grounds. Okay. Thank you. And Miles, did you want to come in? I was about to refer to the same thing. And um, I'd also point out that the agent did email me and say that although the names are the same, it's a different person. That's one to the agent. I, I may be able to assist. Um, I sort of heard what Miles said, but I think I've been privy to the same information. Um, the, this allegation of another property, um, the planning agent has advised us that it's a different person. Um, so different person, same name. Um, the property re referred to, so the applicant's business, I think is registered to a property in Ashford. Um, and we've been told that's his mother's address. So, and I think that's what was Miles was possibly saying. So you're saying it's not corroborated? Well, no, we haven't got evidence to prove okay. that. Um, we haven't got evidence. No, no evidence. No, no. Okay. Uh, apologies, Pam. Do go. I live in King Woodland, the nearest property to the site, and I'm concerned many points raised by myself and other local representatives, or residents, sorry, about the impact of this development have not been addressed in the report. The report concludes there are no adverse impacts on my living conditions based on three arguments, all of which are wrong or incomplete. It states the mobile home and day room are sited further from King Woodland than the stable block, and this is true but no one was supposed to be living in the stable block anyway. The original planning permission made it very clear there was to be no residential use. However, the proposed new location of the touring caravan is nearer to King Woodland than the stable block, and the caravan could be parked right outside my kitchen window or back door. The report contains no conditions on this to minimise the effect of the development on me, my cottage, which is Grade 2 listed, or the wider AONNB. The report states there is significant boundary screening between myself and the cottage, so that not visible. This has already been introduced by Councillor Nottage. I can assure the committee that during autumn, winter and spring, the mobile home, the television aerial and the caravan are very visible from my home 
and the surrounding area, footpaths and road. Also, the proposed new mobile home is much larger than the previous one and will be much more visible. The report states the development comprises one residential unit which is unlikely to generate significant or harmful levels of activity or noise. This is just wrong. The development comprises of four separate buildings used for residency. The mobile phone, the mobile home, the caravan, the stable block and the proposed haven. Living between separate buildings makes the noise level significantly greater and over the last months with the family and residents, I have suffered significant noise nuisance. Vehicle access from the road to the caravan and stable block was considered, well, to the stable block, was considered in the original application for the stable block and planning was approved because there was to be no residential use. There's no consideration of this in this report. The access track lies higher up from my house on a steep bank all the way along the northern boundary of my house and garden, and only about five yards from my kitchen and bathroom windows. So traffic is very invasive. Anyone on the track can see over the hedge directly into my windows, and exhaust fumes can be smelt in my kitchen, as my 17th century cottage is not insulated like a modern house. The volume of traffic to and from a residence of a family of five is a lot greater than to a field of horses and the incessant traffic past my windows and garden is another adverse effect on my living conditions. The report addresses none of the breaches of planning of the stable block. It should be painted black, which would minimise the effect on the AONB. There should be no storage area or dog pen on the side of the stable block nearest my house. I can hear the poor dog whining and barking in the pen during both day and night, which, as well as being a nuisance, I find distressing. There should not be trade waste on site. The applicant moved a large pile of waste from his roofing business, which included old asbestos roofing, to the northwestern corner of the field and covered it in earth. The report does not ask for any changes in design of the day room, which is ugly and incongruous, to minimise the effect on the surroundings. The comparison of the caravans to polytunnels is specious. The area is designated for agricultural use in which polytunnels would be an acceptable site, not so caravans. The report states there is doubt on the deliverability of any available alternative sites, as concluded within the recent Loose Farm Lane appeal decision. This decision was not recent, but made in 2011, so this information is seriously out of date. Only last month, in the recommendation for the Stub Lane application, it was ruled there were sufficient available sites, based on a statement by the inspectorate in a 2020 application. In conclusion, the report invokes Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights in regard to the applicant and his family. However, a public authority should take positive steps to allow all people to peacefully enjoy their home. With the errors and omissions in this report, it fails to give an accurate account of the impacts on my living conditions, and it does not act to minimise any effect on me, other local residents, or the area of outstanding natural beauty. Ooh, I was within five minutes. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions then for, for Pam Spence? Yes. Hello, Gordon. Hello, Pam. Pam, have you had any um, smells, uh, odorous smells at all? Yes. Uh, Okay, what, what sort of smells were they? Um, I smell very regularly soapy water, um, which is, it, can, it, it dissipates quite quickly, but it can be very strong. I open my back door and I almost retch. Um, and I have smelt sewage smells. Thank you, Pam. Other questions? No? So thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Okay. And thank you very much. <laughs> Councillor Gordon. Yeah, question for the officers, actually. I visited the site. Oh, Oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt, I, I visited the site and I saw no evidence of a septic tank. I looked hard and low for a septic tank. Could I see a septic tank? No. So I want to know what evidence we've got of a septic tank on the site. And surely, you know, it's been supposedly passed by environmental... If there was a septic tank, I would have noticed it, because you've got the drainage field as well to worry about. And there's a pond nearby. 
but you know, a lot of wildlife in it. And it very much depends where that sewage drains to. And I've hated to see it drain that pond. Yeah. So I, also, I don't think it's second time, though, personally. Could I also ask you to pick up the point about the appeal and the inspector report? Yeah, so I, I was sourced on the drainage. Um, I think in my presentation I said that, um, yeah, on closer inspection you can see a set, below ground septic tank proposed. Um, well, yes, um, and I mean this is, this is a part retrospective application. So the residential use is the retrospective part. The mobile, yeah. Right, Matt, speaking of 22 months. And so sewage or whatever has been not disposed of properly for 22 months. That's a long time. Well, if yeah, I mean, I, I haven't got any further information. So I don't, I don't know if the septic tank has been installed. I, I did, when we were at the site visit, I did ask for clarification from the applicant who confirmed those. There were two um, concrete slabs which he said, no, that's not the septic tank. I wasn't pointed towards anything else on the site. So um, I can't really say more than that. Um, so I don't know whether it's on site or not. Uh, all I can say is it's on the plan. Yeah, I, I, actually, I asked the question actually, Matt, because I, you know, on site with you, we were there together. Um, we were looking for a septic tank, both of us, weren't we? And he couldn't, he, I think he basically said to you there wasn't a septic tank. There wasn't? Yeah. I'm, he said I'm, the bit of concrete there was for his golfing or something. He or, did, yeah. He yeah. said, well, my understanding was that wasn't a septic tank. He didn't say specifically there's no septic tank on the site, but you would expect someone to say, oh, it's actually in a different location. So... Well, as a septic tank has to be pumped, you know, you know, once a year possibly or once every few years, it's very suspicious there's not an inspection hatch that one can, uh, you know, pump a septic tank. I thought, Councillor Maidley, you found an inspection hatch. No, I thought two pieces of concrete. Uh, yes, I found two pieces of concrete hidden behind a low bush. Um, and uh, Matt followed me down and said, no, it wasn't a septic tank. So that's possibly his golfing range, I don't know. That was his golfing range, affirmative, yeah. Thank you. Um, and the appeal? Yeah, I will. I may return to the drainage in a minute, bear with me. Um, the appeal um, at Loose Farm Lane, um, it's got a fairly long history. Um, the neighbours correct, there was one in 2011 um, which granted the first mobile home there, I believe. Um, in more recent years, we, well, December 2021, so we're talking, what, seven, eight months ago, there was an allowed appeal um, on the site um, for, so, Permission was granted for the change of use of existing agricultural land for the stationing of two mobile homes for residential purposes um, by a gypsy family, um, together with the provision of a communal utility day room. So, similarity to this one. But it was within that more recent decision, um, the, the inspector looked at our allocated sites. So we've got five in Bexhill for gypsies and travellers, one, another one at Loose Farm Lane. Um, and the, the Bexhill one, he put severe doubts on the deliverability of that and gave that quite a significant weight. Um, so that, that's what the officer recommendation in this case is based on that, that December 2021 um, appeal decision. Thank you, Chairman. If there are doubts about the deliverability of the approved sites that exist <clears throat> already for gypsies and travellers, 
surely uh, we would be able to ascertain whether or not they were deliverable or not before we consider this application. It, it would make sense to me to make that uh, assertion. Assertion? No, it's not the right word, is it? To decide whether or not it is deliverable uh, before considering this application. Personally, I don't understand the comment about deliverability because there was a planning application which was approved. Yes. Doubts about whether it's deliverable. I, I don't understand what his problem is with it, but uh, presumably he's got one with it. And it would be uh, wise, I would have thought, to establish why it's not deliverable, if it, indeed it's not deliverable. He raised doubts. You didn't say it wasn't deliverable. Maybe it is deliverable. Who knows? I, I tend, it, I tend good to, to find understand out. what you're saying because it's not actually cut and dried, is it? No, not at all. No. Councillor Mabey. Thank you, Chair. Um, yesterday's additional information concerns me slightly. Um, does the planning department have a name and address for the person who's written this additional objection because uh, there are accusations made in it which um, one assumes could be confirmed if we knew, I mean, I'm assuming you have the name and address of the person who's written this because if it's been sent in anonymously it's not much good to anybody. We wouldn't be allowed to consider it if it didn't have a name and address on. No, I can understand not having an address no. here. I'm simply asking whether it does have an address, whether there is an address on file. We do have an address file. Okay. Uh, I've got address here, actually, on the uh, application. Councillor Gordon. Sorry, beg your pardon, sorry. Uh, page number 123. And there it is right here. I don't want to read it out to anybody. No, but, I've, got, uh, I've got it written here. So now we need advice from officers because members. No, that one down there. From recollection, we 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 visited a site on the outskirts of Sidley which Councillor Coleman might remember, and it was pointed out to us as being an allocated site for travellers, and I think we were told it wasn't within the ownership of Rother District Council, and that made it very difficult to bring it forward. That's my recollection. And, and the, there was a planning application by a non-traveller on that site, and actually there wasn't any objection from the owner of the site. That's my recollection. I'm going to break with the rules and ask Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Chair. Just a point of clarification. If I recall correctly, the approved application for that uh, site on Waterman Lane um, was similar to like an outline application for the, for the principle of that site being used in that regard. And that if the development were to happen, I think a further application would still be required. So I think the question now for, for our officers is the fact, can we actually refuse this um, based on the fact that we are not convinced about, we, we've, we've said we can't do it about the ownership. Um, we've had the advice from our, our legal advisor, uh, but we could do it on the advice of the inspector. Can I move to the firm? Everybody likes a deferral today. <laughs> I love a deferral today. No, seriously, on a more serious note, um, yeah. I really do feel that there's a, there's a lot of weight on this application on the children's education, which I totally respect from the officers. But uh, I think maybe East Sussex County Council Education Department may throw some weight on this, and I think it needs further investigation, possibly.
because surely we, I, well I've said it before, but I'll say it again. <laughs> we should be able to establish whether or not this is um, uh, uh, what's the word, deliverable before making a decision. I'm taking advantage now of moving, you've moved and seconded, you seconded, didn't you? Deferral, I'm did happy you? to. Yep. Moved. Yes, okay. Those in favour? Miles hasn't spoken. We haven't asked Miles a thank you. Thank you for coming in. Um, apologies that we haven't reached a, a particularly decision, but there we are. Oh. Oh, is it? I think that's that's a bank over I think he's in Belfast. Yeah, he is. He is, isn't he? The case, members. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Um... We've got uh, 15, gender item 15, um, which has got new information. You may notice the information about um, building on this contaminated land, which is, sounds a little bit concerning. Um, it is um, RR 2022-830P, uh, St Mary's Lane Car Park, and it is um, <clears throat> Michael. page 143, it is. I've got a speaker for the application, but before that, uh, Michael Vladanu, are you still there, Michael? Patient man. Yep, still here. Problem. If you could present the, the uh, report, please. Yep, no problem. Um, so this next... Uh, agenda item is for the siting of a portable changing facility at St Mary's uh, Recreational Ground. Um, as uh, reported, the application is recommended for approval, subject to conditions. Um, the actual facility itself uh, will be used, uh, well, is planned to be used um, by Sydney Cricket Club um, in their attempts to bring back cricket into, into Sydney. Um, and the reason that the application is brought before committee um, is because the site is in the ownership um, of the council. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, sorry, just to just to confirm uh, before we go on, there is an update um, on this one, but um, I'll just give a brief overview of that update um, towards the end. Um, so. Yeah, so there's an application site. So as you can see, it's maybe not very clear from that um, sort of photograph there. Um, the container will be located um, just sort of down to the south. Well, it's actually the west, but on that photograph, it looks like the south. Um, just that red rectangle. Um, so it's located on the recreational ground. Um, and the recreational ground itself is located on the eastern side of Mary's Lane. Um, and the blue line there... Um, just to give a, a brief overview of what that is. It's just an open space um, and there's trees lying the boundary of the grounds um, and the facility itself would be located um, on the western side of the site um, approximately around um, 30 metres to the north um, of the Hard Standing Car Park. Next slide there, please, Matt. So, yeah, so that's an aerial photography. So as you can see, this in the southwestern corner, um, just where it says St Mary's Lane, small writing. Uh, that's the existing car park, and the um, portable uh, chain facility would just be to the north of that. Um, next slide should give you a better photo. Yeah, so it would just be just in front of the sign, about 30 metres, um, just over that fence, um, is where um, it's proposed. Um, next slide. Uh, that's yeah, not a very clear photo, um, but that's where it's insisting to be. So I'll be against the boundary um, towards the um, side of the site. I think the next slide should show you. Yeah, so this is what they are proposing. So 
Unfortunately, um, the application uh, didn't have any elevational plans submitted with it. Um, the design and access statement has stated um, that the facility would measure um, 9.75 metres by 3 metres um, with a flat roof ridge height of 2.4 metres. And the external materials um, would feature uh, steel with wooden cladding on the walls. Um, and yeah, the wooden cladding is to match that of the shipping container um, that's already been approved at the site. Um, under planning reference RR 20212252P. Um, I believe that previous application was for is it the 1066 Racing Club? I think that they had a they got approval for a racetrack and a storage facility like that um, as well. So it's very much of the opinion that this portable facility would be seen in the context um, of that built development that's um, been approved. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. Yeah, that's sort of all that it is. It's the, really the, the principle of it is to allow um, and to facilitate uh, Sidley uh, Cricket Club um, to uh, play cricket back back in Sidley. Um, and that's the main principle for it, which uh, was deemed acceptable. Um, in terms of the update, um, so last week um, we received uh, free contamination reports. Um, so they were a preliminary ground contamination risk assessment, um, a quantitative ground contamination risk assessment, and a, grass, a gas assessment, and a phase two geotechnical assessment. Um, I'll not go through each one. Um, probably the most important one to note was the phase two geotechnical assessment. That's the most recent one um, conducted in at the start of July. I think it was issued to us. Um, and that just gives um, mitigation um, and remedial um, conclusions. So, um, we have I have considered that um, if the committee recommend for approval, then a condition um, should be added to the report to ensure that the um, all aspects um, of section ten point nine of the phase two survey are carried out and investigated um, before any development commences at the site. Um, and it's also a uh, recommendation. It's also um, considered we should change the recommendation, um, and we should change it to grant full planning, um, subject to a review of the contamination surveys by the environmental health team. Um, I have had a look at the surveys myself, but um, feel that environmental health should review them just to ensure that you know it's been expertly reviewed and that there be no um, no no other risks to um, users of the site. Um, I believe Rebecca Owen from the council, the parks technical officer, um, is also um, helping with the application. Um, and she, me and her were in contact with environmental health, but we couldn't get comments um, from them in time for today. Um, so we would um, suggest that environmental health have a look at the um, free reports just in case they um, see anything that we didn't see or if they would like that in um, any more conditions. But one condition has been added, um, and that's just for the recommendations to be carried out. Um, but, yeah, it definitely is recommended that environmental health have a look at them reports. Thank you very much. And we have Jamie, oh. who's been also waiting patiently. Uh, Jamie Ramsden, who's the applicant? Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jamie Ramsden, and I'm Vice Chairman of Sydney Cricket Club, a playing member for 22 years, uh, and new ground project manager, I suppose. Um, the Cricket Club, firstly, would like to thank all 50 people that took the time to put a comment on both positive and negatively, um, and the club continue to work hard to support people who are for us, but more importantly, to gain the trust and respect of those people who have still got doubts regarding us using St Mary's. We have been using St Mary's on a weekly basis since early May, and I must say as a long-term member, it's fantastic to actually be playing cricket back in our community, and 40 children a week with a good mixture of boys and girls proves that there's definitely a passion for the club. Um, we seek to uh, get the permission 
and uh, funding for the container and any uh, extra costs that come from the back of the survey report. Uh, we will uh, fund the work completely off our own funding channels and the committee from the Cricket Club continue to work hard to raise as much money as physically possible to make this uh, dream a reality. Um, it is hoped that with approval for the container, we can start playing uh, adult cricket in the league format back at St Mary's and most importantly back in Sydney in our community next year, rather than nine miles away in Hastings. Trying to get children to watch us play cricket nine miles away is very difficult. Uh, the, some of the comments that were made were about uh, we ticked no on our planning application for contaminated sites. Uh, as soon as I realised my mistake, I contacted uh, Rebecca and Michael to say that that was a mistake. We should have ticked yes. Unfortunately, I'm not very good at filling in paperwork and it's been a big learning curve for me as just an ordinary club member. But we realised there was a mistake and we ticked yes immediately. Uh, with regards to parking on the site, which has been a bit of an issue uh, for some of the objectors, we continue to work hard with Rother District Council to seek approval to use the site uh, and hopefully park on the grass or maybe in time extend the car park. Uh, we very much see this as a very long-term goal. Uh, we celebrate our 125-year anniversary within the next six years and we hope to be at St Mary's with the flag <coughs> flying very high. Uh, with regards to the funding and regards to the surveys, we've always taken the advice of Rother District Council and we have always worked and seeked approval from the council before taking any steps or measures in terms of working on the site. Uh, we have also taken the efforts since May to do regular maintenance to the roped off cricket square. We mow it, we try and pick up litter if we see it all of which is just trying to get us more uh, respect from regular, regular users. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Definitely worth waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions? See, you did a good job. Thank you very much. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, I think... It's clear for you, you've all just heard Jamie's passion for, for both the sport and the club and Sidley uh, and the young people of Sidley and the people who, who just want to get out in the community and get active and for far too long now I've been unable to do that and thankfully thanks to cricket coming back to St Mary's we're now able to start seeing cricket in Sidley again uh, and you all know my passion for, for seeing sports back in Sidley. Um, I think a lot of you will be aware of the cabinet decision on the cricket square and you'll all probably remember the uh, 1066 racing track application where I talked again very passionately along with Councillor Carroll about sports in Sidley. So I won't bore you with that same speech again. Um, I, I think in terms of planning, the balance and conclusion in the report sums it up pretty well. Uh, the, proposed, the proposal to start a portable changing facility would not detract from the locality of the recreation ground, would not adversely impact on the ne nearby neighbouring residential properties, would not prejudice highway safety. It complies with the local plan core strategy policies, uh, together with the various provisions contained within the MPPF, uh, and can therefore be supported and granted full planning. Uh, obviously, the contamination issues are a, a matter for the committee to decide, um, but I know that Jamie and the club are all too willing to, to go, go along with all of those and, and help as much as they can uh, to ensure that they can carry on playing cricket uh, in Sydney. I won't talk anymore because I know you guys have been here for a long time, as have I, only to say that please support Sidley, support sports, support the planning officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Your passion might wake us up. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Drayson. Thank you. Um, it just seemed very silly to let them use our ground and then say, no, they can't have proper changing facilities for the kids and people going with them. So I would support yes. this, obviously with the conditions about the contaminated lane, uh, land, so I was going to move um, granting it. And that's moving approval with delegation yes. to the uh, The conditions issues. on the contaminated yeah. lane and yeah. obviously the cladding of the... And to consult with environmental health. 
Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were going to agree with that. Seconded. Councillor so Errington. Second. I think we're probably ready to vote, aren't we? <laughs> All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you so much. Next um, item is um, where are we? Is our RR 2022-1072P, West Brow Tellum Lane. Uh, this is um, an application from a member of staff, and it is it is recommended for approval. Do you want to say anything about it, Matt? Right, uh, thank you, Chair. This is um, a member's, member of staff's planning application. Um, the proposal is to replace existing outbuildings, totaling four, four sheds, garages, um, in this top right-hand right, right -hand corner, um, with, um, it, it's going to be a quadruple bay outbuilding Two, um, with two carports, so right, so elevations. This is the existing setup. So um, you've got uh, one, two, three, four, four garage doors effectively, and a small store on the side. It is proposed to construct this four bay building with um, roof area, um, which is proposed as a games room. Um, the site is at the end of the ribbon of development along Tellum Lane. Um, it is within the High Wheels AOMB. However, it's an established residential site. The large, um, large house, large grounds. Um, this is essentially a replacement outbuilding for ancillary residential units. Um, the feeling of opinion is there's no adverse impact on the rural character of the area or the landscape quality and it doesn't impact on neighbouring properties and amenities. Recommendation is to approve. And please note there is a condition that it cannot be used as a separate dwelling. Members? Seconded. Seconded. All those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you so much. Last. Last application, members. Our, our, stay with it, just a little bit more. Our, our 2022 P, Three Virgins Croft Battle. And again, it's you, Matt. Right, this, this site is within the market town of Battle. Um, it relates to a semi-detached dwelling, two-storey dwelling. Um, it's got a single-storey extension on the back um, as per this location block plan. Uh, the existing rear addition does... Um, it's also set offset from the shared boundary with number four Virgin's Croft. Um, it does um, extend beyond the south 
side elevation of the, the property. Um, so, property we look, you can see where my cursor is circling, that's number three, Virgin's Croft. You can see the sort of L-shaped single story extension wrapping round. And these are some of the photos that the officer took. So I appreciate we didn't get to see this on Tuesday. Um, top left-hand photo shows the existing flat roof extension. Uh, the one to the right at the top looks across to um, neighbouring properties that have had rear extensions built. That two-storey flat roof extension was approved in the 1980s. Um, I, think, I think the history is explained in the officer's report um, about there are three, three other properties with um, two-storey extensions. So um, I'll refer you to the correct page. Yep, so page 159 of the um, committee agenda. Uh, you've got the history of number three, Virgin's Croft, number six, number eight, and going on to page 160, um, you've got number 10. <clears throat> um, these two photographs, I think, were sent in by the applicant or planning agent, so you've got um, a wider view of the application. So, so the top photo shows... The rear of the application property, number three, um, you can see number four adjoining next door. Number six is the one with the flat roof. Eight is the pitched roof um, two-storey extension, um, again 1980s I believe. And then um, the one, number ten at the end is the more, more recent addition. Um, 2013. So these are the existing elevations and floor plans of the cottage. You can see the flat roof extension at the top that wraps around. Um, the proposed is a first floor extension with. Um, History. Um, as you will have read, the recommendation is to um, refuse, um, notwithstanding the other examples of first floor extensions. Um, two, two of them were granted around 40 years ago. There have been changes in policies and how you assess things in relation to neighbouring properties. Um, number 10, 2013, is an end of terrace property, um, and they haven't, they haven't got an immediate neighbour to the north, um, which is one of the reasons for concern here. Um, number four, immediately adjoining to the north, it's got ground floor, first floor windows. This would be um, right... Well, very close to these windows, there's concern about this extension being overbearing, having a loss of light um, as well to, to the neighbouring occupiers. Um, yeah, recommendation is to refuse. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, Neil Holdsworth, you get the outstanding prize for lasting this long. Thank you very much for your patience. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I'm a Charter Town Planner. I'm also a friend of the applicant. Uh, I'm here primarily to provide an alternative perspective on this to what you just uh, heard from officers. Uh, I just wanted to thank, first of all, Councillor Cook and Councillor Field for their support in calling this application into committee. It's, uh, it's very much appreciated. Uh, we've been dealing with planning for two years uh, now and this is the fourth application that we've been in and it's good to get to committee to present it to you. Um, 
and I'd also like to thank the officers, although we've got different views on this, they did deal with this application very quickly. We submitted it 10 weeks ago, and we're here at committee, albeit last, but we're very grateful for that. So thank you, officers. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, Dan and Sophie, Dan didn't actually register to speak in, in time, uh, unfortunately, which, which was my error, but he is here and he has been here today. It is something that means a lot to them. Uh, Dan and, and Sophie, his wife, they work locally. Dan uh, is a manager of a, a golf course. Uh, Sophie's a carer. Uh, they've lived in Battle for 20 years and their children attend local schools in Battle. Um, Dan has asked me, first of all, if I could ask the officer, is it possible to put the proposed uh, elevations just on the PowerPoint slide just by way of um, illustration? Okay, uh, thank you, Matthew. Yes, yeah, so you can see there this uh, extension. Uh, it's, um, it's built on top of the existing uh, extension. There is a reason for that. This, this reuses part of the existing building, so we don't need to demolish as much. That, from an environmental point of view, that is uh, better than completely demolishing something and rebuilding it. So it has been informed by environmental considerations. Secondly, there's a new south-facing area of roof, and the intention is to use that for solar panels to take advantage of the, uh, you know, the position in relation to the sun. So Dan did ask me to uh, emphasise that to you uh, as part of this uh, presentation. Um, just um, dealing with the appearance of the extension, as you can see there, uh, it's at first floor level, it's got hang tiles and a, a low-pitched roof. This is this is effectively copying what's been built elsewhere along the terrace. It's a traditional design that's in line with uh, its surroundings. Um, Matthew, if I could just look again at the picture we took at the site. I think it was um, before this one, possibly. Yes, you, you can see here, so, I mean, if you look at the row, the, the, if you look at the top picture, it's not very clear there, but our house is at the end in Pebble Dash, but, but there are three existing extensions in this, in this row of eight. So historically, the council have approved effectively three, I would argue, very, very similar extensions in this uh, row. Um, and we've basically copied what is, has been good about it, what the council previously approved. So we've used the hang tiles and we've got the low pitched roof, which is quite sympathetic to the uh, appearance of the remainder of the terrace. So um, looking at the first reason for refusal, uh, the officers are saying that what we're proposing is, is out of character with the surrounding development. I would say that actually this is actually in character with the surrounding development and what's previously been approved by this planning department. Were the planners wanting to resist this the time to do that was before they granted the other extensions. It feels a little bit unfair that we're now being told that this is harmful to the AOMB and this type of development, uh, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed. Um, dealing briefly with the neighbour impacts, as you can see there, it's pretty well established, this pattern of two-storey extensions uh, and the relationship with the, the neighbours. What I would say, if you look at the picture of Number four, you can see the first floor window is set quite far away from the common boundary. The other point that might not be that clear from the officer report is that the first floor element is, on our side, it's actually set away from the boundary by one metre. So we have actually moved the first floor away from the boundary by one metre, and in our view, that completely addresses any concerns about um, daylight and sunlight overshadowing or any overbearing Effect. Other points to note on this point, as you can see from the picture there, these, these are quite long gardens, it's quite an open environment, 
the extension is small. It's projecting around about two, 2.8 metres away from the host building. And as I said, we're set off the boundary. Any additional shading that might occur in this context, it, it's not harmful from a, a planning perspective. Um, finally, I'd just like the... the committee to note that there has been no objections to Mr. this. Mr Holdsworth, your time's up. <laughs> right. Uh, does that account for the gap that we had? Yeah, yeah, yes, you, you're very good. I watched. Right. But I'm sure okay. members could ask you questions if um, you had more to say. Well, I had said what I wanted to um, say, so, but I am happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone has. Councillor Ganley. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Um, you happen to know if the applicant asked for pre-application advice um, before submitting the application. Uh, yes. So, uh, as as I explained, this is this is the fourth planning application, um, and uh, so before submitting this one, the, the answer to that that is no. But what's become clear, and this is not a reflection of any. Uh, you know, um, I'm not trying to put the officers down at all, but there's a fundamental difference of opinion between the officers and ourselves that you as a committee now need to resolve. Uh, I don't think we'd achieve anything more from PREAP. They're, they're saying that this type of development is, um, you know, unacceptable, and, and we would argue, because of what you can see there with the three neighbouring properties that the Council have already approved, that that, that is not a sustainable position. Thank you. Councillor Byrne. Yeah. Um, maybe I didn't quite pick it up off the, off the um, photographs. How many two-storey extensions are there in that row? Okay, thank you, Councillor. So, so this is a row of eight houses that could be considered identical. So of the eight, three have two-storey extensions. Three two-storey. Three out of eight at present. And yeah. how many one-storey? Uh, so at present, uh, to my knowledge, our, ours is the only single-storey extension in the row. Okay, so two storeys will probably put you more in line with the others rather than less. You may Thank take you. that Thank view. You. Yes. Councillor Arrington. Thank you. My, my question came on the back of what I think you're about to say was, did you consult with the neighbours? I've had a look online and there yeah. don't appear to be any objections, but I don't know when they're mm. taken down. They're taken down after this meeting. Um, yeah, so um, the, the situation here, and, and uh, Dan could come in, but my understanding of the situation, it has been discussed with the neighbours. Um, the neighbours um, are concerned about the effect of the building work, so the process of construction. Uh, now, um, that, that's something that we would work with them. Obviously, we'd need to build it as quickly as possible, but we would be sensitive towards their... Uh, considerations as part of that process. Uh, they, they haven't objected specifically on the grounds of the principle of, of the development. Any further questions? Councillor Mir. Yeah, my, my only real area of concern is the effect on the light, the, the amenity of the neighbours to the north. Um, have any um, has the sun's course been plotted to see how that would affect the neighbours? I noticed that it's a pitched roof which takes mm -hmm. it higher than the flat roofed uh, extensions mm -hmm. elsewhere. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the issue with the neighbours, this has been raised previously by the officers and it, it is a valid consideration. Originally we wanted to build it on, on the boundary. Now in response to that we, we took it back by one metre. That is as far as, as we can go without sort of losing the concept that we're trying to deliver. Um, I don't know if you can see from the picture, it's not all that clear, but again, if you look at the, um, I don't know, Matthew, if you could put, sorry to uh, ask you again, but if you could put up the, um, the photos that we took on, on the site. Yeah, so it, it's not 
entirely clear because you need to blow up the picture a bit more, which for technical reasons, you know, we can't do. Um, at present, the, um, the, the ground floor extension is, is built up uh, on the boundary. Uh, as a consequence of that extension, there is uh, effectively when the sun is in that southern position, it overshadows the um, neighbouring property uh, at, at present. Uh, as I said, it's been designed in a way that's built off the, off the boundary uh, to limit any further shading that, that would occur. Uh, in terms of technical assessments, we've, we've not gone through technical assessments. That, that's very expensive, and this is a 10 square metre extension that, that we're talking about. So the issue of proportionality comes into it. I'd also just draw your attention to the fact that Council have considered previously this form of development is acceptable and the previous approvals in the middle are built right up to the, the boundary. So, you know, we've, we've tried to address this as, as far as we can. It's as far as we can go, um, you know, and, and um, as I said, there's no objection from that neighbour. We, we've done what we can. Yeah. Councillor Drayson. Yeah, it was a proposed um, elevations and plans. Yeah, just, I think the difference from the one that was refused before is that you had a wraparound on both stories, and now you've gone for the wraparound is only on the ground floor, and the first floor is not to the boundary. I'm, I'm just wondering, that rear elevation, is that backwards? <coughs> is, is your extension going that way towards... Well, well so, if, okay, so at the moment, the, the ground floor extension it goes beyond the side projection... To the, of the building, so it's a single story. At the story. back, it's to the right, isn't it? At the back, so the extension extends. Uh, well, if you go to the existing plans, if you could go to the previous screen, so if you look at the in plan form, at present, this is the existing flat roof extension. Yeah, it goes to the right. It's so just in the yeah. new plans, it's going to the left. So I think it's drawn about backwards. That's all. It's uh, just in my brain. So hang on. No, the rear elevation, the one on the uh, furthest to the right. Uh, of that screen. That's the rear elevation. You can see there's a single story extension that uh, projects uh, at present 2.8 metres, uh, as I recall, from the rear elevation. Yeah. That goes go right to the, to the next one. It goes to the boundary. Okay, yep. Yeah. The middle one there yeah. is the rear one. And yeah. The extension on the other side, the, the lumpy bits to the left, not to the right. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is. Because yeah. the boundary is that side, isn't it? Well, the boundary with number four, it depends which plan you're, you're looking at. Just driving nuts out. So it's all right, or well, maybe it's best if I... Right, so um, the one in the centre is the rear elevation. Yeah. goes up to the boundary, that's number four there, and, and it will go up to number four. But then it extends across upwards from the existing yeah. footprint, going up to the roof. That's, so, so we're just building on top of the uh, existing extension. And then heading back, there's a, a return on the existing yeah. ground floor extension. We're building a small okay. pitch roof. Okay, that's just me reading so, yeah. wrong, yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, sorry to uh, interrupt. <laughs> the middle photo, that's a dummy roof. On the, as you're looking at the middle yeah. photo, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. onto the left of it, that's just a little dummy roof to make it look like it's a little um, sort of monopitch roof on the side just to make it sort of more in keeping. That's not part of the okay. Okay, that's what Oh, oh, that's okay. what we yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Grace. <laughs> Any Sorry. more questions? Thank you very much. And Councillor Field. Thank you, Chair. Could you switch the microphone? I would like very much to support this application. Um, oh, it's helping me. Right, thank you. Um, yes, support the application. Um, as you've seen, other houses in the road have got two-storey applications forming L-shaped dwellings. The house itself, and I do apologise for being so rude to the applicant, is a very unprepossessing, um, modest semi with rendering which is 
grey and brown pebble dash, which is certainly not in keeping with anything else in the area, nor is it in line with, I don't think, AONB design guide stipulations either. Um, the house isn't listed, it's not in the conservation area, and it's not near any other listed buildings. It is, of course, in the AONB, but then so is every single other building which is built in battle, because battle itself is in total in the AONB. Um, I think as far as the design is concerned, what is planned will be much, much nicer and more in keeping with the road and the area than what is currently there. The Town Council has no objection, and the report itself says there have been no comments from the pink notice, and indeed Councillor Errington has noted that there are no objections on the website, which says to me the neighbours um, aren't worried about the final result, but it's really good to hear that the neighbours will be worked with when the construction is going on, because that's always a slightly difficult a slightly difficult period. Um, no impact on the landscape character, I don't think, because it will just bring it in line to the rest of the houses in the road and indeed be an improvement to the street scene because, as Councillor Byrne elicited, it is the only flat-roofed extension in that road. And finally, probably not planning, but on a social aspect, this development, this extension, will give this family of four an upstairs bathroom, which I would have thought in the 21st century was fairly useful. Um, so please support the application and not the refusal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Field. Councillor Maidley. Did you? Okay, yes, back to photos. We're back to the photos again. Um, and from taken from those elevations there. Am I right in thinking that the specific property will now have a boxed effect instead of a pitch roof. No, it's not the way around. It's going to be pitched? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else? Move approval? Uh, seconded, anybody? Seconded? Those in favour? Yeah, yeah, we need to I'm sorry. Yeah, it just happens this afternoon. It's recommended to be built on character and appearance. So all stone is in keeping. Also, it's saying now it has an aspect of an impact. So, members, if you look at the um, conclusions on page 164, basically what we are saying that it's not over large, it's not incongruous. Um, It's not out of character with surrounding development. It's not, not a precedent. Um, I mean, I have to say, whenever I see an application where officers think an, uh, an extension is overbearing, I look twice at that expression because it just doesn't mean that it's too big because there are other sorts of... Uh, um, issues with, with extensions. Um, would that be satisfy? Amenities of neighbouring property as well. To be clear that we've considered that and it doesn't we think it's acceptable. Yeah. Just with there being two reasons recommended reasons, it's just making clear that we've we've considered both issues, so the impact on the neighbour as well as whether it's in keeping with the area. I think we're there, are we? In keeping with the area? No, no adverse impact on neighbours? Standard conditions, matching materials. And we'll leave conditions like matching materials to officers? Yes, to the semi detached other half, you know, the other half, balance it. We've got, we've got a, um, a pebble dash at the moment. At the moment. So would they be able to? No, no, no. No, they no, can't, can they? It's the wrong way around, isn't it? Can we put a okay, condition on that materials are more attractive than that? Can we? 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 Can we?
Is it going to be so tile the, hanging? Some, there, are, tile there are annotations yeah. on the plans, tile hanging at first floor. I can't, I can't see the writing for the ground floor, whether it's rendered or brickwork. I don't know. So. The mater proposed materials. And personal. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, my my uh, advice would be in accordance with the approved plans. Um, yeah. Thank you. We have voted and we have got the reasons. So, I think we can thank you for coming. Um, sorry, members. Julie said she couldn't see who voted for after reasons given. Those in favour of approval. Those against? One against and one abstention? Thank you, members. We're not done yet. <laughs> I don't know if um, Miles is speaking to us still. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you, Miles. I think Michael can go okay. home. You, you asked for me, is there anything you'd like to know? Sorry, we couldn't hear. Very sorry, the connection's quite poor. Yeah, the connection's quite poor. That's why I'm leaving the camera off for now. Okay, Miles. Well, we're on agenda item 18. Is there anything you'd like to say about Agenda Item 18, which is the um, uh, update on appeals? I can just say a few things very briefly on that. Um, you know, I would say that the returns so far this year are slightly above the national average, which is good news. Also, there's, there's a very high... There's a very high... Sorry, that's background noise. I do apologise. There's nothing I can do about that. So, there's a high number because of the high number of decisions. Now, two days ago, we had a very long, quite demanding hearing, the Fairlight Appeal. And uh, I think Sarah put a lot of work into this. Uh, she kept everyone hydrated, she organised very well and gave support to me in the seminar. Um, it was an extraordinary attendance initially, 75 people I think were registered um, as visitors, some had to be turned away, there simply wasn't that kind of, um, that kind of capacity in the council chamber. But um, I think Inspector to credit because he opened it up and gave the third parties a very, very good opportunity to put their views across, especially where they weren't supported by the local authority, especially the key issue for them, which was drainage and water and pollution. So we, we await that um, decision. But um, just to say that I think the higher number of appeals will be with us probably to the end of the calendar year, simply because of the high number of decisions. And um, it's not to be worried about it, because a lot of these haven't yet started, and they're not puts in a great strain on our sure resource as a consequence. So unless anyone has any particular appeal they want to talk to, I just want to leave it there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Miles. No questions? No questions, Miles, so <laughs> you can go home. <laughs> um, the date and time of next meeting is the 30th of August um, at 9am and I close... So I'm going to close the meeting now at, what is it, 5.40.